the hour of 1030 having arrived, we will call to order the November 28th, 2023 session of the Santa Cruz City Council and the clerk will call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Newsom? Present. Brown? Here. Watkins? Here. Bruner? Present. Um, Councilmember Kalantari Johnson is currently via Zoom. Present. Vice Mayor Golder? Here. Mayor Keeley? Here. If I might ask the city attorney to provide us with a comment relative to the participation of Council Member Kalantari Johnson on an electronic device rather than being present. If you would comment on that, sir. Certainly. Thank you, uh, Mayor Keeley, members of the City Council. Um, Council Member Kalantari Johnson's participation today is pursuant to recent amendments to the Brown Act that provide a limited opportunity for council members to meet remotely without complying with the agenda posting notice requirements of the old Brown Act statute. Um, a council member can do that up to two times per year based upon specified enumerated circumstances, one of which is due to the illness of a family member or to the council member themselves. And that is the presence, that is the circumstance pr uh, present here uh, today. And individual council members are uh, given the opportunity to do that up to twice uh, in the legislature's wisdom uh, per calendar year. Very good, thank you. Uh, council member Colin Tari Johnson, uh, we are sorry that you are under the weather, but very pleased that you can participate both in open and closed session today and uh, all be alert to uh, your desire to speak and fully participate. So the city clerk and I'll manage that together, but uh, we hope you feel better as soon as you possibly can. Thank you, Mayor. Okay. Uh, this would be the opportunity to anyone to comment upon our closed session agenda, which we will be undertaking in a few minutes. Uh, any of the items on closed session that anyone would like to comment upon, this would be your opportunity to do so. Do we have anyone online? <coughs> Nobody with their hand raised. Thank you so much. The uh, real property items to be discussed in closed session are listed below on the council's agenda. And receiving no public input or comment on that, we will adjourn into closed session. We will return here not earlier than 12.30 uh, in the afternoon. We stand adjourned into closed session. Recording stopped.
hour of 12.30 having arrived and the council having completed its business and closed litigation session, we will begin the afternoon session of the Santa Cruz City Council. <laughs> Clerk will call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. <laughs> council members Newsom. Present. Brown. Here. Watkins. Here. Bruner. Present. Helen Torrey Johnson. Present. Vice Mayor Golder. Here. And Mayor Cooley. Here. Me ask the city attorney if we have any announcements not at this time thank you for those of you uh, who weren't here when we began the meeting hours or so ago councilmember Colin Tar Johnson is joining by uh, electronic device because uh, she is under the weather today and there are uh, laws in California which permit her to do that and any other council member to do that uh, up to a couple of times a year based on their health situation. So we are wishing the council member a quick recovery. And, uh, but that, to for those of you that are uh, with us today or viewing this online, that is why the council member is, is online. We are on oral communications. This would be the opportunity to, for anyone who wishes to address the city council on a matter under our jurisdiction, but not on today's city council agenda to do so. Good afternoon. Hi everyone, my name is Lori Egan. I'm the executive director of the Coastal Watershed Council and I am here to say thank you. And it's been a really dynamic year at the San Lorenzo River where the Coastal Watershed Council focuses our work. We've had some uh, work done for FEMA accreditation, some major winter storms and you name it. It's happening out at the river. And what I'm here to say thank you about specifically is really the response that the public works staff had to the vegetation maintenance at the levee. The, the staff really responded to community feedback and the, the vendor that they ended up hiring for vegetation ma maintenance this fall did a phenomenal job. We are so happy with the changes that were made as the result of changing from the lowest responsible bidder to the RFP process. Specifically, we saw increased great communication from not only the staff, but also the vendor around the work at the levee. The whole team could identify native plants and no detail was too small. They did a fantastic job preserving even the smallest poppy while taking care of what they needed to to meet the flooding requirements. The, you might even see some changes out there in terms of some of the smaller types of trees along the river's edge where they did a technique called lollipopping, where the branches are removed from the lower, the lower trees there so that floodwaters and debris can still flow through while the upper canopy is preserved. Particularly along the river, this is so important to help fish species, our endangered and threatened species that rely on the lower San Lorenzo River for their habitat. So the take home is the changes that were made this year worked and we are so thankful for uh, your role in that process and just the dedication of the public works staff. Thank you. Ms. Egan, thank you to you and your team at the Coastal Watershed Council, and we join you in our thanks and appreciation to the Public Works Department and the contractors. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. Hi. Hi. Um, my name is Megan Carroll. I'm the volunteer coordinator at the Santa Cruz County Animal Shelter, and I'm here today because you have a representative appointed to our Animal Services JPA. We act you actually have two, Laura Schmidt and John Bush. Um, as a representative of the staff, we are facing an urgent crisis in the shelter that is being blamed in the media on animal overpopulation, but is really about internal disarray and lack of oversight. We have had 22% increase in animals from last year to this year, and we are hitting a critical point. It is the highest rate of animals we've had in 10 years. This is a fact, but it's not the reason for the shelter's dysfunction. We are understaffed, there's a lack of resources, and a management vacuum that is leading us towards a cliff. This affects the Santa Cruz community because it impacts the level of care that we are able to provide to the animals of our, this community and also the public who walks in our front door. In the very near future, these prob problems could and will compound and create larger issues involving public health, public safety, and may affect even family pets. We ask that you check in with your representatives on our JPA board as to what is going on in the shelter and to hold management accountable for the ongoing issues that we are facing. The Santa Cruz community needs a well-run shelter that they can be proud of. We bring this to your attention in order to ensure the Santa Cruz County Animal Shelter can continue to support our community, continue to support our animals and the public at a high level for the foregoing future. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for your work every day. Good afternoon. Online, how many do we have? Three. Okay. What we'll do is we'll hear from the gentlelady, then we'll go online. We'll go back and forth toggling online and in person so that you know where we're going with this. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mayor Keeley and council members. I wanted to talk about Ordinance 8129. That is the Prevention of Violence Against Women in Santa Cruz. And under Section D, it says the police department shall actively cooperate with public and private agencies, including women's groups. As you know, in my experience, that's not happening, and I continue to experience deprivation of my rights under color of law, and I still continue to not um, receive equal protection under the law. And here are some women's groups who reached out to the Santa Cruz Police Department. They're Me Too Moms. They're the Family Court Anti-Corruption Coalition. Here you can see my poor child who um, she and I had been reporting domestic violence in San Mateo um, County since 2014. I reported domestic violence here in Santa Cruz. I spoke specifically to Officer Parker Rhodes, who wrote a report and agreed to keep my daughter safe with me. However, for some unknown reason, Santa Cruz PD let my daughter's dad strangle me. I've been doing the domestic violence training, which many people should have, especially people who work with our local commission on preventing violence. Strangulation means that a woman can be killed 750 times more likely, so I'm at extreme risk. We still need to know why cops strangled and suffocated my daughter in response to us reporting domestic violence. So I still want to press charges against David Ross Murdoch for strangling me, for battering my daughter, for attacking me. I want equal protection under the law. And so I'm citing your own ordinance, 8129, Prevention of Violence Against Women. The way we prevent violence against women is we hold these POSs accountable. He needs to be arrested. He needs the book thrown at him. He needs to be prosecuted. It's very simple. Let's make an example out of him. We're going to take the next person online, then we'll be right with you. Person online. Good afternoon. Hi, um, my name's Carol Bjorn, and actually this is the first time I've talked at this forum, so I hope I'm speaking at the right time. Yeah. Um, but basically, I just wanted to voice my opposition to the purchase and the installation of the automatic license plate. So here's what we're going to do. We're, here's what we'll do, and thank you for asking if this was the right time and place. Uh, it's the right place, wrong time. So what we'll do is, if you're online, track how we're doing today, and that item will be up uh, uh, in a few minutes, and we'll certainly recognize you for your comments at that time. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon. Okay, yeah, we'll, we'll be to that item in a little bit. Good afternoon, sir. It is oral communications. I want to live. I cross Morrissey frequently to go to the 24 hour to work out. And recently, the back of my left heel was clipped by the right front tire of a person speeding. I was lucky that I didn't get hit. And I would like for this council to consider asking the chief to do something that would actually protect people. Let's get red light cameras for all the people that are running red lights. It'll be a revenue source. And let's get speed traps, speed cameras. You don't have to have a person there. Do it like they do in Europe. You get a picture in the mail, your face, your license number, your speed. I live on Pacheco right next to Morrissey. I'm close enough to Soquel. I hear muscle cars screaming up and down both of those streets. And I think it's time that the police department actually propose something that protects people. I want to live. Next person online, good afternoon. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, I, I'm William Sum. I'm the CEO of uh, SC Bloom Network Incorporated, a local cannabis business. And I uh, just wanted to highlight uh, that we need help 
from the community and the police force. Uh, atrocious crimes are being committed, um, and it's a public safety concern, and we need the help uh, with, your, with your support to have some type of special hearing with the district attorney's office as well as the police force. Uh, we appreciate your time. Thank you. Anyone else with us in chambers who wishes to comment on oral communication? Good afternoon, sir. Yes, good afternoon. My name is still James Ewing Whitman. It's nice to see all of you. I hope all of you stay in the room when items are pulled off the agenda, particularly you, you Mr. Tony Condotti, and you, Matthew Huff. Huff Kirk. So, you know, what can I say? You know, Santa Cruz is setting quite an example. Um, and, you know, we have a war on children going on right now. I learned recently that um, <clears throat> of the 2.2 million individuals that live in the Palestine area, 70% uh, of those individuals are under 25. Some people say that 200,000 people have already been murdered. So it kind of sucks that the city of Santa Cruz seems to have so much in common with um, beguiling aspects of various things that have been rubber stamped in my presence here over the past almost four and a half years. So that's enough for now. I'll be more specific later. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Person online, good afternoon. Yes, hello, this is Garrett. Uh, I see you're sitting down, that's good. Uh, in 2017, the council fell all over itself embracing illegal immigration, passing a sanctuary city status resolution and an ordinance ruling out the welcome mat to illegals. I reviewed that meeting and was amused. Someone only speaking Spanish claimed he was here for 16 years, but apparently didn't feel the need to learn a lick of English and kept referring to El Salvador as his country and lamented over and over how great it was there and not here. In 2017, illegal immigration was very low because the benefit versus coyote price wasn't favorable with high levels of border apprehensions and deportations under Trump. Times have really changed, and the criminal political cabal class under Biden have allowed a literal invasion of our country by many millions of totally unknown military-aged men from all over the world to go wherever they want, also many detained because they are on terror watch lists or drug smugglers or in pedophile rings, and October 13th congressional report says 90% of those released did not claim asylum. Under Biden's term, the, the number of illegals is going to reach 8 million, 9 million. The report says the Biden administration has failed to deport roughly 99.7% of those illegal aliens. The goal is to destroy the West in one generation. By contrast, local police are empowered to arrest illegal aliens in Texas. The next president may well close the border and start mass deportations. Santa Cruz doesn't want to be in the shape that New York or Europe is, overwhelmed with illegals, and since you are always out of money, hey, I'd like to know exactly how much and, and more you're going to plan on spending to support illegal aliens. Poland has a zero admittance policy toward illegals, resulting in zero terror attacks in Poland and is the safest country in Europe. They adopted this policy because they know the horror of being invaded, first by Nazis, then Soviets, and they know the reality of what it means to lose freedom and culture, and they're never going to give it up again. Illegal aliens are getting more benefits than most Social Security recipients, getting more resources while citizens go homeless or in poverty. Repeal the city's invader sanctuary status now if you care at all about having a country. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else wish to address us under oral communication? Do we have anyone else online? We do. We'll take the last. Is this the last one? Do we have more than one? One more hand raised. One more hand raised. We'll take that person. Good afternoon. Three, two. Hello. What? Hi, Hello. Can you hear me? Hi. You're on. Hi, Darius here. Uh, I just want to give a shout out to two of uh, you on the dais there. First, uh, Sonia Bruner for her always showing up at events like last uh, week, uh, last Thursday's Veterans Hall Community Thanksgiving meal. She took the time out to be there serving various members of the community, mostly homeless, and uh, kind of commend her for that. But also, but the prize goes to our mayor, uh, Fred Cheely, who in this about a month ago, I think it was about a month ago, he actually went to the Mountain Roasting Company in Felton to meet 
Robert North for allegedly an interview, which ended up turning out to be a lecture. And he was very, I was, I, I actually listened to his show and I was quite impressed with our mayor's demeanor and response and his willingness to go out and, again, out to Felton and from during his uh, currently busy day and meet up with our constituents wherever they may be. Anyway, that's all. Just, um, just thought, I just thought I'd call that out. Thank you. Well, that's terribly kind of you. Thank you. And on behalf of Council Member Bruner, thank you very much for those kind comments. Anyone else online, Ms. Bush? No one else online. We're finished with oral communication. Uh, we are now moving to a presiding officer announcement. I have none. Statements of disqualifications. Any council member have a statement of disqualification on today's agenda? Seeing and hearing none. We'll move to additions and deletions. Uh, Ms. Bush, are there any additions and deletions to the agenda? No, there aren't. Okay, very good, thank you. Uh, Mr. Condotti, report from our closed session. Yes, thank you, Mayor Ely, members of the City Council. There were uh, five items on this morning's closed session, which convened at 10.30 a.m. in the Courtyard Conference Room. Item one was real property negotiations. The Council received a report from and gave direction to its real property negotiator concerning the real property at 140 Front Street. Item two was a legal counsel uh, liability claims. Uh, the claimant uh, name of Lorraine H. Coppolino is also on your afternoon uh, agenda for action as consent calendar item number 13. Items three and four were significant exposure or anticipated litigation. Item three was uh, one item of significant exposure to litigation. Item four was one item of considering initiation of litigation. Item five was a public employee performance evaluation slash conference with labor negotiators concerning the city manager position, that item was deferred to the next meeting and otherwise there was no reportable action. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that. We're on item six. We're going to review our meeting calendar. Ms. Bush, anything to draw our attention to on that? Nope, no changes. Very good, thank you. We are on the consent agenda. For those of you unfamiliar, what we were doing is taking <laughs> items seven through 20 as one action. And what we will do is give council members the opportunity to comment upon or ask a question or pull an item from the consent agenda. We'll also give folks an opportunity to comment on the, uh, the consent agenda item, <coughs> items rather, plural. So let me start through the council members and I'll work my way from my left to my right. Council Member Brenner. I'd like to pull item 15, and I have a question on item 17. Go ahead and ask your item on uh, item 17. <clears throat> item 17, the Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail, Rail Trail Segment 7, Phase 2. Uh, I was curious about uh, uh, the timeline on, on that, if there is any... Who would you like to have respond and, on that? Yeah, and I had the same question for 18. Okay, let's go item 17 first, and then item 18. Who is going to address us? Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Matt Starkey, Transportation Manager. I'll address item 17 on the rail trail. Um, we are uh, here before you to ask for a budget adjustment to help complete uh, section seven, phase two, uh, which will complete the rail trail down from California to the roundabout at Pacific. Um, we expect to be completed in March, okay. and um, this work will help us, this funding will help us get through that completion date. Thank you, Mr. Starkey. Item 18 is the Murray Street Bridge Seismic Retrofit Contract Amendment. Good afternoon, Mr. Good afternoon, Nguyen. Mayor, Council Members, Nathan Wynn, Director of Public Works. Uh, Murray Street Bridge Project, the bid opening has been delayed <laughs> until December 5th, is when we hope to get our bids received, and we are hoping to get a contractor on board by the end of this year, but we do not have an anticipated start date yet. Okay, thank you. Madam Vice Mayor. I had a question also on 17. Um, Item 17. <laughs> after you guys were, um, I think there's others too. My question comes from members of the public just asking what 
caused the bud the need for the budget adjustment? And I did get that answered, but since it wasn't presented here, maybe staff could speak to it. Mr. Starkey, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yeah, the um, we ran into some challenges on the site with uh, particularly utility crossings down the rail trail that um, caused us to need to spend a little extra time resolving those conflicts, particularly utilities coming in and out of the wastewater treatment plant. Uh, the other challenge was the big winter storm we had uh, last winter that made the site um, unusable for by our contractors for a while. So that delay from the storm coupled with utilities really um, delayed this project overall. Thank you, Mr. Starkey. Further, Madam Vice Mayor? Council Member Watkins, Council Member Brown. Thank you, Mayor. I also wanted to pull item 15, but I, I did have a f one more question on item 17, and I apologize I didn't get this uh, to you in advance. Um, given, is there any potential for FEMA reimbursement for any of that additional cost, and where are we at with that process? What are your expectations or hopes? Yes, uh, we are working on finding other funding sources to help backfill these costs we've experienced. Uh, FEMA is one of them, and we're working on um, securing that funding source now. I have, an, I have a question on 18. Um, many people obviously are, are watching this, and I know that it's this is a project that has been many, many decades in the making at this point. Um, at it, at one point, there was a discussion about having uh, some kind of community engagement or neighborhood meeting to discuss uh, what to expect with uh, folks who are in proximity to that, uh, that crossing. And I'm wondering if that is on the agenda or if, um, where, where things are at. Thanks. Mr. Yep. Uh, yes, thank you for the question. Uh, there is a communication plan that we are working on, uh, with, not just internally, but also with our external partners, RTC and the county. So we'll be exploring that as we get a contractor on board and have some more solid dates established. But there will be additional outreach mailers that will be going out to a lot of the uh, close by residents, and we'll be doing a campaign to let people know that the project is coming. Thank you. I'll just say as uh, the RTC representative uh, for the city, I'm happy to be involved in conversations or help however I can um, with coordination. Thanks. Further, Ms. Brown? We're good. Mr. Newsom? Very good. Thank you. Let me ask if there's anyone with us in the public that would like to make a comment on any item. You would need to do this. If you have more than one item, you're going to have all the items consolidated into one set of comments. Good afternoon, sir. Yeah. Hello, my name is James Ewing Whitman. Mm -hmm. Actually wanted to pull off quite a number of items. I'm glad that number 15 is being pulled. You know, I wasn't necessarily going to pull off 17 or 18, but I, I don't know how this is actually being run because we had some council members make some comments and then certain individuals came in to make some comments and um, the public wasn't allowed to make some comments. So I suppose, oh, I'd like to pull off 8, 15, 16, 17, 18. My comments will be brief on 17 and 18. Why don't we do this? Let's do this. Consolidate all your comments on all those items. Now is your opportunity. Well, item 15 is going to be pulled off, so shouldn't I? That's right. Comment on that yep. later? Yeah, so we'll do, we can uh, hear your comments on that one uh, at a later time today. Not that I'm going to use this, but could I not have? three minutes on all five of those items? I'm, I'm not going to, could I not have three minutes on all five of those items? I won't use it, but I could. It wasn't my intention to take up so much time, but I'm kind of asking for how this is being how orchestrated. How we're going to do it is let's take all your comments, as you indicated, in a certain amount of time here on all these items. So go ahead. On the items that have been pulled, you will be permitted to participate. So we have pulled 15, for example. Okay. If you wish to comment on 15, we'll uh, hear from you then. I'll hear, you'll hear from me then. Yeah. So, um, okay, you know, I'm somewhat new at this. Oh, you're not at all new to this, but you're doing <laughs> fine. <laughs> so, uh, okay, well, thank you very much. Certainly. Um, number eight is that has to do with the minutes. And I just would like to, I don't think I have that, I wrote something really kind of complimentary about the 
duties and responsibilities of the clerks, because they are the historians in this room, um, they seem to be not as free as they could be. Um, but a particular item I'd like to comment on would be, I have, a, I guess I have three, whatever. So um, a community member made a comment about what has gone on with the inequities with some favoritism with some actions that local law enforcement have taken and she's still dealing with an issue that happened to her on June 28th, 2021. So I believe that she, and I know I have given you some information about what the remedies are for that. Um, I find it kind of fascinating that not much has happened with that. It's just kind of sad. I'm done with it. So how do I get to proceed? Do I have 15s being so time stops, starts again? Keep going. Okay. So, you know, I wasn't going to pull off items 17 and 18. Got the Monterey, the 17 has to do with the Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail. 18 has to do with the Murray Street Bridge. One thing they both have in common is once all this information is decided, the Director of Public Works is authorized to execute all future um, contracts. So there's no other public discussion about that. Um, and I, I, I don't know. I find some issue with that. So done with 17, but more in relation to number 18. Okay. That's stated to be a, a difficulty with traffic kind of cutting the city in half for up to two and a half years. I sure hope that's not the case because that's my favorite way to travel through the city. Um, I'm done with 18 for now. Okay. 17's being pulled. And I wish that I had brought some other information <laughs> with me, but just I didn't, so, so I'm done. The, just so we're clear with each Thank other. Thank you. Uh, no, no, just so we're clear. Um, item 17 is not pulled. There was comment made on it, but it's not been pulled for further consideration, which item, the only one so far that is pulled 15. is 15. So I, if you have a comment, go ahead and do it on that. I'm going to oh give no, you a little I'll extra wait, time here. I'll wait for the group. For on, 15. That, on 15, unless you would right. like to give me no, three no, minutes no, no, on it right no, no. now. You and I are on the same track. <coughs> no comments on 15 yet. You're okay. going to get your well, opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Anyone else on the consent agenda? Have we have one. someone online. Let's take the person online. Then if you're up on the consent agenda, we'll, we'll hear from you. So person online, good afternoon. Yes, hello. This is Barrett again. Um, item 17 sure reads to me like you're misappropriating $2.95 million from the Wastewater Enterprise Fund and treating it like some sort of slush fund to pay for cost overruns on the very controversial and ever more expensive and delayed rail trail. The connection between the rail trail and the Wastewater Enterprise isn't exactly so clear since absolutely nothing caused by the rail trail project should be paid out of those enterprise funds. The rail trail funding should fund itself and 100% of wastewater funds should remain in an enterprise lockbox dedicated to wastewater treatment alone, as should be the case with all utility monopoly enterprises. Otherwise, you are misappropriating monies and a financially unethical use of monopoly authority. I admit you provide a few details, and it's very vague for me to be able to say that for sure, uh, but, uh, yeah, if I was misappropriating fund monies, uh, uh, treating it like a slush fund, I wouldn't make it that clear either. I recall the wastewater director in the past stating, uh, you know, when there were improvements that were going to be made, that you borrowed $20 million, where he, that he said he'd like to have $10 million laying around for those planned improvements, you know, so we'd have the money there if we needed it. But all of that is for wastewater improvements. The idea that you can approve projects and take money from whatever monopoly utility funds might have some reserve money laying around in them and applying it wherever you have some shortcomings of other project cost management goof-ups doesn't sound ethical to me. It don't sound right. It ain't right. Anyway, here's an idea. Why don't you raid the employee retirement funds instead? Funny, huh? But it's not so different. I, I'm curious and think a better explanation of where the financial responsibility lies in paying for this stated relocating of conflicting utility crossings is in order. I can only imagine it's maybe something caused by the rail trail project alone or possibly something to do with the water department projects unrelated also to the rail trail project and maybe the, the wastewater. Got me. 
Anyway, now, if you say these funds have nothing to do all with it but something else, why is it in the rail trail cost overrun item, and why isn't it in the, you know, utility or water department item? You know, I don't get it. Um, uh, I don't know. I, I, I guess it could relate to item number 19, but who knows? You tell me. I think we deserve an explanation. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon. Difficult question, actually. Uh, so, regards item number fifteen. Yes, item um, fifteen. Will maybe be. Could, could you just explain the system to me, because I'm new here. I've lived in Santa Cruz for for thirty years, but my first time at this council sure. meeting. So nice to meet you, Mr. Keeley. How we're going to do this is, except for item fifteen, we will be voting on all the consent agenda items in one motion. After we've done that, we will take up item fifteen, and we will hear your comments, staff comment, anybody's comments on that. We will then act, act on that item separate and apart. Could you just give me like a rough timeline? I've, I've got to get back to work, and item 15 is really important. Two or three minutes from now, oh, we'll be taking easy. it up. Sorry to I'm going to okay. guess. I'm guessing Perfect. on that. <laughs> it won't be two hours, though. <laughs> okay. Very good. Good afternoon. Hi, Mayor Keeley, Rhonda Reyna. Again, I do <laughs> want to make a comment about consent agenda item 8. Um, the meeting minutes are not accurate particularly in regard to my public comment that was referenced so that was taken out of context and i would like to see the meeting minutes reflect more accurately what was said and that is i believe that the santa cruz police department is perpetrating post-separation abuse to women and children who report domestic abuse therefore they're not accurately representing the um, end domestic violence awareness campaign that happens every October. So as the meeting minutes, minutes read currently, it makes it sound like I just oppose that program. No, I oppose people not following the program, and we shouldn't be um, spending our money on that until we shore up our police's response to that. So how can the meeting minutes more accurately reflect what the public is saying and also I didn't know that it gets recorded so I noticed in several other meetings uh, my name isn't referenced do I have to state my name I mean you all know who I am can you explain that to me a little bit more first of all you don't have to state your name unless you choose to uh, we cannot require you to state your name or your address you can choose to do that we typically prefer that only so that the record is accurate but if you choose not to mention your name we don't we don't uh, we don't require that in order to testify before the body. So if I don't state my name, it won't show up in the minutes? Can you just clarify that? That's correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else online? No? Mr. Brokaw on this? All right. Thank you, sir. Uh, the matter is now back before the council. I will make one comment on item 12, and that is to thank uh, Ms. Murphy and the other folks uh, who participated in putting together the legislative program for 2024. I think it does exactly what we're looking for to do, which is to make it very clear to anyone who reads it, especially our state and federal legislative delegation, that we have three priorities, not 103 priorities. We have three priorities that we're going to be uh, focusing in on, and we hope that they will do the same thing. So thank you, Ms. Murphy, for your fine work on that. Uh, we will now take up the consent agenda in chief. Is there a motion to approve the consent oh. agenda? There is a motion oh, by Ms. Consent. Brown. There is a second by Ms. Watkins. The clerk will call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council members Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Cooley? Aye. The uh, consent agenda is approved. Uh, we will now take up item 15. And several folks asked for this to be uh, pulled over here, uh, so to speak. Let me ask the uh, police chief if you would come forward or whoever is going to be presenting on a staff basis on this item, come on forward. Council Member Bruner, you asked this item to be continued, I'm sorry, not continued, to be uh, pulled for our further consideration. Let's let everybody get positioned and then we will uh, we'll take this item up.
Chief. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. Good afternoon. Do you have a presentation you'd like to bring up and then so we'll pause until you're ready? For those of you who are observing this either in chambers or online, item 15 is a uh, 2024 State Homeland Security Program grant proposal regarding automated license plate readers. This is brought to us by the Chief of Police and has in the packet the grant application terms, conditions, and so on. <coughs> Looks like we're good. Good to go. Chief, okay. good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, uh, Mayor, Council Members. As you mentioned, my name is Bernie Escalante, the Chief of Police for the City of Santa Cruz. Uh, we're here before you today to uh, request your approval for the fiscal year 2024 State Homeland Security Program grant funding in the amount of uh, $84,000. Um, and in turn, that money would be used to install or purchase and install uh, a total of 14 automated license plate uh, reading cameras throughout the throughout the city uh, in various locations. So that's why we are here today. So we do have this brief presentation and, and I could certainly answer questions or address concerns as, as they come up. But um, <clears throat> on the left, you'll see that uh, these are a variety of similar uses that these cameras will be utilized for. Uh, and I will go through the list quickly. It locates stolen, wanted, or suspect vehicles involved in criminal behavior. Suspects, uh, locate suspects uh, that are wanted on an arrest warrant or involved in a criminal investigation, such as violent crimes, retail crimes, catalytic converter thefts. One thing that's not on there, and it was also mentioned earlier in this meeting, is the uh, cannabis um, thefts that we've recently had where these cameras can capture license plates. The ability to locate witnesses and or victims of violent crimes. Locating missing abducted children or elderly individuals such as amber or silver alerts is what we refer to them as. Protecting the public during special events and situational awareness. We have several um, soft infrastructure throughout the city, whether it's the university, the boardwalk. We were a big, you know, tourist town. So we also have many special events, whether it's a Halloween, Fourth of July, uh, where these cameras may become very valuable to us. And again, protect critical infrastructure around the city. Um, <clears throat> on the right side here, uh, some of the, um, the cameras, the, sort of what they do or what they don't do. Uh, the camera software captures and Flock, which is the company that we are, or would like to uh, purchase the equipment from, their database temporarily stores a photo, an image of the rear license plate of a vehicle, and that's it. It does not produce facial recognition or any personally identifiable information. We also, um, I wanted to mention, <clears throat> we also have Hector Solomon Valdez, who is the director of the local government affairs at Flock Safety, who's also online to um, also address any sort of um, security or authentic authentication concerns that come up with this sort of uh, equipment. But we have, it has multi-factor authentication and single sign-on identity management tools. Uh, it's very secure, the information that it does produce, which is just the license plate, and we'll show you that in, the, in a minute. Um, the information is secure with Flock, and I will let him address those sort of questions and concerns. 
Um, the original policy that we uh, sent in with the packet, you know, which was what, about 21 days ago, has been uh, looked at, and and we have we do have some areas that we do need to revise, and one is to address Senate Bill 34, which clearly re restricts the use and sharing of our data. So, in other words, we cannot um, share the information that we have with any private entity, federal or state government, uh, outside of the California state. Uh, we can share with other jurisdictions within the state of California. Next slide. So again, some of the uh, misinformation that is out there about what it does or what it doesn't do, again, it does not provide any personal identifying information. It does not identify or face, do have any facial recognition software. It is not video surveillance. It captures an image of the rear of the license, the rear of the vehicle, the license plate of the, of the vehicle. It's not a continual running surveillance, video surveillance system. It does not do traffic enforcement, such as red light citations. Um, the policy that we have clearly prohibits the use for any sort of immigration enforcement, harassment or intimidation of protected classes or personal use by any law enforcement uh, personnel. Only the data collected related to the rear of the, of the, um, the license plate on the rear of the vehicle is used as a pointer system and as an investigative tool of potential last known location, um, and it also provides us with leads to follow up on related to criminal acts and behavior only. The data retention uh, currently for the flock safety company is a maximum of 30 days, and then the information, the, the image is deleted. At that point, if we have not identified that image as potential evidence or as evidence in a crime that we are investigating, the information is deleted. We do not retain it any further. If we are going to keep it, it now becomes evidence in a case and is attached with a case number and is part of that overall investigation. I will point out that there is some discrepancy as far as um, <laughs> there's a section in our policy, Government Code 34090, that I think does need some more clarification. Um, that government code, in, in essence, basically says that information shall be retained um, from any sort of video monitoring system, is the way it's described, up to a minimum of one year. Um, I've gotten three different interpretations as far as whether an ALPR qualifies as a video monitoring system. So. I've, I've gotten everything from it does not qualify to uh, Lexapol has it in their policy. My assumption is their attorneys put it in there believing that it qualified. Uh, we also have Stephanie Duck from the city attorney's office who did the research and it is her opinion that it is not clear whether it qualifies. So I have three different very different opinions on that case, on that particular topic. But as of right now, our policy says, unless it is qualified as evidence to a crime, it will be deleted in 30 days. Uh, to the data sharing, uh, the ALPR systems are restricted to law enforcement personnel only with official and legitimate law enforcement purposes for accessing the system the system, you can audit the system to determine why or who access certain information. And in order to access it, a criminal case number or incident number needs to be entered into the system for them to allow you access to any of their information. 
Photos gener generated by the license plate reader devices will not, uh, or I shouldn't, they are owned by us, the Santa Cruz Police Department, and will never be sold or shared by Flock. Um, this is just a, a, a real large image of from the Bay Area South of all the agencies and the number of cameras that are already deployed. This is not new technology. It's improving our ability to not only prevent but in to investigate crimes. It is a trending technology that has been out for years. Quite honestly, I don't want to see Santa Cruz at the, at the end of this list. You will see there that Watsonville has already deployed 20 cameras in their city. Scotts Valley is purchasing the mobile ARPR systems for their vehicles and also pursuing funding for potential fixed cameras in their city. Capitola will be bringing this forward to their city council the beginning of 2024. I will also add that UCSE is currently beta testing a system at their gates. It, at this point, they are not looking at the same company, but they are looking at a similar system where you could upload information into the system for wanted vehicles, wanted subjects, but also for the security of their students and their campus and faculty they are also going to be deploying these cameras in the near future. Um, again, as you can see, it's a very extensive list throughout the Bay Area, and this is just the Bay Area. I could have done it statewide, and it's a very large list. Next slide. This is an example that we received from, uh, from Flock Safety as something that I would suggest we can put on our transparency portal um, and this is what Watsonville, the city of Watsonville is, is currently using and Flock provides this for the city uh, and uploads the information. I can't recall, um, maybe, maybe Hector will be able to clarify, but um, how often they refresh this information. But it is hard to see. What it basically does is it reminds everybody the, the different policies as far as, far as prohibited uses acceptable uses, what it detects, what it doesn't detect, the hot list policy, access policy, and so on. It also will give you information about the, the usage and, and how many vehicles have been detected within the last 30 days, how many hot list hits in the last 30 days. And you'll see here, they had 28 hot list hits within 30 days in their city. They just got these cameras literally a month or two ago. It's concerning to not have these cameras and within the region not to be the only ones without them. I think that that sends a message uh, that everybody else is taking preventative measures and we are not. Next slide. This is exactly what we receive, and that's it. I have no idea who the registered owner is. I don't know where they live. I don't know what they do. This is entirely the information we get from Flock Safety, and this is it. You'll see that the license plate is blacked out. We did that on purpose for this pr presentation. But other than that, we received the license plate, the date and time, the location of the camera, how many times it was seen within the last 30 days, the body, the make, the color, and any other special identifiers such as window stickers on the back of the vehicle. The camera is fixed. It's not, uh, it's fixed in a static location. It's not moved around. It does not zoom in. It does not rotate. It's not 365 degrees. Um, we don't control it with a controller, it's fixed. It only captures exactly what you're looking at, the rear of a vehicle. 
Again, to access the information, there's got to be a need to know and a right to know. This information is actually less information than what an officer can actually punch into their computers and their vehicles right now. That gives us all of the registered information. So they need to have a, a, a need to know and a right to know to access this information, just like all the other information they, they uh, access today. At this point, this is, becomes our pointer system if this vehicle has been described in a crime with or without the license plate, provides us as a pointer system to dig a little deeper. And then we can actually go to a different system, run the license plate, and start digging about the registered owner. And do they fit the description of the crime or, or the criminal that, that committed the crime? Right, then we go and we do our investigative work. But I want this to be clear, this is all we receive. I think there's a lot of other information about um, tracking people and, and their daily habits. That's not what happens here. Next slide. At this point, um, like I said, we do have a representative from Flock Safety available for questions. We also have the city attorney's office available for questions. Uh, and obviously, we are here for, for questions as well. Thank you, Chief. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Bruner, you had asked, so let's start with you. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for bringing that information and answered some of my questions, and I know I pulled it because we did receive many concerns from the community around what this system entails, what it would do, um, and concerns I know I take very seriously. I worked really hard in 2020, 2021, facial recognition software and eliminating any kind of um, um, anything along those lines in, in our police department, the city of Santa Cruz. And um, so you said that someone from Flock was here, and I was um, curious to hear um, from them around the data. I know that um, some of the concerns were around the data that's stored with a third party and um, just access and how that could be used or not used and if they could speak to that. Yeah, I think that there's several layers of encryption and, and security around that information and I'll let, I'll let Hector from Flock Safety um, give us that information. Yeah, good afternoon. My name is Hector. Um, I'm the Director of Local Government Affairs with Flock Safety. Um, thank you for the opportunity to answer your questions today. Um, to your specific question, um, the data is encrypted um, from end to end. Uh, it's important to know it's sent to the um, AWS government cloud. All of those servers are um, located completely within the United States. Um, the data itself has what is called a time to live stamp, um, which means that at that 30th day, um, it is automatically deleted. Um, it's also important for the public to know um, as far as access to the data. The data is owned by the Santa, uh, city of Santa Cruz and its police department. Flock cannot um, share that data or sell that data. Only the police department can share the information within the system uh, to other law enforcement agencies uh, for legal law enforcement purposes. And as the chief mentioned, um, in the state of California, that's only other agencies within the state of California and in accordance to your police department's policies. Thank you. Uh, that's helpful to know. Um, <clears throat> Chief, and, and I, I imagine that we have other systems or devices that capture data by third parties, and <laughs> um, how does this compare to that? Well, I could say, you know, such as, for example, our Axon body camera footage, you know, it's, it's a very similar system where the, 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 the videos are captured throughout the day or night and then the officer docks the camera and the videos are uploaded and then they're retained based off of a retention schedule. 
and policy. Um, and I, I think what's also I want to mention, which is interested around the retention, is the license plate readers or the body camera footage, all of the Im images, they provide either inculpatory or exculpatory evidence, right? So I know there's arguments about how long we keep the information, but this information could also be provided as a defense to somebody that's being accused of a crime. So it, it's not always used to actually prosecute, it's also our, our responsibility to provide whatever the facts are. And sometimes this information is valuable as exculpatory. In other words, they weren't in the area because our cameras didn't pick up on the vehicle. So I think that's important to note. And then um, another question, the Watsonville example of the transparency portal, would we have to provide specific direction to have this, if this were to um, go forward, to have that posted as part of the transparency portal, or is that assumed? How does that um, work? I would, I would accept that direction if you want. I don't know if it's necessary. I could say now that that would be my plan to, to put that information up on our transparency portal and get that information updated. I, I don't know uh, if, Hector, can you tell us how frequently that information in that system is is updated? Certainly, um, the the transparency portal is updated daily. Um, it is a simple um, thing that we will turn on for the department, work with them to make sure their policy is linked, and as um, all of the you know agencies that they're sharing with, et cetera, and the amount of searches um, performed are updated daily for the community to see. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, I think I'll wait for public comment if any other things come up. Thank you. Thanks for answering a lot of my questions. Okay, we're gonna move our way around. Ms. Watkins. Thank you for the presentation. And I actually have most of my questions um, asked and answered earlier, so I appreciate you taking the time and also bringing this to the Public Safety Committee. I just wanna make sure I caught something that I thought you said that there were changes to what was in the original packet to now, or is that is that okay? And I wonder if you can maybe share what those are. Yeah, it's around uh, SB 34 that clearly states there was a, a bulletin that came out of the Attorney General's office a few years back that clearly states that if you're going to deploy the ALPRs that you will not share the information, sell it, give away anything with any other private entity, uh, another state agency, law enforcement agency, or federal law enforcement agency. Okay. So it's clearly... That in the packet that we gave you is not clearly outlined in our policy, so that needs to change. Okay. And, and I will tell you that... In the, sorry, just if I may. Okay, go ahead. In the policy, or it needs to change in the resolution today? Uh, it needs to change at minimum in the policy. Got it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, sorry. I just wanted to make sure I was clear if mm -hmm. moving forward. Thank you. And I will add that... Um, the police independent auditor also was given uh, the, the policy and provided feedback, and that was in two locations, the, the recommendation to, to include that. Yeah. Council Member Brown. I, I have a number of questions, but I think I'd like to wait to allow members of the public who have been waiting to, um, to weigh in, and if the questions arise, we can get those answered too. Thanks. Thank you. Chief, I have a few, so if we can engage in a dialogue here for a moment. Um, it's my understanding that the Santa Cruz County Sheriff's Department either applied for, received, had one of these grants, and has now returned the equipment, decided not to use it. Am I informed correctly or misinformed? I, I honestly, I don't know all the details. I believe I saw some communication that said they used them for a particular purpose and then gave them back. I, I don't know all the details around it, but they currently do not have them. Do not use it. Correct. Thank you. Let me ask a, a few others. Let me, let me go. I'm, I'm going to refer to agenda pages, so let me 
see if you've got the same page as I've got. I'm, I'm going to start on policy 415 on page 15.4. I'll wait till you're ready. Under operations? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, under uh, definitions, uh, just before 145.2, the sentence before that, it says that uh, alert from the ALPR system that a scanned license plate number may be in the NCIC or other law enforcement databases for a specific reason, including but not limited to being related to a stolen car, wanted persons, missing persons, domestic violence, protection order, or terrorist-related activity. So that seems to take a, which I think is a good idea, to have this narrowly applied and then includes the broad language of but not limited to. With that language in there, what are the limitations then? Right now, the limitations are involved in criminal activity. So it could include misdemeanors. It could include felonies. Uh, we did not want to limit it only to uh, violent or serious felonies. Um, so right now, it could be used legally for any criminal violation where this could be a benefit as far as a pointer system. Um, but as far as hits, I'm sorry, please as, go ahead. as far as hits go, I was kind of going off on a tangent there about investigative tool. This is specific to hits. Um, you know, this would be more specific to these sort of higher level violent sort of, sort of crimes. Um, but then again, if we have a license plate that we know of that committed a retail theft, we could enter that into the system. And so I don't want to limit ourselves. If we have the information and we can have a higher likelihood of success of ca capturing them, we would want to enter that, that, da that data into the system. Would I be right in thinking that if we adopted this with that policy language, that would give you discretion then with regard to what the but not limited to means? Correct. Um, it's really hard to kind of capture all the potential possible scenarios where we would want to use this. Sure. So we, we do like that, um, that flexibility, knowing that the rest of the policy clearly outlines, you know, it's got to be related to criminal behavior. It can't just be for personal use or something oh, along those that. lines. I understand that. Um, let me go on to... Let me, in order to go forward, go backward. Um, on the first page of the agenda report from your department, uh, in item one under the recommendation, it indicates that uh, the body would send this letter and so on uh, no later than December 31st, 2023. Is that a deadline for applying? Is that what that is? Yeah, I'll, I'll do my best to answer, and I might ask my, my PMA to you know, be more thorough, but um, essentially the application, we've applied for the funding and, and specifically for this equipment okay. um, with the, the OR3, which is the Santa, Santa Cruz County Office of Response, Recovery, and Resilience. Mm -hmm. They've approved that but wanted council approval of what the money was going to be used to purchase. That is due by December 31st, correct? Understood, thank you. Let me move over to page 15.5 in our agenda packet and let me go to the question under administration in 145.3. Okay. In, in the last sentence of that paragraph, which relates to the administration. It says, it may also be used, the it, I'm assuming is the ALPR system, it may also be used to gather information related to active warrants, homeland security, 
electronic surveillance, suspect interdiction, and stolen property recovery. The two there that are of concern to me that I'd like to hear more about is used with regard to Homeland Security, that's of interest to me, and it can also be used for electronic surveillance, which it was my impression that earlier in your presentation it couldn't be used for that. Mm -hmm. Now this says it can be used for that. Help me out. Thank you for that. Um, regarding the Homeland Security, originally the thought behind that was related to domestic terrorism and somebody that was of concern that may be coming to our city or going to another city. I will tell you since then uh, and after discussion with the independent police auditor, we will be removing Homeland Security because of SB 34. You cannot share that sort of information. So Homeland Security will not be included in the final draft. The electronic surveillance, where that comes from, and I will give a prime example. Um, I think it was about sometime this last summer, we had a, a robbery involving a firearm down on Soquel near Pacific Avenue. We got uh, a good description of the vehicle and the license plate. We were able to enter the license plate into the flock system. The city of Roseville pinged on the vehicle in their city. What the city of Roseville was able to do was provide us information of every place that vehicle went within their city, every camera that it passed by, in other words. Um, that's where the surveillance part comes in. And it's very valuable during the course of a criminal investigation to be able to show that these four suspects went to four different locations. If we're looking for the gun that was used in the commission of the crime, we may not find it at the registered owner's house. We might find it at one of the, um, one of the, the other uh, subjects that were with the people during the commission of the crime. So that's where the surveillance part comes, where you can actually say, okay, they passed by this camera at this time. Well, now they went by this camera at this time. So you can actually start picking up maybe, again, I'll use an example of if somebody is, if a child is abducted, we would want to know the, the general path of that vehicle if we're looking for the victim. Um, that becomes very valuable. Let's take a look at one, excuse me, 415.3.1 under ALPR administrator. We good there, Chief, yes. where we are? Good, thank you. Uh, in the first sentence there, it says, the administration deputy chief shall be responsible for developing guidelines and procedures to comply with the requirements of civil code section 1798.90.5 at sequitur. Uh, has that been developed? It has not, and the reason for that is because we needed to clarify, and as I've seen with you know running the, the policy by the uh, independent auditor, we still need to clarify the retention rule, right? So before we start establishing these guidelines and procedures now, I wanted to get clarification because now we can establish exactly what those are going to say. Would you be developing these pursuant to that portion um, of the uh, policy manual? Would you be developing and adopting that portion prior to implementation? Yes. And we will post that on our transparency portal as well. Okay. Let me go down to four point, excuse me, 415.4 operations. In section B there, it says the ALPR may be used in conjunction with any patrol, excuse me, any routine parole. I'm going to try this one more time. I'm sure <laughs> I, I can I get the English words out in a moment. Uh, an ALPR may be used in conjunction with any routine parole, patrol operation. So with regard to any routine patrol operation, that sounds different to me than what I, th 
what I think is being advanced here, which is there's something that's already a problem. There's a, uh, somebody's kidnapped somebody, somebody's committed an armed robbery, whatever, you're trying to track them down and that kind of thing. That's not a routine patrol operation, or maybe it is, but it seems like routine patrol operation is a very wide net. A uh, patrol operation can be I'm patrolling on the street, I live on Market Street, yeah. and they decide to trigger this on for some purpose. Uh, I'm gonna go to, in a minute to this, how this system works, actually physically works, but that seems rather at variance with the more narrow-casted way that you folks are presenting this. That, that, that seems a broad net as opposed to a narrow mm -hmm. cast. As part of our routine patrols, we're always looking for stolen vehicles, and I'll use stolen vehicles as a, a standard routine patrol operation. Day or night, you, you're, you have a hot sheet that you're looking for these cars. That hot sheet only applies to the, the vehicles that are stolen within the county of Santa Cruz. Um, so where this could be utilized is if a stolen vehicle goes by a, a, an ALPR, a hit will alert the officers that there's a stolen vehicle at such and such location and allows them to go find that vehicle. The next sentence reads, reasonable suspicion or probable cause is not required before using an APLR. This again seems to me mm -hmm. somewhat at variance with what the general um, characterization of this as very carefully narrow cast, only used in certain circumstances, needing lots of, this seems mm -hmm. wildly at variance with that, where there's no probable cause requirement uh, or reasonable suspicion. Correct. So an example of that would be uh, simply uh, a very broad vehicle description that was involved in the commission of a crime, and we can plug into the system let's say, uh, a red Mazda pickup, and we don't have a license plate, right? So then at that point, uh, we don't have reasonable suspicion or probable cause to look up a specific person's red Mazda pickup. But at that point, it gives us, as a pointer system, it could give us all of the red Mazda pickups that went through the license plate camera at a particular date and time. And then we start digging a little deeper and we start looking at the registered owners of those vehicles, start seeing if they match the description, if we have a suspect description of the crime. So in the beginning where we just plug in red Mazda pickup, there's no, if three of you own red Mazda pickups, there's no reasonable suspicion or probable cause required to do that is what that means. Now, to go a step further, you start digging about, then it, we would establish the reasonable suspicion or probable cause based off of other factors, description, and so on and so forth. Um, so now it can produce that, and in some cases we have had where there was a distinguished um, bumper sticker that was described Right, mm -hmm. so we can punch that in, and that's getting a little bit more defined within the law. On page 15.9, ALPR data detection browsing audits. This, uh, the browsing audits Take a moment and describe how that will actually work. What a browsing audit is and how it works. Who conducts that? To whom do they submit that? So our, our professional standards unit supervisor, they will conduct the audit um, just as we conduct other audits within our own system now around property and evidence to ensure we still have what we have booked in and so on and so forth. Um, the professional standard unit supervisor is the one that does 
any sort of audits that we need to, to do to make sure we are within compliance of, of our policy. Thank you. Go to page 15.11. What is an automated loss, uh, license plate reader? That particular point, two thirds of the way down the sentence reads, the stored license plate data also provides law enforcement investigators with a pointer system that may help them identify vehicles associated with suspects, witnesses, or victims, and develop exculpatory information that assists them with focusing their investigative resources. I want to focus in on the exculpatory information issue. Can you just Is clarify real quick where, where you're at and wh oh, where you are? Uh, page 15.11 in the agenda packet. Under FAQs. Well, my apologies. <laughs> <laughs> I've kept up up to this point. <laughs> okay, under you, FAQs. You caught the old geezer uh, uh, using paper again. Yeah. Sorry about that. Um, Chief, this is on the page that begins at the top with FAQs. Okay. We good? Okay. Uh -huh. Okay. okay. Uh, Ms. Brown, thank you for pointing that out. I'd have done this for three and a half more years if you hadn't pointed that out. Um, let's let's go to the uh, the very end sentence on that uh, under under the first question. It says ALPR cameras. Uh, I'm sorry. Let me. I have two questions here. With regard to the exculpatory information, uh, I want to make sure I understand what that means. Does that mean, let's, let's use your red Mazda pickup truck example, and there's seven of them that you see in this system. Is the exculpatory information that there's seven of them, and as you go through it, you can eliminate six of them, and that's the exculpatory part? Correct. Okay. It actually basically would prove somebody, or help prove somebody's innocence, right? which is just as valuable as the inculpatory. Shall we say. Yeah. Um, is that information then of the exculpatory information? Can this be used by the defense in a case of a criminal activity? You, you believe you've gone to the DA, the DA files charges, the defense attorney says, I'd like to see this information because it may be exculpatory with regard to my client. Absolutely. Okay. We, we, okay. we are Good required to, to turn over all evidence that's relevant to that case, especially if somebody is being accused and, and charged for the crime. Uh, we sh they shouldn't even have to ask for that. That should be provided by us on the front end, um, which I would say would then result in charges not being filed to begin with, and that's just as important. Fair enough. Uh, we've been back and forth on this issue. Uh, I think when you were initially pre presenting it, it was the, the, the way the system works is that it's on a fixed, it's somewhere, it's on a pole, and whatever, and that's how it works. But in an example we've discussed in the last few minutes, you indicated use that could be used by a patrol vehicle uh, because this also says that cameras can be installed on vehicles, which would be the mobile application, and then there's the fixed camera. So in fact, it's there are roaming cameras. Does, does every patrol vehicle, will they be outfitted with this? No, we wanted to make sure that that was presented to all of you, that, that it does exist, it is an option, but that is not what we're pursuing. We're pursuing the fixed cameras. So the example that we discussed where someone's driving down, a, a police vehicle is driving down Market Street was not a good example because you're not going to have one of these license plate readers in a patrol car? No, the example I provided was still a result of a fixed camera that gets a, a vehicle license plate goes past that fixed camera. Then the system provides a hit to us, an alert of the hit. 
Okay. So that's that's how that would, would work on the fixed camera system. So now I'm going to abuse my privilege of having the for a moment longer, if I might. Um, let's talk about how this physically works. How many of these will be in the city and roughly where will they be without compromising your you know, law enforcement issues here? Is this going to be at basically busy intersections around the city or where and how will these be deployed? Yeah, the ultimate goal was to purchase 14 as a result of this grant. And in addition to that, I was looking at purchasing, purchasing eight that would be paid out of our general fund budget. So a total of 22. Okay. We've consulted with Flock. They've done a map. And their recommendation was 32. Um, so the plan for now would be to start with the eight. By the time we get the funding and the processing for this particular grant that's before you guys today, um, that won't be until the end of 2024 um, by the time they process it and all of that. So uh, at one point, if we had the 22, my goal is to first have every location to come in or go out of the city covered. That would be my goal. Um, so you're talking Highway 1, River and 1, um, you know, the, the Murray Street Bridge, all the SoCal, those locations. And then the other ones would cover some of the more major intersections within the city. Um, the one that is currently being used was used as a result of an uptick of about two years ago of some shootings that we had in that neighborhood. I went to the neighborhood and had a community meeting with them, the residents, and they thoroughly uh, appreciated and actually wanted more than one camera uh, in order to prevent, hopefully, any further shootings. And if there was one, give us a higher likelihood of success of capturing the ones responsible to any additional shootings. Let me see if I understand how this, the actual physical system works. So let's assume there's a camera at Ocean and Water, a pretty busy intersection. You're already in the city, but pretty busy. I would imagine that might be on the, on the list of, of mm -hmm. potential intersections. And the technology is, is on there. It's employed. This is where my understanding of it ends. Uh, is this a constant streaming of information and then when you, you, uh, the police department says, well, 1999 uh, Res Mazda pickup, uh, you know, is, uh, we have reason to believe this was involved in a residential burglary. Mm -hmm. Then the technology sorts through the constant stream and says, aha, at 12.32 p.m., a red Mazda, 1999 red Mazda pickup truck proceeding west on such and such turned left onto Ocean Street. And here's the picture of that vehicle and their license plate. Is that how it works? Yeah, that's how it can be used as a, as a pointer system for us. I, I don't believe that they do all the way down to a, the year, of the, the, no, no, the yeah, make model. Yeah, fair exactly. Enough, fair enough. But, um, but generally speaking, the real issue I'm interested in is this is on all the time. Yeah. And Mayor, I can provide some kind of uh, some insight if you'd like on, on exactly how it works. Um, pre pretty good job actually um, describing the way that the system works and there's there's a couple of facets right there's the um, proactive side of the system in which a vehicle passes by um, a camera um, at, a, at the entrance of your city um, the license plate is flagged as being uh, associated with a stolen vehicle one of your officers in their patrol uh, or patrol vehicles will receive an alert within 20 seconds letting them know that that vehicle has been seen by that camera at that location. That's important because A, it's a, it's a potential crime, right? There's a stolen vehicle, so that's something to be investigated, and there's potentially other crimes that are going to happen. At that point, your department's policy comes into place, and then they will determine, you know, they will clear that alert, um, they will, and then determine, you know, what the next steps would be. So that's the proactive side. 
And then there's the investigative side, which means that the cameras will be taking images of the back of each vehicle that passes by. Um, if and when there is a crime reported, uh, your department will, using the different filters, depending on what has been provided to them as evidence, then search the system, right? But they only can search it if there is a case number per your policy um, and, and go into the system. In order to protect privacy and not have a long-term retention of data, at the 30-day mark, um, all images that are not searched and downloaded and placed into the evidence system are completely deleted and no longer retrievable. Um, and so that's really how we provide a investigative tool that's useful because many times, you know, things are not reported right away or there's not enough evidence, um, but still protect privacy and try to balance both of those out. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Can, can I provide one piece of sure, clarification too? This is not a system where we will have an, uh, an individual sitting at a, at a desk and monitoring all of the cameras. Okay, so it has the proactive side that will only give us an alert if the vehicle's license plate is in the system because of a crime that has been committed associated with that vehicle. The other piece to it is the reactive side that you can utilize it as an investigative tool based off of a limited uh, vehicle description and or a description that includes the license plate. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Anyone who's with a further question by the council? Seeing here none, uh, I, we will reserve the right when the matter is back before the council. Anyone who wishes to provide public comment, this will be your opportunity to do so. Uh, Ms. Bush, do we have anyone online? Mr. Brokaw, we'll start with you, then we'll toggle back and forth in person, online, in person, online. Good afternoon, I, sir. Good afternoon. I requested extra time on behalf of the ACLU to present arguments against. Thank you, sir. Um, oh, sorry, really quick, Mayor. I didn't get that email, so how long are we getting? Let's, let's go ahead with five. Let's start with five. Thank you. Um, I want to nominate you for the first award at the ACLU Awards Banquet for the Weed Whacker Award. If you need a weed whacker at home, I will go to Home Depot and buy you one because you just did a magnificent job. Thank you, sir. Um, I've prepared a two-minute speech in case I didn't get five. Um, so I will go through my two-minute speech and then I will add, please. This is a toy. It is not a tool. This device is designed to collect, not protect. You have to know who you are looking for and their license plate number for this device to help law enforcement. The person driving that vehicle has to be the person you're looking for. This device only gives you information about cars, not people, not little old ladies, not kidnapped children, not violent felons, just cars. In and of itself, it solves nothing and collects everything. The most senior law enforcement officer in Santa Cruz County, Sheriff Hart, practiced openness and transparency by meeting with the ACLU in advance of deploying ALPRs and a short stretch of SoCal for a short period of time. He then returned them. Sheriff Hart has no plans for further development. This is transparency at its best and accountability at its best. SCPD has demonstrated neither. There is no documented crime wave for which this device will solve. It is a device looking for justification. To date, there are 31 letters against in your packet and not one in favor. ALPRs have been in beach flats for two years. When the head of SCPD was asked about their efficacy, did they solve any crime? The written response was, I don't know. When asked to share the traffic stop data with the public, the written reply was, I don't have the manpower. The law requires SCPD to compile stop data on an Excel spreadsheet and transmit it to the state attorney general periodically. If SCPD does not have the manpower to press send to share a document, who will they sign to manage the data generated by these toys? 
A vote for this device will be remembered in November. Do not advance this request. We the people request, you know, we demand that you reject this absurd request. At the very least, hold a town meeting on this subject. This is one decision that will affect every single resident and every single visitor to this city. I got a number of things to talk about based on what I've heard. But one thing I'm prepared to say is we're talking about an $84,000 grant, but that doesn't mention the ongoing $66,000 per year to maintain these devices. So I think the budget is not properly presented. We have heard through your questioning and the answers that the policy for this is not yet ready for prime time. We should not be buying surveillance devices until we have a firm policy that everybody agrees on. Now, because I used to live in Palo Alto, I've worked in that general area for 40 years, I continue to read their newspapers. Menlo Park had license plate readers, and they don't anymore. One of their officers was busted for using the data to track his girlfriend when they were not together. Okay, you can have all the laws in the world, but if you have somebody who wants to get around them, they'll get around them. That's why this guy has a job. Stanford Police Department and Santa Clara Sheriff's Department, entire data now belongs to a hacker. It is being held for ransom, and they have yet to pay or decide to restore their own data. Data collection is very, very slippery. And we don't have any assurance whatsoever that Flock will follow our requests or our policies. Thank you very much. Thank you. What color would you like? Thank you. Online. We'll take next person online. We'll talk back and forth. Person online, good afternoon. Three, two, one. We're going to take the next person who's in chambers. Hi there again. My name is Rhonda Reyna. Boy, this sure sounds like a Hegelian dialectic and a snake oil salesman pitch because there is nothing safe about this. Have any of you read the Constitution of the United States of America? But the, because this is a violation of my Fourth Amendment right. This is an unlawful search and seizure. It's a violation of the California Constitution, Section 1, Right to Privacy. I see an easy lawsuit here. I'm so glad you gave me the list of cities to go after because I'm going to start suing them for violating my constitutional rights. You are absolutely opening up this city, and I would encourage all members to start filing lawsuits against this. This is absolutely unconstitutional. My medical data has been stolen. My um, retirement data has been stolen. The company I work for three weeks ago had a cybersecurity hack. There is no way Flock can say that this system can be protected and the data isn't going to be stolen. And so I absolutely reject this. And if any of you um, uphold the Constitution like you swore O's to do, and, um, you know, Chief, I really don't understand your thinking on this. I don't know who put you up to this. It sounds like the unelected United Nation with our unholy alliance with Klaus Schwab and the World Economic Forum and the WHO. And I'm looking at the open air prison slaughter of women and children in Palestine. And I don't want Santa Cruz to be like that. So I really am going to appeal to your humanity here. Leaders in Santa Cruz do not follow suit. How many of you grew up here? Look after us. Protect us. This is not safety. It's the opposite. You did a great job trying to throw out some stuff, but I've had police officers lie about me. I've had police officers file false evidence against me. They are untrustworthy. So, you know, I don't know who put you up to this, but, you know, get a new job. We have uh, 
a person online. Let's go with them. Good afternoon, person online. Hi, this is Peter Gelblum. Um, I'm the chair of the local chapter of the ACLU. Um, when this, if these things get posted at every entrance of the city, I can just see Visit Santa Cruz's new, uh, new motto. Come to the city of sun, surf, and surveillance. Every single person coming into the city is going to be surveilled. What are we doing here? Look, there is no need for this massive invasion of privacy. There is zero, and this is my biggest point here, when you compare it to the certain invasion of privacy, there is no evidence, I stress, no evidence that ALPRs improve public safety or reduce crime. There is none. You didn't hear any from Chief Escalante. You didn't hear anybody from the person from Flock. There isn't any such evidence. So why are we doing this? And it's going to cost a lot of money. As Mr. Brokaw said, $66,000 a year at, at the low end for maintenance of these cameras. The city, as I understand, it's in a fiscal emergency. We don't have that money to spend. Um, this list of neighboring AL cities with ALPR, to me, it's not comforting. It's frightening. We do not want to add our name to that list. The data. The data. The data can be hacked. We've seen this over and over again in entities that have vast protections. protections. All data can be hacked. The only way to guarantee that the data is not hacked or obtained by anybody else is to not collect it in the first place. And I mean that. That is the only way to assure that. And, and finally, I want to point out uh, something that the mayor uh, referenced, that the, uh, the law requires the SCPD, before implement, implementing a system, to establish guidelines and procedures. The mayor focused on that, and, and the chief answered directly, they do not have those guidelines and procedures yet. They're not done. So, but he says, well, I'll post them on the internet before we implement. That's not the point. The point is for you as our elected leaders to know what you're approving before you approve it. You need to know the details of these guidelines and procedures, which are crucial, their retention, their guarantees of accuracy, their audits, their training, vital stuff. And you will not have that before the vote today. You need to have that as the mayor suggested before you decide whether to approve these at all. I strongly urge you to reject this request to order that no ALPRs be installed in the city and in an absolute minimum to put this off, hold a public meeting that was held for the Beach Flats ALPR, as Chief Escalante said. There's been no public meeting about these at all. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Good afternoon, sir. Ms. Bush, while the gentleman's approaching, could we have other people online? How many? Two more. Good afternoon again. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Bill James Ewing Whitman. I wish the community member who was told he'd be able to comment in two or three minutes was still here. But, you know, there's so many things around me when I look around that remind me of the film Idiocracy. That well, I will say this about two or three minutes, and that is I used to say when I was presiding in the legislature that in, in public agency time, everybody can run a four-minute mile. So there you go. You're on. <laughs> You know, I, I appreciate that. I mean, I'll contact my friend later. It's good to yeah. see him. Um, there's just so many red herrings being discussed here. Like, what's really going on? I don't know. For example, cameras like these were suggested by the previous police chief, Andy Mills, in 2019 in the lower area next to the boardwalk. You know, I, I read this thing, and I did some research on these cameras. Um, I know when I was living in Europe in 1986, I was I learned that um, they had cameras that would give you tickets for speeding. Uh, the, what's not really being discussed, and I wish that everybody, including myself, had access to my YouTube channel that had a over 430 playlists, where over 316. Their title was Leo and Youth because the only people being thrown under the bus more than. Uh, law enforcement, peace officers, and emergency responders are teachers and youth. So these devices are actually pretty innocuous. It seems like from what I've read about them, they are operating in the light spectrum that we can see. And human beings can see between 3 and 5% of the 100% visible light spectrum. But 
the wireless in this room and the wireless technology where you guys rubber stamped 27 different intersections from Santa Cruz to past State Park Drive, they're operating in, in spectrums that are actually very dangerous, you know, and um, they're very dangerous. I wish I had an hour to talk about those subjects. So once again, there's issues that are of real concern that aren't really being discussed. Um, but I, it, so it's really kind of indifferent when you look at this $84,000 for this expense and how injured people can get from, you know, just regular Wi-Fi or their earbuds. That's just pennies. Like $84,000 is pennies because how important are, is everybody's health in reality? It's priceless. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next person online, Ms. Bush. Good afternoon, person online. Three, two, one. Good Hello? afternoon. Nope, we'll take them in a Can minute. Can you hear me? You, no, you got to react faster, Nick. Come on, person who's here in chambers, person online, be ready to go. Yes, hi. Uh, I'm actually here for the discussion about 180 SoCal, which apparently has been pushed. Uh, but in any case, I do have something to say on the topic of networked devices and IoT and industrial IoT, as it is, in fact, the sector that I operate in as a business and corporate entity here in the city of Santa Cruz for decades. And I can tell you this, is if you're reading the news, you'll understand that there's this thing called the CHIPS Act. And this is a multi-billion dollar effort by the government to bring sourcing back to the United States. And the reason for this, well, there's many and varied, but primarily, it's the veracity of your supply chains. And there is no one here, I guarantee it, that can tell me with a clear eye that there is veracity in that startup's supply chain. I guarantee you that's all Chinese bottom of the basement. They probably don't even know what the CPU core they're running is. And, and you want to put that, okay, let's put it behind a firewall. Guess what happened to the Danish government last week, everybody? You like your emails being read? Nobody here is qualified. And you guys are going to make these decisions just like, like this off the cuff? Just say no, people. If there's still time, you can make sure that your supply chains are verified. You can make sure that the servers that operate the cloud, which means somebody else's computer, are within a legally mandated border that we can actually control and sue the firm if they do have a breach. Where's the indemnity? Thank you for your time. I look forward to talking to you about 180 SoCal as well. <laughs> Very good. We look forward to hearing from you in that regard. Uh, let, me, uh, let me go to the person online. Ready to go? Here we go, person online. Come on now. Can you hear me? Now we can. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Hi, Gary. It's here again. Uh, I really, really encourage you to support these license plate readers. Uh, all these comments are, you know, safety, privacy has disappeared 20 years ago with the Internet and so forth. You can't walk from a city hall to a Santa Cruz coffee roasting company without being on probably 10 surveillance cameras with watching your gate and your face. And you have no control over who's using that data. Further, these things are very successful. The error rate is like 0.4%. And Vallejo, they've increased their uh, vehicle apprehensions and stolen by 140%. Um, again, our, and our police department is always going to be understaffed by however many, six, ten officers. That's, that's just going to be the, that's the new normal. We need to leverage technology like this to assist our police force. Frankly, I look forward to the day when we have really good facial recognition on every, on a camera, on every street uh, um, light pole, including one of those, you know, remember the mousetrap game, the little cage that fell down? Yeah, with a little cage that falls down on the perpetrator once they have a hit. So please, please, let's have these cameras. Thank you. 
Thank you. Good afternoon, sir. Ms. Bush, while the gentleman's approaching, do we have anyone else online? One more. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, hello, um, Bruce Walker um, from the medical field. Um, please oppose the purchase and permanent installation of automatic license plate readers and this additional step towards the implementation of a smart city. I grew up in a country that taught me to repel and reject the regimes that are known for surveillance and control of their citizens. This was and is against our ways here in the United States. Now I hear that not only does our country want to do this, but right here in our city of Santa Cruz, the police chief wants to put up surveillance cameras that see who is entering and exiting. This sounds like another country. I'll say communist China in parentheses, not ours. We have privacy rights here that were brought about when our country was founded. Our forefathers and foremothers fought for such freedoms from the tyranny of kings and queens, which it seems like our federal government is trying to become once again. Our veterans have fought in wars to keep our rights protected. Now, right here in our precious neighborhoods, we are losing such privacy rights under the disguise of protection. I do not want these cameras installed. I do not want to live in fear. What I do fear, however, is how they will be used. I have some questions that I would like answered. Um, some of them were answered with the uh, display up there. But I had, what company are you buying the cameras from, which we found out? Who will be maintaining them? And we found out the expense of that. Who will be running them? Who gets the footage that you are collecting? And I do not trust that our federal government is not getting their fingers in the pie. Why do you want to see me when I am leaving or coming back to Santa Cruz? I really do not like these coalitions known as public-private partnerships. When actions are public, they are much more accountable than when they are involved with the private sector. We have elected you, the key word here is elected, as our representatives to look out for us citizens and to see that we are not taken advantage of. Please remember this as you are deciding on such an issue as this that is dealing with our privacy. Please keep my trust in you. And one thing that got brought up earlier was uh, domestic terrorism. And from my understanding, now if I go to a protest that the United States government does not agree with, I am a domestic terrorist. Thank you, sir. Thank uh, you. Ms. Bush, one last person online, is that correct? We'll take that person online. Good afternoon. Three, two, one. Matters back before the body. I will recognize the vice mayor. I'd like to move the staff recommendation. There's a motion on the staff to approve staff recommendation. Is there a second? I'll second that. There's a second by Ms. Watkins under debate and discussion. Madam Vice Mayor, you may open. I hadn't intended to speak to this. It was on the consent agenda, and I think that's why we didn't get a lot of public um, correspondence in opposition on the consent agenda. It's generally assumed that we'll just kind of move forward with um, this item. I would like to say I saw this sticking out of, out of Mr. Brokaw's pocket, and I'm sure many of us have those. There's Teslas driving around that are filming us everywhere we go. Everywhere we go, we are being filmed and recorded and tracked, whatever we're, we're doing, right? To me, this tool is something that our local law enforcement can use to help keep us safe. I've... Um, been victim of, had my family been victim of, friends, businesses, victims of various crimes throughout the years. And to me, after meeting with the chief and understanding how it works, it seems like a tool they could have in their tool belt to help um, keep the community safe. And when it was brought before public safety, I really uh, supported it then and I support this now. So thank you. Thank you. Ms. Brown is recognized. Thank you, Mayor. I'm going to go ahead and ask a few questions now. Some of them have been answered. Uh, th 
from other council members questions. Um, some points have been raised that I also have questions about and so I'm gonna um, just start there. I do have a few comments I'd like to make before uh, we take a vote. Um, <clears throat> so um, on the question of cost, there we have a we have a cost for it. We have uh, some estimate of what they'll cost to maintain over time. Um, so, but I am interested in better understanding what the, the actual cost will be for the department to maintain, use, um, and, and the other associated costs. Um, and I'm thinking in particular about a uh, related question. So, what, so one question on costs for ongoing. Um, what are we looking at here? Um, it is general fund money that's going to be spent for this. Uh, two, um, how, well, and this is cost, but also how will this happen? Training officers to use this technology. Um, how, will, how will officers be trained? And be, we don't have the guidelines yet produced. Um, I'd also like to know how will officers be trained to ensure that they are not misused. Um, I'm not suggesting this to, to say that, you know, we're looking for people who are going to misuse it intentionally, but we've heard um, it happens. We know it happens. In some cases, intentionally, others, there's a breach. Um, what, you know, what kind of training will help us, uh, members of the public, be assured that um, the data will not be used inappropriately? I'm going to have the principal manager and analyst discuss the, the cost part of this. Mayor, council, thank you for the opportunity to clarify on the costs. Each unit that we are uh, looking to acquire costs $3,000 per unit per year. That includes the data management, the maintenance. It includes all of that. The only thing that's not included is the one-time installation costs, which ranges between $150 and $650, depending on how complicated. If Flock has to come in and install their own infrastructure in order to securely uh, place the camera, that costs more money. If we can use existing infrastructure, city-owned, that will cost less. And that's it. So the $84,000 would cover 14 cameras for a two-year contract, which is the minimum amount of time. Um, and that does not include installation costs since that is unknown, since we don't know the complexity of that. But it would be between 150 to 650 per unit. So just to be, if I could, uh, try to clarify here, that's the cost for the Homeland Security grant readers Yes. You are talking about an additional number of readers. It would be the same cost per u unit. Sure. Yeah. And so part of this will be general fund. Part of this will be, be paid for through the grant. That's the intention here. And then ongoing, the city general fund would pay for maintenance after the grant is, is up. Th that is correct, although there are opportunities yearly to go after a grant like this. And, and since... These, this piece of equipment um, is applicable to this particular grant um, as far as protection of the community, then we could potentially get approved for additional funding to extend the lease program. Okay, um, I have, thank you. Uh, another question, I, I mentioned training and in relation to the cost of this, but I'd like to hear more about how officers will be trained. Yeah, I think the goal would be to bring in a flock safety and have them trained so we have a group of officers, uh, supervisors, managers that sort of we have a train the trainer program so we don't have to continually bring the company back to, to train just a, a small number of, of personnel. So the goal would be to have flock safety come in, do, do a, a training for not only managers, supervisors and officers um, the, the platform itself is very simple. It's really easy to walk through um, as far as, you know, the different components that the, the image captures. Um, and the biggest thing is really if you don't put in a case number or an incident number, it does not, it does not activate the search. It will, it will give you a, an alert that you need that information. So it is very, um, 
very simple to, to work the platform. Thank you. Um, n n now I, I want to ask, because in addition to my concerns about privacy and, and civil liberties, um, I, you know, I have concerns about efficacy here and what the trade-off is, right? If, if we're doing something that is what we know is going to lead to um, additional surveillance, <laughs> it is going to, um, you know, these things do have predictive uh, capabilities, and so while we're not talking about the, the, the technology, does I've read quite a bit on it, um, and so we're saying we're not going to use that. But there's, a, as the mayor has suggested in, in the questions asked, um, there's a lot of really kind of generalized, you know, sort of it feels very open ended. It feels, um, you know, not not fully baked, and so there, there's a lot of potential for you know. I hear you say, well, that's not going to happen, or we won't allow that, but. I don't see in the guidelines, um, you know, the, I don't see that. Um, in terms of efficacy, I'd like to ask some questions about um, our own experience. They have been deployed. Um, how many of, um, you know, how many hot list hits are we getting? Um, how, how can you give us some information about how this has been? You know, I, I want to be convinced this is effective and I'm not based on the, <laughs> the information I have available to me. So I'd like to hear about our own experience. Mm -hmm. I recognize that the studies kind of writ large, it's very difficult. The studies I've seen have shown no correlation between the use of these things and actual solving of crime. So I'd like to know about our own experience. If, if we ha how many crimes have been solved I will as give a result? You, I will give you one example. Um, there, there was a homicide in the city of Fremont that included a five-year-old girl. They had the vehicle plate entered into the flock system. When that vehicle passed the camera down on Third Street, um, our officers were received an alert. That information was immediately um, relayed to officers working patrol that day and they stopped the vehicle it was leave, as it was leaving the city going over Highway 17. All four suspects, three or four suspects, were taken into custody and handed over to Fremont Police Department. Okay, so that's one. Just wondering about the- I can the give you another bigger, one. Yeah. Well, I'd, li I'd like to actually have a better sense of, of the numbers, right? I, I mean, it, it, the, the examples are compelling, I understand. Um, that they're important, but I'd like to know um, through our use of automated license plate readers so far in the city, um, what what ha has been what have been the outcomes in terms of crime solving? So I did not capture the information from Flock. The current camera that we have now is a Flock camera, but we got it as a loaner from NICRIC, which sound, it's an acronym for Northern California Regional Intelligence Center. So it's actually NICRIC's camera, but it is a Flock camera. So mm -hmm. we're not in contract with Flock to produce the, um, the information like we showed earlier that Watsonville Police Department has, has access to. Uh, as far as total number of hits or total number of plates run in a 30-day period or a um, or a year, or whatever you you know would want to capture there. So, so we can't access data uh, about whether or not these have been efficacious in the city of Santa Cruz until we approve moving forward with a bunch more. Is that, that's what I'm hearing you say, and I don't I don't agree with that. Just like to, it, it feels like that's information that would be helpful to have. I, I don't disagree. Uh, what I'm saying is that we're not in a contract with Flock, so they're not necessarily uh, in a business decision with us to produce the data, and the camera itself was lent to us from a different different company. So um, that's part of the answer of, of why we don't have that data right now. I think I'm going to stop asking my questions because I'm, my sense is that they won't be answerable given what you just said. Um, so I'll just I'll just make a com couple of comments here. Um, I recognize that it's it seems like uh, it's an enticing proposal, right? Um, and and there we see that these uh, technologies have been uh, 
you know, there's a, there's a huge uptake over the past two decades. We know this. Um, but what we don't have is information about um, the extent to which they have actually led to, um, you know, successful prosecution of crimes. And um, the one study that I've seen uh, for Piedmont, California, uh, suggests that they're within the degree of statistical probability um, over a 16-year period, 0.03% uh, uh, increase in, um, you know, uh, investigations. So for me, the trade-off to, um, you know, <laughs> to really to really put technology in place that, you know, we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know how it's going to affect um, individuals' lives. We don't know what collective impact it's going to have. Um, so I'm not um, prepared to do that. So I'm, I'm, for philosophical reasons, for privacy and civil liberties reasons, I'm opposed. I don't think this is an efficacious uh, project, and I think it's just, you know, I, everything I hear when I talk to people is these are revenue sinks. So um, just... Uh, to, I'll end there. That you know, it's just there's no, it's not cost effective for us to do this. We're not going to get anything out of it. Um, I'll leave it there. Thank you. The, uh, a couple of points here. Uh, one is, I am wondering if the vi vice mayor, who is the maker of the motion on the table to accept and, and move ahead with this, would be willing to accept a substitute motion, which would continue this item to our December 12th meeting, uh, and uh, let me ask you that, and then if you are, I'd be glad to open on this, or if you'd like a further explanation, I'd be glad to do it. I just have one quick question Certainly. first, if that's okay. Certainly, um, of course. My question is, let's say if you're driving down 41st Avenue and the, the red light cameras, can you explain what kind of information those are capturing? How is it similar or dissimilar than this? Do you know? Do you I don't. Okay. I actually, I don't. Right. Okay. I think, uh, quite I don't honestly, I think it's actually capturing more information um, because they end up sending you a notice in the mail. So then somebody, at that, whether it's the camera itself or the police department, separately runs the license plate to determine where to send it. The other piece to that is that I believe those cameras actually capture images because, as somebody said earlier, they were very accurate. It's not the car that commits the crime, it's the driver, right? And so that's why in this particular system, it's simply a pointer system. It's just a, a piece to one of our tool, one of our tools, potential tools, a, a camera that you're talking about at some point has to be able to prove that you were actually the driver that drove through the red light. Right, and so I think that's just a little final point or question I'd like to just bring to everyone's attention. Okay, you don't agree with this, but you do go to Capitola, like they're capturing you there. And so it's just, <laughs> to me, it just seems um, a little ridiculous to say that the point, you, the reason you don't want this is to protect our privacy when it's, it's happening everywhere. To that end, I'll, you know, I'll let you speak. Um, and I'll, I, I'll continue the item if that will make the rest of my colleagues feel happy to get more information. Thank you, Madam Vice Mayor. Is that agreeable to the second of the motion? Could you explain your, you mentioned Certainly. you Certainly, I'd be glad to do that. Are you going to second? Would you like me to explain it first Please. or would you like to second? Okay, so my, my view is this, uh, that as this sits here today, I can't find my way clear to vote for this. I think I might be able to on the 12th if we can continue this and we can in a more complete way, uh, Chief, uh, discuss potential amendments to your policy that you have here uh, with regard to operationalizing this grant should we apply for it and should it be received. Uh, and there's no surprises here. The items that I've raised with you during our colloquy here would be the items that I would like to discuss at greater length. Uh, that may get me to a point, or presumably you, uh, that would get me to a point anywhere where I may be able to vote for this. And so, but as it sits today, and I want to thank the Vice Mayor, if that's acceptable to you, and the second of the motion, that now is the substitute motion before us, and uh, 
that would be my desire to continue the item to our December 12th meeting, have the opportunity for anyone who wishes to, to engage you in discussions. For my part, those discussions will go to the issues we've already discussed here in open session and see if there are changes to the policy with regard to operationalizing this, which, uh, which might address uh, the concerns that have been raised. I can see the city attorney is uh, hovering at his microphone. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. Um, I would just recommend, uh, should that be the, the direction that the agenda description include a review of the policy itself as opposed to merely accepting of this grant uh, application and authorizing the grant. Clear to you, Ms. Bush? It is. Clear. Uh, agreeable to the maker of the motion? Second? Mm -hmm. Agreeable. Any objection? Just follow up briefly. Thank Today you. would not be a, an appropriate time to direct modifications to the policy because it's not on your agenda. Exactly. Well, we can engage in those conversations, and when it comes back, then that would be the appropriate time and place. Uh, further on this item, Ms. Brown. Just really quickly, I do want to make the point that th what I see is the difference between uh, a fixed camera for red lights uh, is or speeding. Those images are captured when people actually violate the law. It's very different than just tracking people um, and you know thinking about you know how are we going to figure out which red Mazda, right? <laughs> you know when not nine out of ten of them are not involved. Uh, it, it's a very different use of, it, of the technology. So that's where I just wanted to make that clear. <laughs> Chief, my last comment is this. I have great faith in you and the women and men who work in our police department. I do not believe that you would do things that are untoward. Uh, I know you. Uh, you are a known quantity in our community. I have great respect for you. We are, however, a city of laws, not a city of individuals. And so before we move forward on this, we'll make sure we engage in more conversation with each other about this. Clerk will call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. If I could just really quick, um, the turnaround is gonna be really tight for the 12th. The packet does go out in a week and a half. We'll have so. it for you before then. Councilmember Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkin? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. <laughs> Motion passes and so ordered. We're on item 21, and this is an appeal from the Planning Commission approval of a development proposal at 1800 Soquel Avenue in Santa Cruz. Let me, for those of you unfamiliar with the process, let me explain how this will work today. Uh, what we have is an item in front of us on appeal from a decision of the Planning Commission. First thing we will do is we will receive a staff report. That'll take 10 minutes or so. Next thing we will do is we will acknowledge Ms. Bone, who is here as the appellant on this item. She will have up to 20 minutes to speak on this item. Xander Cameron, who is the applicant on uh, the project, will then have 20 minutes to provide uh, such comments as they wish to make on this. Council members will then have the ability to ask questions. The public will have the opportunity to make comments. Then Ms. Bone, following that, will be given f a five minute period of time to provide a rebuttal. So the appellant has two bites at the apple, the applicant has one bite at the apple, council members and the public also will be engaged in this. Let me begin by recognizing Mr. Bain for a staff presentation. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Ryan Bain, senior planner. I'm going to go ahead and share. Is there someone else that's sharing? Here we go. Thank you. Okay. So good afternoon. Um, what we have before us um, this afternoon is uh, 
at consideration of an appeal of a planning commission approval for a project at 1800 SoCal Avenue. <clears throat> Excuse me. So just to familiarize everyone with the site location, um, it's about a 0.81 acre project site, consists of three parcels um, located on the southeast corner of Hagman and Soquel Avenue. Um, there's commercial uses that surround the site um, with the exception of residential uses across the 15 foot alleyway um, to the south. Actually, this is the 15 foot alleyway right here. <clears throat> the site has had a number of different uh, uses over the past few years, including used car dealership that's currently operating, um, a restaurant, and uh, other auto related uses. Um, there are currently no trees on the site, though th there are three trees along SoCal Avenue that are proposed to, to be retained as part of the project. <clears throat> so the project uh, consists of a, a four-story mixed-use uh, building, at-grade parking, um, street-level retail along SoCal Avenue, and 84 uh, flexible density residential units above. And in terms of the permits that are involved um, with the application, there's a demolition authorization permit um, to demolish uh, the existing buildings on the site, a boundary adjustment um, f to basically merge the three parcels that are involved as part of the project, a design permit and special use permit, um, which are required as part of the uh, zoning code uh, for uh, mixed use projects and for the um, flexible density units over 16 units, and then a density bonus request, which will involve um, some um, waivers um, which I'll get to later. So mentioning the density bonus, um, the base density that was calculated was 67 units. Um, the developer is entitled to 32.5% uh, density bonus or 89 units. Uh, as I mentioned, it's only 84 units, so they're not taking advantage of the, f the full density bonus. Um, but as part of that, um, seven units are required to be provided at the very low income, 50% AMI. And seven percent, or seven, I should say seven, at low income, which is eighty percent AMI. So, um, with that being said, that also meets the city's twenty percent inclusionary requirement of fourteen affordable units. So, the um, this is a look at the site plan, um, kind of updated site plan since the planning commission. The, there's been some changes that we'll discuss a little bit later, but uh, the vehicular access to the garage is provided uh, via the fifteen foot alleyway. Um, that runs along the south side, um, connecting Hagman uh, and Forest Avenue to the east. Um, the first floor consists of um, 2,889 square feet of retail space um, along the SoCal frontage, uh, including an outdoor um, dining area for potential future restaurant uh, or food service. And additionally, the residential lobby and access to the above residential units is along um, SoCal Avenue. Here's just a, a rendering looking from the SoCal uh, frontage. And this is also a uh, northwest elevation of the, of the uh, proposed project. And then the residential units, as I mentioned, will be located on levels second, uh, two through four, um, with the second floor also including um, a large podium area uh, with open space, uh, seating, landscaping. And in terms of the 84 flexible density units, um, Half of them, 42, will be 432 square foot studios, and the other half um, would be 615 square foot one bedrooms. So the Planning Commission heard the project on September 21st. Um, I should mention over the course of the review of the project, um, planning staff had encouraged the applicant uh, to incorporate additional retail space um, along Soquel Avenue. I think originally when submitted, um, they had about 1,400 square feet or so located right there at the corner. Um, they did respond and, and in increased it to 1,900 square feet. Um, and then prior to the Planning Commission uh, meeting, we added a condition that basically um, would require them to provide additional um, retail along SoCal. Um, in response, the, um, the, uh, the applicants, prior, just prior to the Planning Commission meeting, um, for, um, did a revised um, plan and added almost 3,000 square feet of retail, or actually increased it to almost 3,000 square feet of retail. Um, but also as part of that, um, there was some moving around for um, the floor plan. So there was a storage was reduced from about 1,700 square feet to 14, 
thousand cubic feet, I should say. Um, open space was reduced from about 7,000 to 6,700. And then there was a 200 square feet of indoor common open space that was removed. So um, I'll get to this a little later, but there's amendments that, um, these amendments also coincide and required uh, additional um, waivers uh, as part of the density bonus. So at the planning commission meeting, um, they approved the project on a four to one vote, um, finding that the project was consistent with the uh, community commercial general plan designation and policies, consistent with the east side business area improvement plans, um, and then also um, granted the density bonus waivers. So the waivers, there are six waivers total. Um, one, to exceed the maximum height. Um, in the CC zoning, um, it allows three stories, 40 feet maximum height. As part of the density bonus waiver, they're asking for four stories, 46 um, feet in height for the proposed project. Um, floor area ratio, 1.75, they're proposing 2.45. Bike parking, um, 84 would be required, and they're providing 73. Um, usable open space, um, you can see there's about 1,200, and so it's about half of what would be normally be required for the waiver, part of the waiver. Storage is reduced, and then the indoor common spaces I had mentioned earlier. Also, as part of the planning commission approval, um, there were some conditions of conditions of approval that were revised. Um, these are fairly minor, but um, for instance, this one has to do with the timing of demolition, um, clarifying the bike parking requirements, final colors at the building permit stage. Um, and then these conditions of approval were added um, as part of the Planning Commission um, approval, one being that they require a management plan um, for the, uh, the apartments, that the alleyway be repaved between Hagman and Forest Avenues for the entire length, um, and, that, and then also regarding the alleyway, they crafted a condition that the applicant work with the city to basically provide some possible safety improvements um, along the alleyway on the private portion to help with, uh, with the uh, use of the alley and making it safer. And then also a uh, condition regarding adding two additional trees along Soquel Avenue, um, assuming that it's feasible um, look at the building stage and working with the city departments. <clears throat> Excuse me. So following the Planning Commission approval um, on October 2nd, we received an appeal um, from uh, Deborah Bone representing the concerned neighbors of Hagman Avenue and nearby streets. Um, the, the appeal letter discusses several reasons um, for the grounds of the appeal uh, with the three main issues um, kind of boiling down to trans uh, transfer station study requirements, uh, mobility um, goals, and then the alley um, safety and access. So in regards to the traffic study, um, the appellant asserts that the calculations and assumptions in the transportation screening memo that was prepared by um, Hexagon Transportation Consultants erroneously determined that the project does not need a traffic impact study. So the city requires a traffic impact study to be prepared for any project that is estimated to generate 50 or more net vehicle trips during the PM peak hour. So this is, this is considered an objective standard um, applied to all city projects and under the Housing Accountability Act, the city cannot require a traffic impact study um, as part of a residential project that generates fewer than 50 net um, peak hour trips. Let's see. I was just going to mention, can I go back? So just to kind of clarify what the screening memo basically states is that the actual gross or the gross um, PM peak hour trips actually does not exceed 50. Um, and then when you take into consider the net, uh, including credits for the existing auto dealer, um, it would be about 40 PM peak hour trips. And then there's a restaurant that's been there for a long time and that was not actually even included in there when technically it probably should be included. And so it actually would reduce it even further to 10 PM peak hour trips. So in regards to mobility goals, and this is in our general plan, the, the appellant asserts that the Santa Cruz general plan <clears throat> has numerous goals that are relevant to the project and are not being met. So um, the city's analysis indicates that the project is consistent with the, with the mobility goals presented in the general plan, 
as well as the objective standards. Um, there are a number of improvements to the public right-of-way adjacent to the, to the site and on the site that enhances mobility and meets the mobility goals in the general plan. Um, this includes a dedication of over 1,600 square feet of right-of-way to widen um, the roadway, um, relocation of new traffic signals and poles there at the intersection, um, uh, including a, um, I should say, including a new dedicated left turn lane from Hagman onto Soquel Avenue, um, expanding the sidewalk um, to 10 feet along Soquel and eight foot along Hagman, um, undergrounding all utilities, um, paving, as I mentioned, paving the entire uh, length of the alleyway, two new street lights, um, one along Hagman and one along Soquel, and then there's also new street trees as well. So um, all of these really do help improve the mobility around this site. So they, all, as I mentioned, everything here does, makes a safer intersection at Hagman and Soquel Avenues. Um, more livable streets with the widened sidewalks, the level of service uh, improvements at the intersection. And then one thing I was going to add is including a, rec a, new a new recommended condition of approval, um, just for more clarification. Um, in coordination with and subject to the approval of Public Works, the applicant shall refine the Hagman northbound left turn lane design at the bu building permit stage and provide new lane striping in the street to ensure proper queue storage and circulation. So that's a new condition that um, staff is recommending as part of this. Um, and then the, kind of the third main subject of the appeal is the alley safety and access. Um, the appellant asserts that there are significant safety concerns um, regarding the use of the alley that abuts the site to the south, which is right along here, connecting Hagman and Forest Avenue. Um, the 15-foot alley basically has historically been used which a lot of alleys that are, you know, but a major um, commercial corridor, basically um, these commercial properties use the alley for, for circulation, as you can see. Both of these par parking lots use the alley and require the alley, um, use of the alley in order to get circulation in and off the site. Um, also for deliveries um, to, the, to the rear of, of the building, so. The alley is, has, that's generally what alleys have been used for along these commercial sites. Um, you mentioned also there's also a single family house um, that does um, access the alley with, um, from the garage. Um, as is common practice, um, as I mentioned, it was the, the alley is incorporated into the overall design of, of these sites and is really the best way um, to provide access um, to commercial uses as opposed to creating um, new driveway approaches along SoCal Avenue. So as currently proposed, the project effectively widens the alley um, from 15 feet to about 22 and a half feet um, for the length of the subject site and providing, it really provides more room for cars to pass each other and to accommodate pedestrians and cyclists. Ad additionally, the Planning Commission added conditions that the alley be paved, um, as I had mentioned, and since the Planning Commission hearing, the applicant has been working with the uh, Public Works and Planning staff to address the condition that was added about creating some safety um, measures for the alleyway. Um, and then this, this is actually a, this has been an updated um, site plan since the Planning Commission to kind of address some of those issues that were brought up. So this is what they've done here is um, this they've originally had a diagonal spacing here. They've changed it to perpendicular parking spaces. So basically um, cars can aren't forced to only exit toward Forest, but also they can back up and, and, and uh, leave toward Hagman. Um, the driveway approach here at Hagman has been widened from 15 feet to 20 feet. Um, and then a loading zone, which was a topic of discussion at the Planning Commission meeting, has been added here for deliveries. And then also there's been striping and a wider drive aisle um, for the garage entrance to, for the project. Um, so dis discussions with the applicant are on, are on the improvements to the alley are ongoing. And other things that have been mentioned um, as possibilities of helping with safety um, include 
potential convex mirrors here at the entrance, you know, so basically there's, you can see if anyone's coming down the alley as you're exiting the parking garage, potentially warning sensors um, and down lighting um, along the building onto the alley for safety at night. So these are all things that have just been discussed. So um, the development will implement the city's vision of the SoCal East Zone um, area as expressed by the general plan um, and the East Side Business uh, Improvement Plan area. Um, it provides a mixed-use project with retail fronting SoCal Avenue and 14 uh, much-needed uh, affordable units as well as 70 market rate uh, residential mm -hmm. units. And as conditioned, the proposed project meets the requirements of the zoning ordinance and the general plan. So staff is recommending that the council adopt the resolution to deny the appeal and uphold the Planning Commission's acknowledgement of environmental determination and approve the related permits as part of the application based on the findings listed in the draft resolution and the conditions that are attached to that resolution. I'm available for, for any questions, as well as um, public works staff is here um, to answer any questions, as a lot of these appeals um, generally have to do with public works type issues. Mr. Payne, thank you very much for those uh, for that staff presentation. Uh, I think what we will do at this point is we'll proceed through the appeal rebuttal we'll receive public comment council members comments as we move along Ms. Bone good afternoon and uh, oh you're not Ms. Bone you're not I am Ms. Bone this yes, is Ms. Dubin I am actually Deborah and this is Rena good afternoon can you hear me okay good yes. afternoon mayor council developers and community today I'm asking you to set aside all the other pressing issues which we know you have very many of and just focus on one intersection and one development and thank you so much for taking time to hear our appeal. Again, my name is Deborah Bone. I live on Hageman Avenue. I've been there for 34 years. I'm here with Rena Dubin, who lives on Forest Avenue. And many of our neighbors are in the audience, or you've seen their letters in your packet from the previous hearing. Our concern, as we represent um, over 100 households that live close to and regularly use Hageman, Trevithan, and SoCal Avenues and the alley to, at Forest Avenue. Please take a minute just to visualize this intersection. You're driving east on SoCal Avenue. You've just passed Morrissey, Frederick Street. You see the Walgreens on the right. Just across the street, across Hageman, one ho once home to May Sushi, is the site of this proposed new housing at 1800 SoCal Avenue. In a minute, you're going to dip down past Palo Alto Medical Foundation and Capitola Road. Now, for many people, this corner is a pass-through. For us, it is home. We need you to help us make this corner safe. To clarify, we recognize the need for housing. We know the state regulations have changed. We're not here to stop the development. We've asked for a transportation study to highlight the many safety issues that we witness on a daily basis. You have said by statistical analysis that this project does not meet the 50 vehicle peak hour trips threshold for such a study. However, the city of Santa Cruz has defined this as a critical intersection, and we did find a memo from 2021 entitled Transportation Study Requirements for Development that clearly states that, quote, any critical intersection receiving 25 additional trips per hour during AM or PM peak hours as a result of the project should be analyzed. So we're asking that you consider with us the impacts of this proposed development. As longtime residents, we have expertise about this corner. We remember how many times the utility poles have been damaged by drivers who miss the curve where eastbound SoCal, SoCal veers unexpectedly to the left. We have been blocked often enough during construction or accidents to ponder seriously what an emergency evacuation would be like for our neighborhood. At off-peak hours, we routinely watch cars speeding at 40, 50, 60 miles per hour hardly a safe zone for bikes or pedestrians. We all have stories of near-miss encounters at one or another of the dangerously misaligned corners. I think you guys know about how misaligned those corners are if you've ever tried to get from Trevithan to Hageman and get in and out of Walgreens parking lot. We are very grateful for this opportunity to bring our safety concerns to you, our elected representatives. 
If a transportation study had been done early in the planning process, these concerns would have been apparent. So now, today, we ask that you take seriously our experiential knowledge about this corner and the adjacent alley. We want you actually to address the problems and use your authority to propose better mitigations, both in collaboration with the developers, and we really appreciate the efforts that have already been made. Many changes have happened since the planning, and we know that you're working with Public Works, and we really are counting on you to help Public Works make good decisions about this corner. Every one of you has driven through this intersection. It doesn't take a study to imagine that adding more density will seriously impact this already burdened corner. 25,000 cars per day were counted in 2014. That's 10 years ago. Especially for those of us entering and leaving Soquel Avenue at the Hageman Corner, soon to include those residents in, of 84 more units coming onto our little street and onto, say, onto Soquel. The proposed development nearly doubles the number of households using this corner. We are concerned about the safety of our own neighbors and for everyone who drives or walks or rides a bike on Soquel Avenue, whether from Arana Gulch, through the alley, or from the many connector streets between Morrissey Boulevard and Capitola Road. You all know that traffic funnels from one side of town to the other along this section of Soquel Avenue. It is the only route besides Highway 1 directly through our neighborhood, and it is our only way out of our, out, in and out of our homes. Please do not treat this project as a standalone. There's serious cumul cumulative impact from all the developments east of the San Lorenzo River, as well as another proposed development on Hageman Avenue, and yet we do believe that there are practical solutions. We recognize that the proposed boundary adjustment and perimeter right-of-way are welcome improvements that do allow for modest widening adjacent to the project. In addition, we strongly support the newly proposed wider garage driveway. We thought it was a 30-foot curb cut. Today, you mentioned a 20-foot curb cut. We really want to make sure those cars going in and out are not going to hit each other. It does go a long way towards making traffic in and out of the garage safer, and it does protect neighborhood uses of the alley. However, as proposed, we question whether there will be enough width on either Hageman or Soquel to fully implement the needed bike and turn lanes. In our fondest dreams, the footprint of the corner retail would be moved back a bit to correct the age-old misalignments at that intersection. More realistically, we highly recommend a compromise. Consider making the sidewalks a little bit smaller so the corner doesn't stick out so far. Commit to making a protected bike lane, a real true protected bike lane. Provide adequate turn lanes and traffic signals on all four corners. Implement recommended safety features in the alley. My neighbor, Rena Dubin, has prepared a slideshow so that you can understand our concerns in greater detail. We believe that this is a unique opportunity for the city to implement solutions. Once the building and sidewalks are there, it will be very hard to change. We are counting on you our elected officials, to prioritize our neighborhood safety and provide direction to the developers and public works to make this even better than what's been proposed so far. And I do have a handout that just summarizes some of our suggestions. We're really hoping that you will take them to public works, work with the developers. We're not against having this housing on our corner. We're worried about the 100 people who are going to be coming and going from our very single traffic light. How do I do, do I click Good for afternoon. this? Good afternoon. Do I click for the slide on the mouse? Is that how I work? I'm sorry, say it again. How do I work the slideshow? Oh, okay. Hi. <laughs> I was told by a city staffer that the only way to get the alarming safety issues surrounding this project fixed was to appeal. So a lot of neighbors pitched in money to buy the appeal just to have this chance to speak with you. Many care deeply but couldn't be here on a Tuesday in the middle of the day. This appeal is a plea to add modifications to this project so that our real safety concerns are addressed. This project makes an already dangerous intersection worse and we are alarmed at about the safety and livability of our street. This is fixable. 
As one neighbor says, all the residents here are asking is for a better solution, which in reality is a more sustainable solution for all involved. There is a better way. The intersection of Soquel and Hageman is a traffic nightmare because, as a neighbor puts it, this block is a bottleneck. Three main arteries pass through Santa Cruz, Water, Soquel, and Broadway, which ends at Frederick Street to become one road, Soquel. Traffic here is already at a gridlock. Don't take our word for it. The latest study we could find from 2014 says that this intersection receives upwards of 24,000 trips per day. That's 9 million a year. And that figure was from almost a decade ago, as Deborah said. Part of our frustration is that there are multiple developments proposed in our neighborhood that will affect our intersection, this designated critical intersection. And just to say, I understand the need for housing. I understand the density laws handed down by the state. As some of you know, I personally have spent thousands of volunteer hours advocating for affordable housing projects. And generally, I'm in favor of developments like this one with studios and one bedroom rentals. But we need you, our city council, to understand the cumulative impact and act upon it. Slide, please. Here's the east side slide. We have this, no, another, yeah. We have this development at 1800 Soquel, slide. The one at the car wash, slide. The one at 515 Soquel, like, slide. Another one on Water Street, slide. Three more on Ocean Street, and another, and another, and another, and another. There are also townhomes planned, and another slide on half a block down on Hageman. And I know these are all separate projects. Slide. But when you start, nope, go back. <laughs> there we go. When you start adding all this housing, mandated or no, you need to be paying attention to the infrastructure, which is already at capacity. The cumulative impact on our designated critical intersection will be way more than this 24,000 trip figure. This area is already dangerous. You need to fix it when you have the opportunity. And that opportunity is now, today, before the development is completed. This area of Soquel is dangerous. We know how congested this intersection is during high traffic times, but what I learned from Quentin Rowland with Vision Zero is that what makes this intersection particularly dangerous is the high speeds that people travel in the off times of the day and night. Slide, please. Quentin easily tracks speeds at 53. Slide. 55. Slide and even 60 miles per hour in the middle of the day. The cars you see in the photo are not the speeding cars, they're long gone. But do notice the cyclist and the dog walker and the person waiting for the bus right alongside the cars that are traveling at the freeway speeds. What makes this intersection especially worrisome, slide, is how it jogs strangely in all directions. Note how Soquel curves and narrows on the Capitola side, while Hageman and Trevithan are misaligned. It's difficult for a driver, especially one who is speeding, to anticipate the jog along Soquel. People naturally assume they should keep going in the same line. It's easy for drivers to drive straight into the utility pole, it happens, and into the bike lane. The current design plans for a 10-foot wide tree-lined sidewalk on Soquel. However, the 10-foot wide sidewalk does very little for the neighbors because the adjacent bike lane is too small. When the bike lane is too tight for comfort or safety, bicycles and fast-moving e-bikes ride on the wider sidewalks and they endanger pedestrians. Slide. My daughter was hit on a cyclist, um, by a cyclist right here at the bus stop. The cyclist was riding on the sidewalk and she was getting off the bus. And the new renters of this development are expected to take the bus, or walk, or bike, as the state allows this development to be underparked. There isn't even one space for per unit. So this is our first ask. Slide. Reduce the proposed 10-foot sidewalk and add a protected bike lane instead. It's better for cyclists, pedestrians, and vehicles. I'm not sure what's on the paper, but this is, this is our first ask. Slide, please. 
If the bicycle lane is enlarged and a protective barrier is installed, drivers will be able to see how the lanes curve and narrow when driving through the intersection along Soquel. Paint is not enough. Vision Zero has some great additional recommendations to improve safety on this intersection, but the time to make the improvements is now. Once the development is built and the sidewalk is in place and the trees are planted, we've lost. This is a golden opportunity to make the area safer. A cyclist has already died on this corner, so we need you to do what's needed now so that it doesn't happen again. And slide, please. Speaking of this corner, let's look at it from the Hageman side because it's really skewed. See how the Hageman streets and the Treventon streets are misaligned? This development changes the traffic flow from the light and the alleyway, the egress from our neighborhood, and creates some serious evacuation safety concerns. Slide. Our streets, Forest and Hageman, make a horseshoe shape with a cul-de-sac. There are about 90 houses. As one neighbor says, you must understand Forrest and Hageman. Everyone who lives here has to get onto Soquel, which is super busy, to go anywhere. Unlike small neighborhood streets that have multiple ways to get in and out, we only have the one cross street, which is Soquel. Slide. We are dependent upon the alley and the light at the intersection of Hageman and Soquel to be able to get into and out of our homes. Whenever there is traffic on Soquel, we can't leave our streets without the light and the alley. If PG&E is doing any kind of upgrade or road work, or you have a water pipeline project or a Murray Street Bridge being rebuilt, we can't leave our homes without the light and the alley. The public alley is, as a neighbor calls it, an important traffic corridor that mitigates some of the worst traffic in the neighborhood. Slide. So when it was presented to the Planning Commission, this is what we thought the project looked like, and we do acknowledge that the developer did listen to our concerns. Slide. And this is the proposed updated design, and it's not perfect, but it is better than the original. But we still believe that the public alley should not have to accommodate the exit or the entrance at all. We're also unclear exactly what if this is the final version, what it's going to look like once it gets further down the road, which is very alarming to us. So let me walk you through this slide. Here is the alleyway. It's a one-lane alley, but traffic goes in both directions. It's 15 feet wide currently, which is big enough for one fire truck, but not wide enough for two cars to pass each other. Here's how one neighbor describes the alley. I live at 178 Hageman Avenue, and I ride my bike down the alleyway twice a day with my child on the bike. I have used the alley every day for 10 years. It's our neighborhood's outlet to get to Arana Gulch. Almost every time I ride, I see people riding their bike or walking their dog or pushing their kid in a stroller as many people use the alleyway. Slide. This one lane two way traffic works because there are only 90 houses on our two streets. The development is 84 units, which is in effect doubling the amount of traffic on the alleyway. Slide. The development does not use Soquel for its entrance, unlike the previous developments that were there. It throws all of 504 daily trips onto Hageman and the alley. Slide. You've got people using the development going one way and people coming in the alleyway to get into the development coming the other way. So we're not entirely sure how they're not expected to bump into each other. Slide. Here's the updated version, but we still have questions. What if a car is coming in from Forest? What about the cars that will be parked outside, backing up into the alley to needing to make a left turn? Slide. Keep our alley a public alleyway, not a private driveway. Slide. And then here's the intersection on Hageman and Soquel. If we need to go towards Morrissey, we need to make a left at the light. Most times of the day, we cannot cross Soquel without the light at Hageman allowing us to make a left turn. It's dangerous. So here we are. We have, uh, we have neighbors from Forest and Hageman needing to make a left. You have the Walgreens exit for people making a left back onto Soquel. 
slide. You have this very wonky intersection at Trevithin that is at an angle and difficult to see. Slide. You also have pedestrians crossing. As one neighbor says, I have had cars almost hit me many times. Slide. We also have the new townhome development coming in here at 162 Hageman, which we know is separate, but it's going to add the cars. Slide. And you have this project with 504 daily trips. The light at Hageman is long. There we go. The light at Hageman is long. The cars, uh, the previous slide, please. The cars from this development will, as one neighbor explains, back up at the Hageman light. It will likely back up the car traffic enough that it blocks the alleyway. Then what happens? The existing neighbors can't leave, the people who live in the development can't leave, and we are all, in effect, trapped. Slide. The developer has tried to create two lanes here, one at the left and the other going straight into the right. Unfortunately, the divide is only one car length. Can I keep going for a few minutes? Thank you. This brings us to our next ask. Slide. Make the lane divide longer so that the cars on Hageman can actually go onto Soquel in one light cycle. Slide. We think this can be done. One suggestion is reducing the sidewalk on Hageman from the proposed eight feet. We would rather some of that space go towards making sure we can get out of our street. Slide. This leads us to our final concern about the Hageman corner specifically. Because of the misalignment at Trevithin to Hageman, the corner is very sketchy for pedestrians. The angle's too sharp. Here's how a Hageman neighbor described it. Because the crosswalk is so far to the right of the actual intersection on our side, drivers making right turns from Hageman onto Soquel encounter a crosswalk where one is not normally expected, just as pedestrians begin their very short time to cross. Slide. This project design will make the safety situation much worse by placing a four-story building directly on the corner. So visib visibly, you won't be able to see when you're trying to turn, turn where that car is. This is the developer's photo, but where that car is, you're, you're trying to make a turn and you go right directly into that pedestrian walkway. We do appreciate that the developer is curving the corner of Hageman and Soquel, but we need a larger curve and a larger setback here to help Trevithin and Hageman visibly align. Slide. The boundary adjustments for this parcel are already being changed, and a few more feet here would make such an important difference. Slide. We need a larger setback and alignment on this corner to protect, the, protect pedestrians. Slide. I'm not a safety expert, but do you know who is? The professionals who do transportation studies. This development will have a huge impact on this designated critical intersection. This is our only opportunity to get it right. Please make this development safe for residents, the old and the new. Thank you. Thank you. Let me now recognize Xander Cameron to provide rebuttal. Good afternoon, sir. I'm not Xander. I'm your partner. I'm Jim Arthur. Um, Mr. Arthur, good afternoon. I have sir. not met you all, so nice to meet you all. Um, but I'd like to thank you all for um, listening to us today. And um, just want to let you all know that um, working with planning has been an actual joy as a developer. I, I've rarely ever said that in my life. Um, so thank you guys very much. You guys have been responsive. Um, I'm not going to take a lot of your time. I just want to remind everyone of the number of things that we have done um, at the request of planning and the neighbors. Um, we pivoted within 48 hours to add more commercial. Um, did that not happily, but we did it. Um, you know, we've done, um, we've given up some of our land to ease that corner. I think that's a pretty big Big, big move for us. Uh, that's not something we typically like to do, to give up our land that we purchased. <clears throat> um, I'd like to thank the neighbors for their um, ideas on widening the entrance into the building. That was their idea, and that was a great one. So it's nice to get feedback like that that we can actually work with, so that was helpful. Um, you know, in, in terms of the, the bike lane proposal, 
and we've talked with staff about that. That's something that we'd be willing to talk about in the future. But let me remind you that that is um, going to be that one quick spot of road. The rest of the street is has nothing to do with that, so they'll be safe in front of our building. But you know, so that's something we're willing to to talk about. I'm not sure we can give up any more of our property for that, but you know, whatever we can do to help make that safer. Um, I also remind you that we are neighbors. We are going to be neighbors going forward. We will own this project. Um, those 84 tenants will be our our tenants, and so their safety is of, of maximal importance to us. Um, you know, I I do hear about traffic that it's a it's frustrating, and it's I think it's frustrating for everybody. And we we're we're doing what we can to improve what we have to work with. Um, you know, an entrance off SoCal I just don't think works. Um, it makes it even more dangerous, and you'd be cutting through your bike lane that you want, uh, and then people turning lanes that would be backing up in both directions without, you know, it, it just, I, I like the idea to not load up Hageman, but we found through working with planning and everyone, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't work. So, um, again, I'd like to thank you all for your time, and um, we're going to move on. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, uh, Mayor Keeley and, and members of the City Council. Uh, my name is Amber Morrison, and I'm with the law firm of Wendell. I'm sorry, that was my the former law firm, uh, Fenimore Wendell, um, and we represent 1800 SoCal uh, in connection with this project's entitlements. And I apologize for the late uh, letter that hopefully you all received um, this morning, but um, we did understand that there the council was considering potentially the imposition of a new condition related to um, relocating access off of the alley uh, onto Sakel and, and so we wanted to just um, politely remind the council that there are, there are significant pieces of recent housing legislation um, that really do confine and constrict um, the council's ability to either condition or disapprove the project. Um, the project has been submitted under SB 330, which is the Housing Crisis Act of, of 20. 19 um, and in connection with the project's application uh, preliminary application in September that actually um, locked in or vested the rules and guidelines which were in effect at the time of the of the application submittal so we understand from planning staff that um, there is a, uh, a general plan mobility goal that discourages mid-block access, um, such as one that is potentially being considered here on Sakel. Um, I also wanted to point out that there is a recent um, uh, density bonus law uh, case uh, called Bankers Hill versus City of San Diego, which essentially stands for the proposition that, um, at least in connection with a density bonus project, councils or local agencies cannot step into the role as uh, as project architect. The council and local agency is to evaluate the project as it's been proposed. Um, and then I finally wanted to point out that the project has also been submitted um, pursuant to the Housing Accountability Act. And in order to deny or condition a project, um, uh, a council has to make very specific findings related to a specific adverse impact. and. That's got a, its own definition uh, in the government code related to uh, public health or safety. And we think that the evidence is ample, um, uh, as was presented to the Planning Commission, um, that the, the current traffic does not pose a significant adverse impact uh, to public health and safety. Um, we certainly appreciate the, the uh, appellant's concerns. Um, but to now require uh, that a traffic study be prepared, we think, we assert, is inconsistent with, um, with the Housing Accountability Act and also SB 330. Um, so as, as Jim noted, we are certainly willing to work with planning staff uh, relative to the bike lane. Um, we've had very good discussions with staff um, and would anticipate that's going to continue. Um, assuming that the project uh, is upheld and, and that the uh, appeal is denied. So um, thank you, and we're available to answer any questions that council might have. Thank you very much. You. Is that the extent of the rebuttal? 
Thank you very much. This will be the opportunity for council members to ask their initial questions. Let's see if you all recognize the vice mayor. I want to thank um, everybody that came out today, and I want to thank staff for meeting with us um, prior to this meeting to explain the nuances of the project and the um, and what what uh, what's before us today. I did come up with three questions during the the deliberations, and one of them is. Um, the, the idea of that one block bike lane, um, what, what are maybe Matt Starkey's or Nathan's thoughts on whether or not that would help uh, with bicycle safety? Mr. Starkey, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, yeah, the, the bike lane, separated bike lane proposal um, is an interesting one. Uh, we are in the midst of undertaking our active transportation plan update um, citywide. The volumes on SoCal are, are high, as have been noted, which would suggest that we do actually want to have a separated bike lane on that corridor. Um, I think that's a good suggestion, and we've met with the development team to see if that's something we can fit into the existing distance between the building face and the bike lane um, line that's out there currently. I think it's something we can fit in a sort of interim condition if we move the, the sidewalk around a little bit and then we'll work through our um, active transportation plan to um, perhaps identify additional um, objective standards so that we can really carve out the space for that sort of treatment that we need corridor wide so yes it's a small uh, small segment of separated bike lane here but it is a step in the right direction I think that leads me to my next question because I seem to remember in our objective design standards a certain st standard sidewalk width. So if we were to reduce it here, how would how would that would we be in ordinance with what we've already approved a few months back, or how would that conflict yeah, with what we, we've already decided? We would have to accept a more narrow sidewalk on this frontage, um, with the goal of just squeezing it in here when we have the opportunity. But then when we do our uh, objective standard update, we'd want to maintain that enlarged sidewalk plus add the extra width we need for the bike lane. So this section would be would be constrained, but then in future proposals that come forward, we would have asked for this additional width at the beginning. Okay, and then my final question is, you know how Mission and Bay, you can only cross like three sides of it? Has there been any thought about just removing that crosswalk altogether and making the one crosswalk on the on the other side just bigger and more visible I think the um, the idea here might actually be um, thinking about how we do this with our signal timing instead uh, one treatment we have is called a leading pedestrian interval and those give pedestrians a little bit of a head start in the intersection so before uh, traffic the traffic light turns green to take a right turn we would have given the pedestrians a little bit of extra time to move out into the intersection and become more visible. Um, I think, uh, yeah, the note about there's a bus stop across the street, um, the need for pedestrian access here I think is really high, so I wouldn't want to remove the crosswalk necessarily and then just try to solve it with signal timing instead. Okay, thank you. Moving across the dais here, other questions at this stage? Councilmember Bruner. Just a quick question, seeing um, the slideshow that was presented by the appellant and the concerns of that whole intersection, which some of it falls outside of this project, but they're seeing an opportunity if work's going to be done and changes made at that intersection, um, that it be done now. And so I'm, I'm just curious what um, city staff um, can say about the, the safety at that intersection, the misaligned corners, and what what is in the works or in the plan to really address SoCal Avenue as a corridor and those safety concerns at that intersection. Um, for example, you know, other stoplights, moving the crosswalk, any of that outside of this project is anything I think the, the improvements are really what have been talked about thus far with the um, realignment of the, um, the northbound approach to create better visibility across the street. Um, the challenges with the alignment that are noted, I think are actually more um, for the Walgreens side of the intersection, just the way the angles come together. 
where you'd need the space is on the other side to allow that to line up a little bit better. So I think this, what we've done on this side of the roadway is a good start, um, but there is room for future improvement. Um, that's not in a, in a project at the moment. Thank you. Council Member Watkins. I just have a follow-up question, if I may, because I, I think if, if I'm also, I, my line of questioning was similar to what Council Member Bruner's was in terms of timing and sort of acknowledging that this is one project amongst a bigger stretch of need, I guess, transportation improvement need. Um, so what's the timeline associated with some of those improvements or potential improvements outside of the scope of this project? And I don't want to deviate too far from what we're doing here tonight, but I just want to put it in perspective. Like the Walgreens, for example, like some of the uh, you know, lights, et cetera. Yeah, those that would have to be a project that's not identified currently. So there is not a plan to do those sort of improvements. The improvements we have before us are really just focused on the corner of the development where we've realigned the curb line to make the, um, the, the visibility improved between the uh, intersections there. But it's part of our uh, general improvements for transportation, correct? Like we have strategies outlined it's a, uh, as aspirations. The yeah, the aspiration sure. is there. I think the, um, the uh, addition of objective standards about separated bike lanes is a good step, but there's not a specific project to today, it. yes. But as other development happens on the corridor, that's when we have opportunities. I, I wonder, I guess where I'm going with this is how to prioritize that given the traffic and knowing that there's only so much within this development and what's before us tonight, but also thinking about it holistically in terms of our strategy with SoCal and what we're thinking about in general. And so how are we as a council able to weigh in on that in terms of timing and priority? I think our, our next sort of planning um, project that's coming forward is the citywide active transportation plan update and the concerns we've heard about, you know, bicyclists and pedestrian safety on a quarter like SoCal would be a big focus there. Uh -huh. and, and the timeline associated with that is? Uh, we're hopefully kicking it off in January. Okay. Okay. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Council, you. excuse me, were you finished? Just... Council Member Kalantari Johnson is recognized. Council Member. Thank you. Um, and I also want to thank those who came and, and the appellants <clears throat> for your presentation. Um, but the vice mayor asked my question about the sidewalk and protected bike lanes, um, but I wonder if staff could touch on um, the issue that was brought up by the appellants around the corner of Hageman and SoCal and the request for a wider, um, wider turnability and um, a larger setback. Could staff speak to um, the challenges that, I mean, if that's feasible and if not, what are the challenges that would present? I think right now we're happy with the setback that's been established there, um, the curvature of the building, uh, the setback of the um, curb line have all made visibility improve there. Um, I don't think we need to ask for something additional um, at this time. We're happy with how that looks. And the concerns about the safety of visibility? Yeah, the setback is what helps us achieve that, the visibility. Um, and then, guys, I talked about a little bit earlier. We have other treatments, like thinking about how the signal timing works um, at that crosswalk in particular to help um, reduce some of those safety concerns. Thank you. Council member, good with that. Uh, do you have further questions, Ms. Kaltar and Johnson? No, that was it for now. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Butler, did you have further on this item? Thank you, Mayor Keeley. Yes, I was just going to uh, provide a little bit more uh, context to Councilmember Kalantari Johnson's question about the uh, about an additional setback, and um, I wanted to uh, point out for the council the comments that um, the applicant's attorney Amara was making with respect to our ability to require those things that are not objective standards. Um, you heard um, Matt Starkey, our transportation engineer, talk about the, the frontage and um, how in future projects, if we have objective standards, um, either in advance of the active transportation plan or through the active transportation plan, that would allow us to uh, establish that greater dedications be provided. But we have very limited ability to require that additional dedication 
um, absent having those objective standards. So I wanted to, to point that out for the council. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Butler, don't go away. Um, let me ask the appellant uh, a quick question. Uh, as, as I recall uh, how you presented your asks, if you will, I think you said here's an ask and here's an ask and here's an ask. Yeah. That's, that's, that's a summary in effect of this. Is that right? They might a be a little different. You know what? We worked on these separately. Even <laughs> I mean, we had a lot of conversations together, but we each wrote our own. I wrote those objectives based on our conversations. The, the wording may not be identical to how Rena presented things, but they are the, a list of things that we feel would improve the situation. Does that help? Yeah. So essentially, there's four things that we wanted. That's okay. what you're asking. Um, the protected bike lane, even if it's just on that corner there, we think it will really help the cars and uh, pedestrians and that, cyclists. That's the four that are in the. Are there? Um, yes, the in the alley, uh, making sure that we have the alley protection, right. the corner alignments, and um, yeah, more understanding of that light and the yes. So, so these these four. Those four, yes. So you, as the jointly as the appellant. Yes. This is what you're asking for. Yes, thank, thank you. Thank you. Good. Okay, <laughs> Mr. Butler, your turn in the barrel. All right. So let me let me see if I can work my way through this. If this application was here in 2017, let's go back in the way back machine. We're here with this exact same application. We're in 2017. My guess is, looking backwards, not only at this city, but other cities, the neighbors come in and say, here's a set of issues that we're concerned about. They're largely, if I get it correct, they're largely around traffic. It manifests itself in different ways. Here's something on Soquel. Here's something in an alley. Here's something on Hageman. Here's something someplace else. But it's really traffic. And if this was here, if we were here in 2017, the exact same project, I'm going to guess that what this city council or many other city councils in California at that time would have done is said, you know, we need less units and more parking. That's what we're going to do because that's what the traffic is all about is really how many units and how much parking and how do they get in and out and all that business. Is it, am I okay so far? That that would have been. That's correct, and, that and, been, and that is and also many jurisdictions. Yep, and including 20, this one, did this in 2017. 2017 is now when the laws really in, started to change. And now we're in 2023, and the state has passed 100 laws, and that's that's not a, More. a that's an accurate <laughs> statement. At least 100 laws in the last five years, uh, which have their characterization, knock down barriers to development. Correct. And so today as we sit here and we want to deal with traffic, am I right in thinking we don't have the option today legally to say, well, the way we're going to deal with this is reduce the units and increase the parking? That's absolutely correct. We, we, we do not, not have, have, we do not have that option. Okay, so everybody's absolutely clear that's not what we can do. So now we're going to try to do it some other way. And I want to have you step us through one through four here. Sure. And so let's take, and, and do you have the letter, sir? Do you have the uh, letter? I don't have it, but um, I, I jotted down the community asks from the presentation. So I can I want to do I it slightly differently because the community ask, as they have indicated, is just. Okay, so I'm, go I'm going to use your letter and assume that is what the appellants are asking for. Okay, I'm going to acknowledge you for 15 seconds. Come on. What, what is it you're trying to do here? Yes. Um, I want to submit, thank you, uh, Mary Keeley and the rest of uh, the council members. Um, I just want to remind the council that. Appellant, are you an appellant on this? Yes, I am also an appellant. Named appellant. Uh, I don't know if I'm at it. I just want to be sure no. what we're doing here. Okay, go ahead. You got 15 seconds. But I live also on Hageman <laughs> Avenue. Um, I want to mention that there is also another project that is coming down the pike that you're probably familiar with on 162 Hageman Avenue, which is half a block I'm, I'm away from this one. Do, I could say you can do this later under public comment. Okay. I'm, well, I'm I, it to impacts get, this because it's cumulative. I understand cumulative. that. Okay. I understand that. 
All right, now <laughs> back to you. Let's take item one, safe traffic flow. Items one through D. If the council chose to do all those things, could it do those things? You're talking uh, A through D under number one? Number one, A through D. Uh, dedicated turn lanes that are long enough to uh, accommodate additional cars. You saw actually in the presentation that staff is recommending that the developer work with Public Works at the building permit and encroachment permit stage to um, evaluate the striping and provide for additional stacking. So uh, the yes. developer has agreed to that, yes. So yes, B. Uh, install green arrow left turn signal at Hagman. I'm assuming that's northbound left, and I uh, believe that that is a planned as as part of the because there's a dedicated left, and then there is a uh, through and right. Are you planning on doing a left turn signal there? I, I recognize Butler, that. Here, yeah. uh, hang on just a second, Mr. Butler. This way. Uh, <coughs> What I'm trying to do is not understand whether the developer agrees to it. That's a separate question. I'm asking whether we have the legal authority on each of these items. So let's stay focused on that. 1B, can we do that if we wanted to? Could we impose that as a condition over the objections of the developer? Over the objections of the developer, do we, I do not believe we have an objective standard related to that. So no, we could not. 1C. Coordinate cross traffic from Trevithan to Hageman to avoid driver confusion, protected left turn and light timing. Um, that is um, something that we can do internally. Uh, we, we can, can coordinate the light timing internally, but it's not something that the developer would do. Okay, with or without the objection, uh, with or without the approval, one C? Uh, that was C. So one sorry, D, excuse me, one uh, D. visible speed limit signs, again, not something the developer needs to do. That's something our okay. public works team so can do. So in one, A through D, the only one we could, we could require. Let me, let me help you out. Yeah. A, the developer has agreed to. Has agreed to. B, C, and D are things that the city can do, yeah. but not require of the developer. Not require, but we could, we could, we can do those things. They are not imposed on the developer. Those are things we could say we're doing. That's so correct. We could do, in effect, on one A because the the developer has said they agree with this. We can do everything one A through D. Correct. They can all be done. Let's go to number two. Legally, they could be done. Yes. Say it again. Legally, they could be done. Um, it's just who's responsible. Understood. City versus. Understood. <laughs> I'm trying to understand yep. the legal situation we're in now yep. versus five years ago. Completely understand. Okay. 2A. Provide a wider, safer, protected bike lane on Soquel heading east where the road jogs. You, uh, Yes, uh, in that the developer indicated a willingness to not provide additional land, but to... Um, work with our public works department on where, on how wide that sidewalk is. Um, so when the project comes through to the building permit stage, um, that can be incorporated, should it be the will of the council. Okay. Um, I'm gonna ask the developer's legal counsel to come forward f for a moment, or the developer, either one, whoever can speak authoritatively for the developer. Thank you. Uh, good, good, very good. I want both of you to stay up here. You agree with that so far? Yes. Yeah, and I just checked with my client. Agree with They're that. amenable to that. With yes. With 2A as well? Yes. Okay, very good. Let's go to 3. Mr. Butler, let's take those A through C. So 3A is allowing 30-foot curb cut at the alley for wider two-lane entry. Um, we can require that um, on a legal perspective. On a policy perspective, a 20-foot drive line and a driveway there is going to be safer in that the narrower aisle is going to uh, be navigated at a slower speed. That's a so, choice issue. Yes. That's a but, choice issue, but if we but wanted yes, to. Yeah, the developer I, I know is going to be willing to add, to widen the driveway cut. They've put a wider driveway cut on their plans. Do you agree with that? Thank you. B. Protect public use of the alley, no, we do not have an objective standard. In fact, our general plan standard actually calls for um, minimizing driveways on um, SoCal. 
So uh, general plan mobility development policy M3.2.11, improve traffic flow and safety and reduce impacts on arterial streets by limiting driveways, mid block access points and intersections, removing on street parking, clustering facilities and, and so forth. Um, providing access from side streets and other similar measures. So not only do we have a, a policy that speaks against that, um, but also that would require changes to the plan that under various laws and case law that um, the applicant's attorney has cited, we would not be able to um, have, uh, to require a driveway access off of Soquel, for example. I agree with that. Uh, let me ask a question to both of you. Uh, some notion of prescriptive right or the ability to, once the public has been able to use something for years and years without obstruction or objection by the property owner, does the public then get some right to that? So uh, I have um, something in my memory yeah, that, the, that, that there's something in the law about this. There, there is such a thing as a prescriptive right, rights easement, and the prescriptive rights easement is typically occurring over a private property, right? So, you know, someone cuts across a private property for right. years, and it, it eventually becomes a public way, and it eventually, through the courts, it can be settled <laughs> that there's a prescriptive rights access easement. This is different. This is a public right-of-way, and so... It is uh, public access is allowed through the public right of way. And we don't have an objective standard that says um, driveways should be on Soquel. In fact, it's the contrary. So, you know, unless the developer was willing to have a driveway access off of Soquel, the, both the general plan and case law would preclude us from requiring an access on Soquel. Okay. So make sure I, uh, I'm going to ask. And I would defer to your city attorney, but prescriptive rights cannot be achieved against a public agency. So I completely yeah. agree with, with Lee. Okay. That's I'm correct. Get nods all around on that. So if we wanted to, quote, protect public use of the alley, do we have legal ability to do that or not do that? Public use of the alley yeah, and limit public use of the alley? This I, says protect public right. use of the alley. Um, so I'm going to say uh, the alleyway has public access and we can't say who has public access to the alley it it the, the okay, different so it need protection insofar right. as it's a public it's public you know, right. okay fine so in effect that's not necessary it seems because there is no effort here to restrict public access across this alleyway it, that's correct. What I was hear from you I was going response. from I was going from the appellant's presentation where they were trying to yeah. basically not I think their words were um, don't use the alley as a driveway. Got and it. and so that's why I was saying, you know, moving of the driveway to mm -hmm. Soquel is uh, is not something that we can require. Thank you. 3C implement safety mirrors light sensors as recommended. Yes, that is something the uh, the um, applicants have also agreed to that in conversations. If they hadn't agreed to it, could we have required it? We don't have any objective standards related to that, um, and so you know that there 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 could be a position where if, if a developer took a hard line, we we might be in a challenging place. Um, you know, the developer has been very flexible in, in wanting to work with us on these types of issues. Agree. Thank you very much. Uh, let's go to uh, to item four, which is this a one-page letter and only item four has A, that's it. Is that right? Okay, I just want to make sure I didn't miss a second page. Thank you. Fix the corner alignments, item A. Um, so that is the uh, move back and reduce the sidewalk width. Um, that's something that um, I responded to with respect to Councilmember Calentari Johnson's question, and no, we do not have the ability to do that. Yeah. No objective standards. Uh, and uh, we don't have the ability to do that, but if the developer was agreeable to that, then we could incorporate that because they agreed to it, but we couldn't oppose it over their objection. That's correct, and they have agreed to that portion, that small amount, but not to additional amounts. Thank you very much. I appreciate both of you, Thank you. helping us through that.
this is the opportunity for the public to provide us with any comment for a period of time up to three minutes each. So I'll start with the first person in line. And let me ask Ms. Bush, do we have, uh, do we have folks online? We do. So what we'll do is we'll start with you, sir, and then we'll toggle back and forth between folks in chambers and folks who are online. Good afternoon, sir. Afternoon. <laughs> Thank you. I'm just going to read this statement as prepared. I know a lot of things have been said already that cover it. SoCal Avenue is severely impacted by traffic already. I live on Forest Avenue. I've been a bicycle commuter for, to downtown area for 20 years. Not only this project, combined with the two-story townhomes proposed on Hageman, but all the constellation of new and upcoming construction projects that you saw illustrated, west of here, sends more and more traffic through the SoCal bottleneck at Trevithan. We're not the traffic experts, but they haven't been brought up in, in up front. Where is the updated traffic study? Here's what's obvious to me. The tra Trevithan Hageman misalignment at that intersection is not being fully addressed. Only half measures. There's only time, this is, there is no other time to fix this. When traffic is not backed up at SoCal, cars are clocked at near freeway speeds. Two types of bad, gridlock and speeding. Lose, lose. Extra wide sidewalks and more benef trees benefit no one. In practice, they invite the unhoused to camp out, forcing pedestrians to walk into the bike lane to get around them. Instead, dedicated bike lanes with barriers and standard sidewalks would increase safety and narrow car lanes to slow down speeding cars. The alley behind the development is critical mixed use for the whole neighborhood. If the developer would go further to redesign both the building entrance and the exit parallel to the alley, we're dispensing with this enter on Soquel idea. Nobody wants that. It keeps coming up as a red herring over and over again. Uh, if they widen that apron to accommodate both entrance and exit without impacting the, the through flow of traffic in the alleyway, that would be a big improvement. And it seems within your power to do that. We saw a 20 foot wide apron, it could be a 30 foot wide apron. Uh, but th so they've only gone halfway. And it, it's good that they took the measure. They took one lane out of, out of the conflict with the alleyway, but they could take both. And Ent entrance and exit could be parallel to the alley without encroaching on it at all. Keep in mind, there's still those parking spaces. So they, People or for the exterior parking, they're still using the alleyway, but for the tenants of the building, you've taken them out of the collide path. It's a very sensible uh, addition. But to fix both the intersection misalignment and the alley, further easement and driveways on the, on the parcel may need to be carved out of the building footprint. This might impact the precious retail space. Which do we need more? Retail space, tenant space, or traffic flow and safety for the impacted neighborhood. The entire neighborhood living in these horseshoe streets has only Soquel Avenue and this alley as our evacuation path in an emergency. Where's the evacuation plan after the double density of housing on this exact traffic pain point? The problems are obvious. The traffic studies to address the intersection misalignment and the evacuation plan are minimal due diligence. Where are they? Thank you, sir. We're going to take someone online, then we'll be with you in just a moment. Uh, person online, good afternoon. Yes, uh, good afternoon. Uh, this is Rafa Sonnenfeld calling in on behalf of Santa Cruz EMB in support of the project and uh, respectfully requesting that the council deny the appeal this afternoon. Um, I, I do appreciate that uh, you know the community has uh, really uh, come together to um, advocate for um, improving uh, bike bike pathways on on SoCal, and I think um, uh, many of us who who care about this topic would appreciate uh, the continued involvement of, of the community to to um, to help see see that planning process and 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 those improvements come to fruition over the next few years um, by attending. Uh, uh, transportation commission meetings and and other other uh, community events that that the planning department plans um, 
I, I think this particular project uh, and the discussion that we've heard this afternoon is uh, sort of a, a good example of, of why it's generally a bad idea to um, uh, to do project by project planning and um, and why we have general plans and uh, you know general plans are important and and we've heard about you know concern about uh, uh, traffic flow and uh, and that we have a circulation element in our general plan that that um, expresses uh, policy goals that uh, will hopefully help us improve those uh, the traffic in in our community um, but we can't uh, require developers under the law in California to uh, uh, make changes to projects that they don't where those standards aren't knowable ahead of time and uh, you know this project meets all of the standards that the, the city has imposed on on it uh, it it's compliant with our general plan and our zoning uh, including the density bonus units and um, so uh, we legally have a responsibility to appro approve this project, but it's also it's a good project anyway. It provides 84 homes, including I believe 14 homes for families who are low or very low income. Um, it's right on major bus lines. Uh, we generally agree in our community that these are the types of places that we want to be growing in. So um, if that's the case, we need to move forward and approve projects like these and uh, uh, save the uh, concerns about traffic for uh, long-term planning. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Candace Brown, and I am a resident since 85 as a renter and a homeowner of East Morrissey, and I'm also on the Transportation Public Works Commission, and I am so unnerved right now. And we have a situation where we know there's direct health and safety concerns and we seem hampered as a city in the general plan with objective standards to address it when the project was originally developed and approved in 2016 um, it was with 32 units and at that point they were asked to have an easement so the developer here would have known about that if it's part of the disclosure when they purchased the property from the other developer peter doors in san francisco uh, when it was then increased from 32 units to 84 units. The developer gave notice at the community meeting that um, there would be at least three people, well, three people in each unit. And then, so you multiply that by the number of people, and obviously there's not enough parking spaces, so they're invited then to use alternative transportation, which is why we're really having this discussion. And we, we talk about transit-oriented development and yet we seem hampered to do anything to make it viable in our community. Uh, we talk about Vision Zero, which was approved in 2019, and yet the staff here is saying we have the active transportation plan we're about to approve, with no mention about the one thing that they can do, which is to implement Vision Zero, which is to address the speeds on the main transportation corridor. We know somebody that was killed there, um, the gentleman who was 11 children. Uh, we know, I remember a time when somebody walked out of, got off the bus and got hit, an older lady, and she got killed. We know many people that have been bumped and hit, helicoptered out from our community, from my neighborhood, which sadly they're not here today because we're in the middle of the day. So we have to have some way as a city to protect our community when it comes to health and safety. There's a lot of words being spoken today. I am not a lawyer. Um, I am an individual and I'm an accountant, formerly in high tech. So I'm not completely armed with all the tools right now to advise you, but I can say that there are serious health and safety concerns at this intersection. I want to mention in the 38 seconds that I have, I live on Trevithan, so I'm on the other side. Um, and as I mentioned, I've been there a long time. If you make a left there, because people are cutting through from Morrissey to avoid Morrissey and Frederick, which is a disaster, um, and they cut through, they're making left there. They're on the right of the people trying to go straight and the people straight have the right of way, but they're to the left and so that's where all the collisions happen. Also because the crosswalk, and I thought Renee had a great idea, maybe you should just eliminate that crosswalk. You should not invite people to do something unsafe. And that's exactly what you're doing. 
So I really think you need some kind of study. I don't know what you want to call it. And I also wanted to mention that there were conditions on the original plan that included the applicant will work with public works to develop and install pedestrian and bicycles have priority signage in the alley. The applicant will design and install up to two speed pillows in the alley south of the project that will address fire and bicycle access, so the concern about fire that can be addressed with a proper speed bump and surface drainage. They will work with the immediate neighborhood on need and location. And the public works will install in warning enough, signs at the intersection me, of Soquel and Hageman. to wrap it up now. Thank you. So I'm just saying these conditions were in the original 2016, and they weren't even Thank talked you. about, and they weren't included in the conditions. And these address Correct. some of the concerns. And I was one of the people that paid Excuse for the uh, appeal. Well, you've gone way over. So yes. when I ask you, when I give you extra time. Thank you very much. Use the extra time. Don't abuse that. Thank you. Next person. <laughs> You're the next person. Well, nice to see you all again. Uh, I am, in fact, the homeowner of the only home that has an easement. I approach my garage, as this gentleman mentioned earlier today, via this, this alley. Okay, that's how I access my garage. And then the house has been there since 1923, when it was separated from the Hageman family farm. That's the last time that title deed transferred. So. These systems, have, this has all been there a really long time. All those incense cedars, those have all been there since the Hegeman track, since the Arana family owned the whole Finca, right? So now you're saying that's, that's public property, except we haven't had public works out there to fix it in about five years. The gentleman with the dreadlocks and I patched that hole a couple years ago. So. You know, and also I would point out that my side of that alley does not have a crack in its asphalt. It's your, it's, it's the commercial that has this disastrous, but then you had the illegal red tagged illegal garage with the illegal lift in there, right? And they tore all, they, they were putting illegal four by four lifts in there for a while until you red tagged them. But it's not like you guys are caring for this thing. But you know, you're going to give it away. I care for it. I bought it. I lived there. I was born in the beach flats in 1969. You want to talk local. So I don't see you doing your job. What I see is you giving these people with this $300 an hour lawyer, scared, pet scared, you're going to actually hold them to keeping our community livable. And, and guys, we forgot about forest. The Taqueria, you cannot see Soquel from the Taqueria, guys. You need a traffic study because all half of those people are going to come down forest. And guess what? In the time that I've owned that house, I have seen four or five totaled out cars from people trying to get onto SoCal from forest, which didn't even come up today, which means you guys are not on your game. Thank you for your time. Person online, good afternoon. Person online. Three, two, Hi, one. good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good Can afternoon. You hear me? Hi, my name is George Mead, and I've lived on Hageman Avenue since 1990. Um, I just would like you to know that this development, as designed, is essentially putting a round peg in a square hole. The intersection of Trevithan and Soquel and Hageman is look very wonky and unique and having all of the access to this development via an alley is unprecedented in my mind in the city of Santa Cruz. If anybody can give me an example of a multi-unit development accessed solely via an alley, please speak up because this is just something that I am completely unfamiliar with. Having the alley widened behind the subject proposed building is a step in the right direction, but as they say, a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. So the section of the alley that goes from the corner, southeast corner of the proposed development to forest is only 15 feet wide. That can only accommodate one-way traffic. That is going to create big problems when people are trying to enter 
or exit via forest and they encounter another vehicle. Traffic is going to back up onto forest or in the alley. There's a history of accidents at this intersection already. And I'll tell you that if you um, accept this proposal as planned, you're going to have blood on your hands because there will be accidents, unfortunately. Something needs to be done to re-engineer the traffic access. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Gabriella Jones. I was born in the Santa Cruz Mountains, and I've lived in the city of Santa Cruz um, since 1988, consistently the last 12 years as a renter at 225 Forest Avenue. So I am on Forest Avenue. I can speak to that particular issue of the danger of living on Forest Avenue and trying to access getting onto Soquel. I live just down from Soquel Avenue. The proposed development developments and the alley that connects Forest and Hagen. I've raised small children at Forest Avenue and now have teenagers at home, 18 and 13. We have two cars in our family, and we have two members of our family that um, commute on bikes, a high schooler and a working adult. Um, I support development, affordable housing, and increased rentals in Santa Cruz. I'm a renter myself who would definitely benefit from affordable housing. Um, I have secure housing at the moment. However, I feel strongly that there must be a commitment to sustainability, specifically making our streets and neighborhoods more bike and walking friendly, as I transition more to walking and biking and my whole family does. We have an opportunity as a city to commit to these ideals. The alley that connects Forest and Hageman is a wonderful bike, pedestrian, and wheelchair-friendly connector between the two streets. We have someone on Forest Avenue who's wheelchair-bound and who does use that alley as a way to get across and over to Walgreens and in, into other places as well. It's also another way off of Forest um, in an emergency to get onto Soquel Avenue. I ask that you protect and keep the alleyway open as a safe route for all members of the community. And we really do rely on it for all of these important reasons. Soquel Avenue, especially near our intersection, can be a very challenging street to navigate, especially where Forest meets Soquel. There is no regulated traffic street light allowing for a safe left turn. Onto Soquel off of Forest, cars often speed on Soquel at that intersection, as, as Rena uh, pointed out earlier, and during commute hours, it's a heavily congested and very slow route through Santa Cruz. It's an impossible left turn off of Forest during those times, and it can be very dangerous. My teen driver was one of the drivers who made a calculated but uh, unfortunately bad decision to make a left onto Soquel off of Forest and was almost killed by a speeding driver on Soquel Avenue. Our car was totaled. Um, you know, we counseled him on making good decisions as a driver, but because that left turn is available to make and because of the angle of Soquel and the visibility issues and the fact that people speed, it's an incredibly dangerous intersection. Since that event, none of us have made that left turn onto Forest Avenue. And we go all the way around through the neighborhood, down the horseshoe of on to Hegemon to make that light at that corner. Um, unfortunately, though, I'm sensitive to that we're increasing traffic on in that na part of the neighborhood as well. Um, it looks like my time's up. <laughs> um, I would just say one last thing that adding this large number of vehicles is going to make this whole, as you've seen, congested traffic area, very difficult for all of us. Please consider the best outcomes for walkers, bikers, and other people that need access. Thank you very much. We have anyone else online? We'll take that person, then we'll see you. Let's take the person online. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Council. This is Ryan Meckel. Um, I'm calling in support of this project and urge you to deny the appeal. Uh, I just want to comment on some of the transportation aspects of this. Um, this project is going to be in a great position for residents to take buses, bike, or walk to where they need to go. Uh, Soquel is, in, is envisioned as a protected and very important bike lane in the active transportation plan, as Mr. Starkey mentioned earlier, and I think staff is going to do great work to address safety concerns on this corridor. I would urge you to leave staff the greatest amount of room to plan that improvement and not confine it or constrain it to this, this single project. I don't think piecemeal planning out our bike lanes and safety improvements is the best way 
to make a corridor, and that's what SoCal Avenue is, it's a corridor that supports safe, sustainable transportation. Additionally, SoCal Avenue is going to receive 15-minute headway service from Metro beginning in 2024 with the reimagined Metro, Metro process, which will be which will provide residents convenient and easy access between downtown Santa Cruz and the Capitola Mall. Additionally, uh, there's a B-cycle station within walking distance of this project. The residents have many different resources to get around town besides driving, and I think they'll take advantage of them. Staff, both the county level with Metro and in the city have done a great job of encouraging active transportation and encouraging uh, mass transit ridership, and I think they'll continue to do so. So I urge you to keep these thoughts in mind while you uh, deny this appeal and say yes to homes at this project. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Hello. Uh, Andrea, who lives on Forest, was here for a few hours and had to leave, so she asked me to read her message. The first reason that this project should not be built is its location. Water Street and Broadway funnel into Soquel and create a natural bottleneck. Adding a development of this size to this intersection will add to gridlock, pollution, and dangerous conditions for bicyclists and pedestrians as trap drivers lose patience and engage in riskier driving behaviors. And commute times and conditions are going east, that are going east will increase. I hope that any traffic studies are done during peak commute times. The second reason is that this is a market rate project that our city workers will not be able to afford. If we want to provide housing for our local workers, housing needs to be affordable. This project does nothing besides destroying a lovely neighborhood and creating huge profits for a few investors. Please imagine that you're voting for a project like this in your own neighborhood or allow the citizens of Santa Cruz to vote on this project. Either way, this poorly conceived, grid-like worsening project should not go forward. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else online, Ms. Bush? We'll take that person, then we'll be right with you. Person online, good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, Council. Uh, Bradley Snyder. Uh, just uh, want to mention um, that um, I, I feel that um, a lot of the uh, comments about um, the, the increase in the, uh, the traffic pressure and how it's already uh, in, in such a state of like high intensity, high um, fast forward uh, kind of motion. Uh, I, feel, I feel like uh, the council really should consider uh, uh, certain changes they make, just like uh, uh, the Scotts Valley Metro or the building you're in, there's a plaque where it's, you know, engraved the names of the people who established it. Uh, these, these decisions are going to be uh, a monument to you. It's gonna, they're gonna be, there's like city planning where people uh, feel menaced uh, by traffic conditions. Uh, it's, it's, you know, in history, it's gonna, they're gonna look back at who made the decision to make it that way. Now, I'm a person who's walked in Santa Cruz. I've lived at, on Darwin Street. Uh, I've uh, worked at the Safeway at the corner of Morrissey and SoCal. Uh, I, I, I grew up in, in SoCal Village and, and would walk all the way to Santa Cruz on SoCal. I'm, I'm really familiar with that intersection, here's a, a suggestion that I think you're going to find highly lateral. But uh, to me, the two circular intersections you installed uh, near the beach, um, you know, it seems like that could almost work at Morrissey and SoCal and Water. Um, that whole intersection, if it were made to smoothly flow in a circle, maybe would slow people down. A great uh, improvement over uh, in Capitola on Clare Street, if you get over there, are these beautiful speed tables, which just make people look stupid when they go too fast. And people don't like to look stupid, <laughs> it turns out. It's um, just psychology. Um, but uh, as far as, um, as, far as uh, you know, tightening uh, the screws uh, and with the way people drive and the way people um, are, you know, uh, process in the community, I've seen horrific head-on or, or totaled vehicles along there. I'm appalled by it and how increasingly uh, likely it is to occur as you walk along in these areas. So, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a person, I go to the East Bay, I have panic attacks just trying to get from point A to B, you know, uh, between, you know, um, Martinez and Concord. But, um, you know, I don't think Santa Cruz is uh, 
gentrifying by keeping itself safe by designing things well. That's how I feel about the situation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Quentin Rowland, and uh, I am a resident of Santa Cruz, and I have family who live within a half mile of the project area. I'm in favor of a traffic safety study, regardless of whether it's required of you know, the development project or not. I think it's the right thing for the city to do um, sooner than later. Why? Because we're inviting 200, roughly 200 new residents, maybe more, into this space that all these people have been describing for you. It's, uh, we experience routine, meaning every hour, 45 to 60 mile per hour speeds, go out and measure them yourself. Now, I've done my homework and uh, I've walked all sides of that intersection, SoCal Hageman, Trevathan, in the dark and with sun in my eyes. I've observed the most common movements by all participants. I've stood in the bikeway while traffic roared by at 45, 55 miles per hour, only protected by a white stripe. I've observed texting drivers zooming through the intersection with sun in their eyes. I've witnessed numerous red light runners and many more drivers accelerating toward the intersection to beat the light, accelerating towards the intersection. High school kids cycling to school in substandard bikeway widths, partially obstructed by debris and pooling water and rising seams in the middle of the bikeway. Seniors walking their dogs across a vast distance of uninterrupted asphalt, ultimately sprinting in fear to the curb. Bus riders hurrying across the street mid-block hoping to catch a bus. Joggers listening to music while crossing against the light, thinking the cars are distant enough. Parents en route to Arana Gulch Park, nervously pushing baby strollers only inches from impatient bumpers. No crossing islands to provide physical protection, horizontal deflection, and visual friction. This is the cornerstone, by the way, of a Vision Zero city, is crossing islands. Crosswalks located too close to the intersection, creating complex conditions and blind spots for all participants. Primitive, unsafe, diagonal ADA ramps. Drivers weaving from lane to lane at lethal speeds due in part to chaotic speed differentials. Drivers waiting to turn at the traffic light despite no oncoming traffic, waiting for nothing. Drivers waiting much too long for a sufficiently large gap to enter the SoCal Avenue stream because the speeds are too high, requiring much larger gap space and time for that maneuver. Delay, stress, delay, stress for all participants. Let's all problem solve together. Let's do a traffic safety together, uh, study together. Let's get everyone who has skin in the game looking face to face, eye to eye, at the intersection, let's all walk it together many times. Let's experience what all these people have experienced. Thank you. Uh, I'll wrap it up. Yep. Let's do it together as a team. And I know we'll end up with the best result possible. Thank you. Thank you for being here, sir. Ms. Bush, do we have anyone else online? Good afternoon. <laughs> See, I told you you'd get to talk. Here you are. I wasn't worried about that. Thank you. Um, first of all, I want to thank you all for your patience. I know it's been a long day, and you've heard a lot of different things. I do appreciate that, you know, it's hard to um, keep one's attention going for all this time. I, I want to thank you all for that. Um, I do want to, um, I don't know what the process is exactly to submit a letter, but I do want to submit a letter. You can submit that to the clerk, and that will become part of our record. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll do my best to keep my comments very brief and try not to repeat all the things that have already been said. Um, my two primary points are that um, I understand that the City Council is limited in your abilities. I, I understand that. I understand that there are state laws that you are obviously uh, supersede your abilities. Um, and I also appreciate from what I've uh, studied and understood from previous people that you have some discretion. 
um, a little bit of wiggle room here and there. So that is really what we're asking for, is for you to do your very best to hear, because obviously there's a tremendous amount of concern. The main point I want to bring up, um, two main points. One is that, as I said earlier, there is another project at 162 Hageman Avenue, um, which is being considered very close on the heels of this one, and that involves seven townhomes with attached ADUs. There are three bedroom, two bath homes, again, with attached ADUs. So that poses an increased tremendous impact of a number of people. Again, we don't know exactly how many people are gonna end up living in those spaces, but we all know from having lived in Santa Cruz for a long time, what our you know, current rental and, and uh, you know, rates are. So we can easily predict lots of people will be living there as well, again, in increasing the traffic issue there on our um, intersection and on our street. Um, so I, I really feel very strongly that these two projects need to be considered in tandem with each other. I realize that's not the responsibility of the developers, but I think it is the responsibility of the city council because you're responsible for our whole city and the quality of our lives and our streets and our safety, which keeps being brought up over and over again. Um, I think it's, uh, I, again, I've lived there for many years. I've raised two children. I bike all the time. SoCal, despite what everybody else may have said about uh, the safety of SoCal as a bike corridor, it is nef never a safe baking, uh, biking area. Um, I'm always worried for my own safety and for my children's safety. It's, as, as people have said, you know, people drive very fast. There's nothing to block you. I appreciate that hopefully that's coming down the pike. I, I hope that that's the case, that there's some kind of significant barrier put, um, as has been put on Water Street, which is at least a little bit of a help. You know, the little, little things that separate the bike lane from the road um, in a few spaces on Water Street. So I just really ask that you consider those two projects together. Um, and uh, that's it. Thank you very much for your time. Well, thank appreciate you it. very much. We Somebody have. called in, no doubt. Okay, we have one more person online. Good afternoon, person online. Hello there, can you hear me? Hi. Yes, we can. Wonderful. Um, my name is Alex Noisy, and I'm one of the neighbors who lives on Hageman Avenue. I've lived here for eight years, and I love my neighbors. I think we have a wonderful community here on Hageman Avenue, and I'm glad that everyone is so involved in the processes that change and shape our neighborhood. I have read the appeal and its main points, and I believe that the plan sufficiently addresses most of the primary concerns about the intersection misalignment, the turn lanes, the alley, the sidewalks, the ADA ramps, and others. I know that early on there was some discussion, and in fact today, about moving the entrance to this project uh, to SoCal directly, but living in this neighborhood, I know as well as all my neighbors that the best and safest way to exit the neighborhood is by using the light at Hageman. So I would caution against making a change like that. And in fact, it sounds like that's something that can't be made. Uh, so that, so I think that's good. Uh, but in short, I believe that the plan as it is will be a boon to our neighborhood. And I do not share the concerns that are laid out in the appeal as written. My primary reason for attending this hearing today is simply to underscore that our city is woefully in need of more housing. And I couldn't think of a better neighborhood to welcome new neighbors into. So hopefully we can all make this work out. Thank you so much for the work you do and for considering the community's varied points of view. Thank you. Good afternoon. Hello. Um, my name is Francie. I live on Hageman. And um, my main concern again is getting the transportation study move forward and to and underlying that improving the safety of SoCal for all the upcoming projects um, and just in general even if there was zero projects it's our main corridor it should be our pride and joy it sh um, the city should have a lot of focus on since it's such a main corridor and so many people use it. Um, and many, there's been many fine suggestions and I agree with them, um, especially the, isle, the pedestrian islands, um, slowing down traffic, enforcement on, tra on that area has been zero. I've lived there for 40 years, I've never seen a single officer enforcing 
any speed on that portion of SoCal. Um, also, as far as alignment on SoCal, um, the 2016 projects, which was approved for that corner by the Planning Commission but did not move forward, the, um, the people who were developing it voluntarily ceded much more than um, the present developers to the corner to align the area. This was not something they had to do. It was something they did voluntarily to make it safer for their occupants. Um, also, right now, I'm very concerned that the front of the building where the main lobby is, is um, there is, where the main lobby is, there is no stopping of any vehicle in front there. Uh, there is just a very narrow lane. Nobody ever stops there. Um, so if uh, somebody wanted to take an Uber, they could not stop there. They would have to go down to the alley or down SoCal or down Forest and then walk around to the front door. Um, so I, I, it puzzles me why the lobby would be there when there's no vehicle access to the front door. Um, and... Uh, the developers has put a loading zone in the back of the building in the alley, which is an improvement over having no lo loading zone. Um, and they made a place where UPS can drop off in the garage, which wasn't there before, which I appreciate. Um, the loading zone would not actually, you know, uh, from somebody with who has disabilities, they would have to walk again either through the garage or around the building up to the door to get to the elevators. So they haven't really studied the um, access as far as Americans with disability. Um, and I'm kind of disappointed in that planning didn't pick up on some of these things. And um, so those are some of my concerns that haven't been voiced before. So thank you. Well, thank you very much. Ms. Bush, anyone else online? Nobody with their hand raised. Nobody with their hand up. Anyone? The last call. Very good. The appellant is your opportunity for a rebuttal. I am taller than everybody else. <laughs> okay. I'll just start by thanking all of you for taking time to think about our intersection and take it really seriously. Um, it affects all of us. It affects our city. I want to thank the developers for all of the goodwill and the efforts to respond to our concerns. I really believe that you are in good faith and that we are going to come to the best solutions possible. I want to thank the um, city staff and Public Works for working actively to make this as positive as it can be. We are not against this project. We are very concerned about the impact. I, and I really want to distinguish that. A lot of the people who said, you know, deny the appeal, well, the appeal is not to change the project, to st stop the project. The appeal is to make sure that these traffic considerations are met. Um, and so we really appreciate that it's already come pretty far, and I appreciate Mayor Keeley, your effort to look at our list and see which things can be done, which help me understand which things are under the authority of the city versus which things are under the authority of the developer. And I understand that there's good collaboration, and I have great faith that you will, in fact, do everything that you possibly can to address this corner. And that really is our goal for an outcome, is that it's safe enough for all of us and for the future residents. Um, specifically, um, we really are counting on you, City Council, to help um, Public Works prioritize this intersection. Somebody mentioned that it, there's no projects yet on the docket for this corner. We'd like to see that happen. We'd like to see it get mobilized. We're particularly concerned about the left turn traffic lane off of, actually have a light that goes with that new lane. Um, we really like the prioritized bike lane a lot, even if it's only in front of that development, because of the jog in Soquel Avenue, so that the drivers know that that's, the street is changing and the bike is prioritized on that corner. If it means a slightly narrower sidewalk, I'm really hopeful that that can be negotiated. Um, we're really in favor of the 30-foot wide driveway cut, cut out, so that the 
driveway in and out of the garage is adjacent to the alley rather than taking up the alley. We think that that's a really good solution so that cars can pass going in and out of that garage without affecting the pedestrian and bike and wheelchair users as well as other vehicles that also use that alley. And we think that that's doable. It doesn't ask them to change what it just means you guys accepting that that's a wider curb cut than usual. And we do acknowledge we'd lose some parking there. And of course, that's a challenge too. But we understand that that safety is more important in this instance. Um, I think those are the main ones that I just feel like we've taken our time. We've done a lot of our homework. We've come to you really in good faith to help us to make sure that this corner is safe. We're, it's in your hands. We look forward to seeing how it all turns out. And we thank all of you guys, because we know that we'll be working with you, living next to you, and getting to know lots of hopefully cool new people on our block. So anyway, thank you. Thank you very much. Matter is back before the council. I will be glad to recognize a member for a motion. Sure. Watkins. I'm happy to move the um, recommendation and I want to just make sure so I'll move the recommendation as stated but I want to make sure because what I heard was that all of the things that we could ask the developer to do has been agreed upon so is that written into the recommendation as presented in the staff report okay I want to separate out you were almost there with a the motion now it's turned into a question so why don't you ask your question then we'll get a motion okay let's do that then yeah, I don't think that this, the, the letter that we went through in the Correct. detail is not in the motion. So I think that needs to be included as part of it. Okay. The details of it, yes. Okay, great. Make your motion. So I'll move the recommendation with the additions that were outlined in um, the questioning around what the developer was willing to accommodate within our legal realm to um, ask for. Would you like me to read those? Let me, let me see if we can get this okay so uh, let me start with with i think we have to deal with the appeal is that correct sir i think we have to deal with the appeal and then as part of dealing with the appeal then we can take actions which would uh, further detail our approval of this project is that correct correct um you could adopt a motion to deny the appeal with the additional of uh, the additional uh, conditions that were oh. discussed and, and okay. acknowledged by the, the applicant as being okay. So let's take this in pieces. Let's go ahead. So your motion is to deny the appeal. Correct. The rest of the motion is to reference the letter of November 28th, 2023, submitted by Neighborhood Recommendations for Traffic Safety Improvements. Correct. And on those, if I understand I will, I can read where we're going, please sure. proceed. Thank you for the clarification. So on those include what is feasible for the developer and what I heard was agreeable is to provide dedicated turn lanes that are long enough at least two to three car lengths and reduce proposed sidewalk walk width on Hagman to accommodate those lanes. That was 1A. Yes, okay. Um, to provide a 2A to provide a wider, safer, protected bike lane on Soquel Avenue in front of the development, heading east where roads jog, reduce proposed sidewalk width on Soquel to accommodate the bike lane. And 3A to allow a 30 foot curb cut at alley for wider two lane garage and exit. And I believe that's. Oh, and, and excuse me, and 3C to implement safety mirrors, light sensors as, recommend, as recommended. No, am I, did I, I want to make sure I captured what I believe was Madam, heard. Madam, 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 hold on a second. Hold on. Okay, Mr. Butler, assist with the motion here. Thank you. Um, and I've got Matt Starkey as well. Uh, sure. So uh, for the alley driveway curb cut, um, the, the letter here says uh, allow the 30 foot. We would recommend 20 feet. We do believe that's a safer configuration. I'll let Matt speak to that if he, if he agrees. Yeah, the, 
the thinking behind that is we want to make sure we keep speeds low on the alley, um, especially with the entryway okay, into the driveway. What we're not going to do is a whole bunch of okay. discussion about this. Get straight to the gentle lady's question. We'd recommend 20 feet for the driveway. Curve. What do you want to do on that? Not sure. I'll, I'll accept your recommendation okay. and your Next opinion item. on that. Next issue. Next that, issue. Was that the only that, one? That, that was it. We just, I wanted to clarify that. The others were um, uh, agreed upon and I, outlined. I haven't heard anything else that's objectionable. I just wanted to. As we walk through. That okay. Out. Thank you. Uh, I would, uh, I would just mention though that the, a 1A here, um, we included this sort of idea in the staff recommendation for, for a motion to have the appellant work with Public Works to develop the length there of the, the turn lane. Um, I don't want to be limited to two to three cars if it needs to be longer, for example. Okay. We've we got to stay in motion world here right now. Um, I, Ms. Bush is trying to get a complicated motion clearly yeah. stated. Ms. Bush, do you have a question? Do you need clarification right now? You know, I just want to make sure um, 3A instead of 30 foot is 20 foot. That's Correct. what you're talking about. 20 foot for 3A. Yeah. Thank you. And then 1A is as outlined in the recommendation based on the staff recommendation. And I don't know if you want to repeat how it's written. I don't have that in front of me. Ryan, do you have that in front of you? If you can just read it, and then you can email it to Bonnie Bush. Can I just ask for one clarification? Um, I interpreted the motion as uh, to adopt the resolution with those additional conditions. That's correct. Thank you. Ms. Bush, make sure you cut that. Yes. Very good. Is that the extent of your motion? Yes, I, I, I don't know if we want to read for clarification on, Mr. Bain. on 3A, or 1A, excuse me. Searching for it, I am here, I have the presentation. But I understand it was the, it was the recommended motion to extend, work with public work staff essentially to extend the length of that left, dedicated left turn lane. Correct. So that's the motion. Everybody on board on that? Everybody clear? Clear, rather? Ms. Bush, we good? So we're not putting I can, I can send it to you. Slow down. Slow down here. We're not putting 1A because it's included in the staff. Correct. Okay. So far, so good. Is that the extent of your motion? We good? We're good. Is there a second? The motion. I will second it, and second I have some Ms. further Brewer. questions on that. And we'll be right back with you. You want to open on your motion? Yeah, no, I just really appreciate everybody coming forward. I think we, um, I also really appreciate the conversations that I believe ensued between the community and the developer. I think we all share a commitment to safety, to traffic concerns. Anybody who lives in Santa Cruz knows SoCal is a really challenging street and that intersection is challenging. I live in the area, I understand your concerns. We have a lot of challenging intersections and streets and I know there's only so much within the realm of this proposal and this development that we can influence and also know it's part of this bigger picture around how are we improving our traffic safety and so I definitely want to make sure that the community knows that we heard that and that is a priority for me and it's a priority I know for our council and our staff um, and I appreciate some of the specifics that we could influence and the agreement um, that the developers and we're willing to to make to make some of those accommodations take place and look forward to hopefully continuing the dialogue to make sure our community is as safe as possible and we're also allowing for more affordable housing. So um, that's it for me. Thank you. Ms. Bruner is recognized. <laughs> thank you. Um, wow, thank you for getting us to this point. And um, I just had a question around the 20 foot, 30 foot and what that, um, what is typical and what difference would that make in the staff, the staff's, um, from the staff's perspective? What data hel helps inform you to recommend 20 feet when 30 feet is being requested? Will it still impact the alley? As stated, was one concern of having the driveway separate from the alley access? Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. So. 
The standard driveway approach for the city of Santa Cruz is between 16 feet and 30 feet. And we typically will use a larger driveway approach when we're talking about higher volume development, so commercial development, where we have a lot more vehicles coming in and out of that particular area. Uh, right now, what was being proposed for this uh, particular development was a 20-foot wide uh, driveway approach, which is very standard for this type of development, the size of the number of cars that we're expecting to come out and in and out of this area. Um, and so that's why we continue to recommend a 20-foot wide driveway approach versus a 30-foot wide approach. Would it hurt to have 30-foot wide? What, what does that impact? The 30-foot wide driveway approach would end up impacting most likely the parking that's out there. There could be a, a bit of an access. I don't recall uh, the exact plan line as, um, as far as the approach into the development. Uh, widening it uh, most likely would just, again, mainly impact, I think, with parking at this point. I'll add that the part of the concern here, as we heard about, is the speeds on the on the alleyway, and we wanted to make sure. Excuse me, excuse me. If you want to be recognized, right? This is not some free for all. You're recognized. Yeah. Uh, we're trying to acknowledge that concern by making sure we keep a really tight driveway entrance, and that's how we know people will cautiously enter and exit the alleyway which is a big concern for the neighborhood. Uh, yes, it could be wider, but our recommendation is to keep it as narrow and as tight as possible so we keep speeds down uh, and we help everyone navigate the area safely. So I have a follow-up question. Um, and in terms of, I think 3C was implemented into the motion. Did you... Three, oh, excuse me, yes, uh-huh. So that relates to safety mirrors, lights, sensors, as recommended, determined whatever the best option would be in this case. Um, what is our ability to um, ask the applicant or, to, or has the applicant agreed um, for anything that would help reduce speed? at the parking, the in and out entrance, um, a speed bump, a stop sign, mirrors to help with greater visibility. Um, yeah, we, um, we recommended that at that, uh, the entryway uh, from the alleyway into the parking entrance of the development, that we add something like you mentioned. Um, we do this at our garages. We put a speed bump right as you enter the garage to kind of stop you before you get in and out. A uh, stop sign is also a good tool there, and then the mirrors could help improve the visibility for people exiting the, um, the development. Is that already incorporated into the recommendation? Or does that need to be spelled out? Uh, not Can yet. that be spelled out? Yes, that could be spelled out. Because I, I think I remember it was mentioned it's not in our objective standards. Yeah, that'd be a good one to detail. So. I'd like to ask the maker of the motion if that can be incorporated into the motion. I'm comfortable with that. To ensure those types of... For Ms. Bush's purposes, let's make sure we know exactly what we're talking about. What is your motion, your, your uh, request for an amendment to the motion? That um, there are devices that help reduce speed at the alleyway, driveway, entrance, exit, um, whatever that looks like in this case, such as a speed. Okay, so that um, the, the applicant shall include devices that reduce speed and conflict at the parking garage entrance, such as a speed bump, a stop sign, um, mirrors, anything that will help with that ingress, egress, um, and provide greater visibility and safety. We can do that? Yeah, we can work Thank with you. the applicant on that. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Further? Agreeable? Uh, Agreeable second? You are the second. Agreeable? Agreeable. Okay. Further on this? Ms. Brunner, further? I just have a couple comments. 
Well, we're on a motion, right so now. we're we're going. Let me see if there are other uh, amendments or substitutes. Anyone? Ms. Brown is recognized. Thank you. Um, I'm not okay. going to try to make an amendment because, but I do want to ask a, a question. Um, I want to revisit, if I could, for a moment, this 30 versus 20 foot um, driveway, and. Uh, I, there's, there's a difference of opinion here, and, um, and I don't have the expertise to, um, you know, weigh uh, the, the um, different, uh, the, you know, the variables. But um, I'm hearing from people who live in this neighborhood who, who make use of this space um, on a regular basis that they believe that would be safer. And so I'm inclined to want to... Um, you know, prioritize that view. Um, you know, the manual that gives the the guidelines is one thing, um, but there is particularity of place, and so I I want I'm trying to understand this, and it feels like that's a really important thing for the neighbors, and if we do have a speed, what rumble strip, whatever it's called, um, some kind of you know other measures. Um, you know, why not uh, go to the 30 foot? Why couldn't we do that? Sir. I think when these, I think we'll kind of think back to the arrow diagram that was presented earlier. Space is one part of the conflict issue, but time is also the other part. And that has to do with the number of vehicles that are entering and exiting a site. And so at this site, uh, we know it generates less than 50 cars per hour. And so that really low volume of vehicles you don't need as much space because you're much less likely to have conflicts between vehicles showing up at the same time. So that combined with the volume, the desire to have low speed, is why I'd recommend a really minimal driveway apron. Um, if we wanted to go 24 feet, that would be fine too, but I don't, I don't think it really needs to be negotiated. If I could follow up, because we talked about this, and it made sense when, when we were discussing it, and, and I've been out there now, and I've, I'm hearing from neighbors, so I just really want to make sure that we address that and have the information. Um, the, yes, cars, right? And we don't know that it's going to be 50 trips. That is a projection based on models. So we don't know that. We think that, and, you know, I'm willing to go along with the projections, uh, but we, there are also, I mean, there are tons of people who use that alleyway um, on bicycles and on foot. And so I, I think that that does make a difference. And so again, I'm, I'm, I'm trying, I, I can't see people being able to, to move in that space um, without additional width if there are cars coming in and out um, and, you know, the in increased traffic of moving, you know, not all times of day, um, every day, but certainly it, there will be, I think, safety issues there. And so having that space means people can like get out of the way if a car is pulling in or pulling out. Um, I'm not sure 10 feet is gonna increase the speed so much it makes it dangerous as the, um, you know, h how people move in that space in reality. So uh, again. Brown, let me, uh, let me try to get this <laughs> through it. Do we have the discretion if we wanted to to make it 24 feet or 30 feet if we chose to do it? Yes. That's all I'm really interested in here. Whether you agree with it or disagree with it is not my interest. Do you want to add? A, do you want to add that or not? I, I would ask uh, the uh, maker agreeable. of the motion to move to 30 feet. Uh, okay. Is there any objection? If we can do it, we can do it. If we can't, we can't. I'm wondering if we want to think about the 24 feet no, just it, to be kind of able to split it. Make in the a middle. decision. What do you want? 24. Or I'm going to go with the 24 just because 24. I don't want to ignore the expert opinions around okay, what fine. could potentially That's, that's the anything. request. Is that agreeable to maker of the motion? Yes or no? It's a simple question. Yeah, I'm hearing that, you know, this. This is a perceived safety, and um, I yeah, think... I'll accept that as a yes. You've accepted that amendment at 24 feet. Am I right? I'm just wondering why 24. If we can just clarify where that number came from. It... I'm, so I mean, 20 comes from two 10-foot lanes, which is a very minimal lane width. Uh, 12 foot is kind of like a maximum lane you would use for two lanes of traffic, so 24. So 30 is, is much too big. Yeah. Thank you. You go. So 24. 24. Yes. 24. Everybody's good at 24. Sold at 24. All right. 
Let me see if there are other motions to amend or substitute motions. Ms. Kalantari Johnson, thank you for your forbearance. Thank you. Um, I have two friendly amendments that I will just read um, from what I've written and then see if the maker of the motion and the seconder would accept that. One is to direct um, city manager, director of public works to return to city council in 2024 with an updated objective standards for separated bike lanes along SoCal from at least Morrissey to Capitola Road so that additional land dedication can be required of future projects when needed to achieve the desired long-term bike lane space and alignment. And I sent this to Bonnie Bush, so she has it. Thank you. The second. The is sec that, that's your first talk, offer? That's is my it? first friendly amendment. Okay. Let me see if, and Ms. Bush, you do have that. All right. And maker of the motion, agreeable to you. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. Excuse me. <laughs> it's okay. Agreeable to you. I'm fine with that unless there's Okay. Ms. Kalantari Johnson, second item. Great. The second is to um, direct the city manager, director of public works to further explore the proposed traffic safety recommendations, which are items 1B through D in the, in the neighbor's recommendation that was passed out as part of the active transportation update. Sorry, could you repeat that? I didn't catch it all. And sure. let me also ask it's Ms. Bush, do you have that? Good. We're going to put that up in just a moment here. Would you like me to read it or? I think we're good, Ms. Contar Johnson. Ms. Bush is simply getting it ready for us to review. Great. Ms. Contar Johnson, now that's up on the screen. Let me see if this is what you want it to be. <clears throat> this is, and um, when the time is appropriate, I can speak to it. Okay. Let me see if that friendly amendment is agreeable to the maker of the motion. It is to the second of the motion. I have a question. Is this separate from the appeal? It, to me, it seems like that was part of like the next step. Yeah. Mr. Butler? Yeah. That's a great question, Councilmember Berner. I would recommend that that be separate direction and not included as conditions of approval because that's direction to the city. And so um, I, I think as long as you're clear about that, then if that satisfies the clerk, we'll keep it out of the conditions. If I could help. Uh, this, these two well. items would not be conditions of approval. They would be separate direction that's recorded um, in the minutes. Agreeable, and if, understood, and agreed. Understood I could just follow agreed. up on that briefly. Say it again. So the sir. motion would be to adopt the resolution as amended and give this direction to the staff. Thank you for. Slow down here, Ms. Bush. I want to make sure you're okay. We're good. All right, further, further amendments, further debate or discussion. Clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Newsom. Aye. Brown. No. Watkins. Aye. Brunner. Aye. Kalantari Johnson. Aye. Vice Mayor Golder. Aye. And Mayor Cooley. Aye. Motion passes and so ordered. Thank you all for your forbearance. Thank you for being here and providing your input. Council members, uh, we were, uh, let's see, going to be finished with that item at 3.20. We did. We finished it at uh, 3.20 a.m. Uh, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to take a break until, uh, let's take a break until 10 after 5. We'll come back in about 17 minutes or so, and we will uh, continue. Stand in recess. Thank you. Thank you. Ten after.
Good evening. The Santa Cruz City Council, following a brief late afternoon, early evening recess, uh, resumes its work on our regular agenda. We are on item number 22. This is a 10-year citywide long-range financial plan. And uh, good evening, and thank you for your forbearance. Uh, we are uh, taking a little more time than we usually do on items today, but that's what happens at the end of the calendar year. Lots of stuff gets compressed into one meeting. Ms. Cabell, thank you for your very good work and your staff's good work, and we recognize you for her presentation. Thank you. Um, so yes, Elizabeth Cabell, I'm the finance director, and we are constantly in finance and probably throughout the city, you know, in a state of financial forecasting and planning. So about a year ago, we enlisted the help of Baker Tilly to help us create a citywide long-range financial plan. And tonight, um, we're here to present sort of the results of that. Um, we have had lots of travel issues. We were going to have um, representatives from Baker Tilly here in person. Lots of um, issues in the Northwest. And so, um, just landed in his at, at the airport. I think he's at the hotel now. But we had a backup who had his power go out and is now stationed in a library and ready to go. So. Everything has been working, but um, so in a way, it's kind of good we had this delay, so now everybody is um, ready to go. But I do want to introduce Bob Leland. He's going to be doing the presentation today, and Steve Toller from Baker Tilly is also online and will be available to answer questions and um, assist with the presentation as well. And then I also have staff from finance here, so as we go through it, if there are any questions, please. Let us know. Thank you. Ms. Cabell, who will we hear from first? Bob Leland from Baker Tilly. Mr. Leland, good evening. Thank you for being with us. Good evening, and thank you for having me here. So let me get right into the presentation because I know you are short on time. Okay, uh, you have the full version uh, before you that you've had a chance to, to look through. So given the time constraints, I'll be giving you a highly abridged version of that, uh, about 12 slides. The bottom line here is that the city has a structural deficit of about $10.5 million. The baseline forecast assumes that homelessness response spending remains at about $8 million uh, with the general fund replacing lost state and federal funding uh, starting in fiscal 25. So without corrective action, as you can see, in fiscal 25, you are below the city's reserve goal of two months of operating expense or 16.7%, and will continue to drop, and it would, without corrective action, be negative by fiscal 27. So we will come back to this issue of the 10.5 million. But I want first to uh, just highlight some of the key assumptions, because with any forecast, it's all about the assumptions. Uh, you get different assumptions, you'll have a different forecast. Uh, we think that these assumptions are realistic, and particularly on the revenue side, we have recessions built in every seven years. Not because we have a crystal ball, but because we want to test the sensitivity of city finances, uh, kind of give it a stress test. And so we're assuming uh, a moderate recession in fiscal 25 and then every seven years thereafter. Some of the other key elements of revenue are, are uh, property tax, estimates and they are based on the, the various components under prop 13 of uh, two percent growth for parcels that don't change ownership uh, about four percent of the parcels we think will change ownership they'll go up about 40 percent and then we have 80 new units per year and 25 million dollars of new non-residential growth each year and just for comparison the uh, 80 units uh, compares to 76, which has been the average since 2008. Sales tax growth, uh, based on your consultant's uh, uh, projections, is about 2.9%. Uh, the TOT estimates do include the two prospective new hotels, La Bahia in fiscal 25 and the Cruise Hotel in fiscal 28, both of which are expected to generate about $1.4 million in TOT. So that $10.5 million shortfall is even with the two new hotels. Uh, the goal is to try to meet the reserve goal of 16.7%. Over on the expenditure side, we're assuming existing service and staffing levels. Uh, 
There are unfunded capital needs and there are new initiatives such as climate action that are not included. There is a placeholder assumption of two and a half percent for cost of living adjustments. Uh, that obviously is subject to meet and confer, but with everything else in the forecast being inflated, we have to build in some assumption of inflation for labor as well. Uh, the two and a half percent was selected because it's the 30 year historical average uh, for uh, the Bay Area CPI uh, up until uh, 2022. Plus it includes merit increases and savings from employee turnover. There is an annual contribution of $5 million. Uh, that is not enough to meet all of the identified capital needs, but we have that built in. There is the general fund backfill of five and a half million due to the lost ARPA and CA-14 homeless response funding. And if you see that five million and the five and a half million, add them together, that's your 10 and a half million that you're short. Uh, then we also assumed continued uh, support by the general fund at the Economic Development Trust, the Technology Fund, Children's Fund, and WARF Fund. Now, given this shortfall, uh, we took a hard look at a range of budget strategies that could be employed to close the gap. And there are basically four categories. As you see down below, there are three sets of strategies that would maintain current service levels, and that would be what you would go to first. Uh, expenditure controls and cost shifts, uh, service delivery alternatives that save money, and finally, revenue enhancements. As a last resort, you would have service level reductions. Now, of the categories that we identified, uh, whoops, we have uh, about three times the amount that you need, uh, the 10 and a half million is needed to balance the budget. We have 32.6 million of alternatives, and you can see the number of strategies and the dollar amount in the table. Um, limited number of expenditure controls and service delivery changes, quite a few revenue enhancements. And then there are 14 other primarily expenditure related strategies that total $2 million. So we actually have about 34.6 million to address a gap of 10.5. Now of these categories, I've got the three listed here that do not involve service level reductions. Uh, the listing is color coded with black being those items that would save one and a half million dollars or more or generate that much more in revenue. Green are the uh, moderate category of a million to a million and a half. And the reddish color is low, about 500,000 to a million. So again, you see that the amounts <clears throat> about three and a half million options for expenditure controls such as streamlining uh, operations, uh, investing in a CIP manager to uh, try to get capital projects done quicker and save money, uh, more cost recovery, implementing technology. Service delivery changes uh, involve some that are complicated such as uh, exploring a regional shared service model for fire and EMS, sharing homeless response with the county, which require a fair amount of negotiation, uh, diversifying the investment portfolio or reallocating to put more investment earnings into the general fund and reassessing some maintenance functions that would save collectively $4 million. And then we have a whole list of revenue enhancements starting with increasing the sales tax. Uh, other options include uh, creating a parcel tax under a community facilities district, Mel Roos, uh, increasing parks and recreation cost recovery to 50% across the board, uh, modernizing business license tax methodology. Uh, the city has a low level of business license tax revenue for an economy your size. And then various other changes that could affect uh, admissions tax, utility tax, TOT, and then various other small revenue enhancements. So this $25 million uh, in, in that category. So let's get back to solving the fiscal gap. Let's say we come up with 10 and a half million in budget strategies. Uh, if they got implemented in fiscal 25, this is what it would look like. 
Ten and a half million is what is required for the city to not fall below its reserve goal in any one year. So you see in fiscal 27, we just hit it. And then in future years, the balance actually grows to beyond the reserve level. But it would take ten and a half million in order to hit the reserve level in every year. Now, if we were to rely exclusively on the half cent sales tax measure, that would not be enough to close the gap in every year. And given the timing involved, you can see that balance would continue to decline, hit a low point in 27, begin to recover, pretty much hit the reserve level in 31 and 32. And then with the following recession that would be expected seven years after fiscal 25, we would start seeing a decline in revenue again. So that would raise seven and a half million dollars in fiscal 25 and just over eight million in fiscal 26. And so you see that there's no excess fiscal capacity generated. So this does not allow you to address any of those underfunded or unfunded capital investments or other spending initiatives. So in putting together budget strategy scenarios, we took a look at four basic categories on a spectrum of heavier revenues versus heavier expenditure reductions. The first category on the left here is strong revenue enhancements. The next would be a blended approach, mostly revenue, but some expense. The next approach would be blended with being more expenditure leaning. So it would be mostly expenditure reductions with some revenues. And then finally, on the far right, a strong expenditure reduction package. From this, we put together three sample scenarios, and we looked at a whole lot more than three. There are hundreds that you could put together with the elements that we developed. But we picked three to be representative, the first being a revenue-centric approach, and that includes the local sales tax, first and foremost. Second, there would be some increased general fund fees and charges for full cost recovery. We would have higher cost recovery on park and rec fees, and we would have some reallocation of investment income. The second scenario is a balanced approach. It does still include the sales tax. It does include the fire shared services model, and it includes a range of operating efficiencies and reductions through attrition. The third approach is an expenditure-centric model. It excludes the sales tax, either because it's not put on the ballot or put on and defeated. You would have to fill that difference, that roughly $8.3 million of revenue that you would be otherwise expecting to get from the sales tax with a range of general fund fees and charges, the park and rec cost recovery, more investment income allocated to the general fund, resume audits for business license tax, TOT, grant management, full cost recovery, the fire shared services model, technology improvements, efficiencies, and attrition cuts, and finally, $2 million in reduction from the existing $5 million that's assumed to go to CIP each year for the homeless investment. So these three approaches, and what I'm going to show you now is what that looks like for each of the scenarios. So here, you see we've got the items listed with the amount that they raise, and the important thing to note here is that scenario one is sufficient to give you another $5 million a year that could be devoted to capital investment or other initiatives, such as the climate initiative. You see on the chart in the upper right that you were actually above the reserve goal in each year, and in the outer years, you begin to exceed that, and then it drops off somewhat as you get toward the mid-2030s. So this is an option that both balances the budget and gives you more fiscal capacity, $5 million a year. The second approach, the balanced approach, does have the sales tax, and you see the amounts for the other elements of that. 
This provides an additional $2 million in fiscal capacity, not as much as the other, which was 5 million, this is two. And you'll notice from the chart in the upper right-hand corner that the balance declines and there are three years in which it is under the reserve goal and that's highlighted here in the circle. And then it continues to increase. So again, this assumes the sales tax, does have some additional fiscal capacity, but not as much as the first combination. Now we have the third scenario, no sales tax, a whole raft of other selections. Uh, as opposed to having additional fiscal capacity, in this case, you're actually still $2 million short, even after uh, implementing these other items above. So the highlighted item in pink here says there are still $2 million that have to come out of capital projects or the homelessness response or some other operating costs. This approach also leaves you short for three years, does produce some excess in, in the above the reserve in the outer years, but in order to get to this point, you've had to do uh, a range of uh, perhaps unpopular uh, reductions and also a cutback in capital and homelessness. Now we have three other options that we've listed here uh, that are perhaps uh, also applicable to a strategy to provide increased uh, fiscal capacity for capital investments, such as uh, rather than doing a pay-as-you-go approach, uh, having the capacity to pay for more upfront. One is the parcel tax for the community facilities district that we mentioned before. That does require a two-thirds voter majority, however, because this is not new development. It would be applied across the entire city. Another might be a specific tax, such as the admissions tax. Uh, if you get a million four for that by going uh, up to 8%. If it's a general tax, it would be a majority vote. Uh, if you earmarked it too specifically, then it would be a, a special tax, two thirds vote. And then finally, there's debt financing through GO bonds, which you would have voter approval on a two thirds basis to impose uh, a new property tax. So that takes us through this uh, uh, very quickly. And you have had a chance to look at the whole presentation. You may well have questions. At this point, I will turn it back over to staff and I am happy to respond to any questions that you might have. Thank you, sir. Ms. Campbell. Thank you. Let me see if there are questions from council members. Um, Yes, the vice mayor is recognized. I guess I just was looking for, for clarity. We're not being asked to make a decision on one of those three things. We're just presented the, okay. We're just giving you an update, right? So no, Thank no you. action is required, like, we're just, okay. <laughs> you know. The uh, budget and revenue subcommittees look at this work and I wanna thank you and, <clears throat> excuse me, I wanna thank you and Baker Tilly for the fine work that you've put into this. This was an iterative effort over time. I think what you've done that's quite good is get us into a world where these are realistic options. Some of them are not attractive options, but they're realistic options for us. And I think as we move ourselves into considering our 24, 25 fiscal year budget, certainly this will be revisited. Uh, we will visit it quicker than that in one of the elements because we're going to take an action here, I suspect, in a few minutes, which will put the sales tax measure on the ballot for March, which uh, would check a big box uh, if we were to place it there and it were to be it was to be passed. That then remixes, it seems to me, the the blue and the green and the whatever, because now we have, assuming a passage, we would have a real situation and we can then, then track it from there. I think this is very, very useful information. I also wanna thank you for what isn't in there. There were some items early on that I think uh, were not, uh, I, I appreciated because you're trying to catch everything and put it in there, that we don't have the council considering some things that we're simply not going to do. And I think that's an important thing when you're presenting to the council as well. So thank you very much and thank the consultants so much for the fine work. Questions, comments? Ms. Brown. 
just really quickly, uh, I want to thank you, and I don't have questions. Um, I did get the benefit of reviewing this and, and getting to talk about it earlier, and I think it really builds on uh, previous work that's been done around our long term financial planning. Um, and uh, I did want to ask, though, because people were asking me, as the vice mayor uh, asked, uh, no act, there's no action to be taken. Um, and there's very little information in the agenda packet. So I'm wondering, um, I didn't, I don't recall if we talked about those slides being made available on our website, perhaps oh, yeah. um, somewhere that people could actually see that without having to come back to the video would be great. And I think, too, it's important to, you know, we can't obviously implement everything at once. So I think putting things out there, and then we have the Revenue Ad Hoc Committee to kind of like, okay, now we're focused on you know, this particular piece and moving forward. So, but yes, we will put the slides out on the, on the website. Very well. Thank you, Ms. Kelly. Uh, if I understand it, we need to take no action on this. It was essentially an informational item and a report. Thank you so much. Thank you, Baker Tilly, for your fine work. Um, we are now on item... <coughs> Three, this is a resolution requesting uh, the placement. Mayor, of sorry, just to confirm, we do not have anybody online for public comment. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for your help on that. I just kidding. That. Somebody just raised their hand. Uh, they did just? Someone just raised their hand. On this yeah. item. On, on online. On the, uh, the item 22. Am I right? And his hand just went back down, so I think we're good. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. We're on item 23, a resolution requesting placement of a sales and use tax on the March ballot. Uh, there is a uh, staff report, and I'm going to ask if Ms. Schmidt, as she's approaching, let me just tell you what we're going to do. We're going to take an hour of your time and not use it. We're going to take this down to about five or ten minutes. Uh, the council subcommittee we all had a role we're all we're going to uh, make big presentations here but we think uh, given the lateness of the hour and so on we're, we're going to get right to the meat of this Ms. Schmidt thank you for your fine work on this why don't you make a couple of opening comments on this thank you mayor the council budget and revenue ad hoc committee has been working over the last few months and focusing on some of the feedback from Baker Tilly one of the key things of using, given our financial situation, is revenue is very much needed for us to be able to continue to deliver our high quality essential services to our community through our amazing employees. So given that, the, one of the biggest ticket revenue items in play was a half cent sales tax. So the budget and revenue ad hoc committee had discussions, they directed staff to do a community-based poll about a potential measure. The poll results came back positively, and so the Budget and Revenue Ad Hoc Committee is now requesting the larger council to consider the motions in front of you to move forward with placing a sales tax measure for a half cent for the City of Santa Cruz on the March 2024 ballot. Thank you. Summary enough? Thank you. No, it's, it's quite good. Thank you. That's what we're looking at. Let me ask if the subcommittee members would like to make a, some comments on this. Uh, Mr. Newsom, would you care to make any comments on this item? Uh, thank you, Mark Keeley. Uh, just uh, quickly, we saw uh, how our fiscal situation uh, looks at the moment, um, and uh, this is a measure that we wanted to uh, uh, put on the agenda and, and um, have the council consider and, and put on the ballot. Uh, and I want to uh, thank the staff for all their work on this and thank uh, my fellow uh, committee members as well uh, on their work on this. Ms. Brown. Uh, I would also like to thank <coughs> the committee, uh, the staff that have been involved in this, and uh, uh, Assistant City Manager Laura Schmidt for creating a beautiful slide deck that we are not going to look at tonight. <laughs> um, but it is um, a really great overview and hits the, the key points. And I, I just want to highlight hoping we can get make this one available as well for folks um, this the context slide um, I think when you look at it it will um, really help kind of sum up why we're doing what we're doing and, and recommending this now let me ask you if other council members would like to make comments on this item Ms. Brewer is recognized uh, I, I just wanted to comment as a former budget ad hoc committee member I, I understand the work and the the assessment of any revenue that is required of us as, you know, being fiscally responsible for so many parts of the city. So um, 
thank you for the work uh, that has been done um, to get to this point. And um, thank you to staff for presenting all the information. That's very kind of you. Thank you. Further? Uh, if I was to, which I will, uh, point to one page in the uh, agenda packet, I would, although there isn't any such thing as page 23, <laughs> I would point to it nonetheless, because it has the one, one item on here that I think is so vastly important to us, and that is we've achieved a 29% reduction year over year in homelessness in the city of Santa Cruz, and that's a result of fine work by our city and the county working in partnership together that has to be maintained. And in order to keep moving on what is one of the highest two priorities in the city of Santa Cruz, as I am able to discern it with regard to our electorate, uh, this is one of those. And the ability to retain those gains and make more is literally in jeopardy. And this sales tax measure is a huge and, and obvious way to fill that hole uh, going forward. So uh, thank you. Thank you for this document. Matters back before the council. The vice mayor is recognized. I'm happy to move the, um, the item if that's... I have to do real quick oh, yeah. public comment on oh, this. But I, I, I'm sorry. Oh, I just want to make one go comment ahead, about that ahead. as well. I wasn't going to say anything, but I have to say I was taking notes during the last item, and I think it relates to this in that if I saw that $2 million cost that might be associated with our city's response efforts. Mm -hmm. I just want to remind everyone, and I know we are well aware, but one encampment cleanup could cost upwards of a half a million dollars. And the proactive approach that we've been taking thus far, I think we are seeing significant um, mm -hmm. increases in maybe people wanting to open businesses and then thus tax revenue and other things. Um, so I think that balanced approach and really addressing it before it becomes a problem um, and spending that initial money up front, well, it seems like a lot. I'm glad that the uh, the polling and the community also agreed with that. That's phenomenal to hear. Thank you, Madam Vice Mayor. Uh, Ms. Bush, do we have anyone online who wishes to comment on this item? Let's take the person online first, and then we'll see if anybody else is with us. Person online, good evening. Hello, this is Garrett. Hey, uh, since Measure F failed last uh, time, you tried to raise sales taxes to the highest in the nation only just about a year ago. You all should have got it that the people had spoken and don't want higher taxes, and you should cut the fat and curb spending, among other things, to achieve a balanced budget. I guess not. For a long time now, the city government has approved big spending, growing the government with ever more spending, regardless of population size, the economy, rising income, or what the people have been willing to pay for. We've seen these charts for a while, and you've done nothing. As far as the expensive, well-surveyed ballot language of how to con people to vote for the highest taxes in the nation, another wasted expense like Measure F, it says money is to be, to be spent to protect and maintain essential services, including keeping pollution out of the rivers, creating streams, preparing for wildfires, maintaining repairing streets, potholes, improving, maintaining neighborhood parks, beaches, and public safety. But all of that is what you should have been doing and prioritizing anyway, like a regular city, with the huge amounts of money you now receive, ignoring that you have an overspending addiction and not all your spending is essential. Other cities can balance budgets. You admit previously in this agenda the city is, uh, well, in this one too, losing $10 million a year, and this reduces eight. So no improvements, uh, extra improvements can actually be expected. You promise nothing. You have learned nothing. You haven't shown you can be trusted with budget monies. Just more spend first. Hope to tax later. Irresponsibility. As far as wildfires, you might be interested to know, 2023 had the lowest national fire, forest fire burn rate in decades. Uh, stuff those wildfires into your climate change alarmist trash bin. The only other stated use seems to be a slush fund to deal with homelessness, but you don't say how much goes for this or that or <coughs> many uses. You just hope all these catchy phrases find the voters fancy. I disagree. Homeless people are an essential city expense or responsibility and I don't think that the point in time count this year and the wettest year ever might be accurate and your reduction of homelessness might be fiction. This is a shotgun phase money grab. Perhaps this should be a temporary tax while you prove to us you can demonstrate a balanced budget as a trial and not just commit permanently to hopeless tasks like ending homelessness that is above your pay grade and responsibility. Never mind, this is a regressive tax that falls on the poorest. Never mind, we have little to show in California for all these high taxes. 
Bear in mind our population has not actually grown in three years, despite your false claim we are rapidly growing. And anyway, if more people come, it means they pay more taxes too. The city cost per capita is currently very, very high. Just a suggestion, get rid of all the DEI personnel, the DEI training, the climate change staff, insist any grants 100% pay for staff, ditch the living wage and contractor requirements, those overly generous extra staff holidays, and these expensive surveys, because none of any of that is anything we can afford to make any sense. If nothing else, at least learn from the lesson of where all our financial problems originate, which are the expanding debt payments and inflation caused by the ever-expanding federal government immoral and corrupt debt overspending, not that taxes are too low. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Does anyone wish a, uh, who is with us this evening wish to make comment on this item? Seeing here no, none, the, and Ms. Bush, no one else online, correct? Matters back before the council. I'd be glad to recognize a member for a motion. Mr. Newsom. I'll make the motion to accept this, the uh, recommendation. Adoption of the staff recommendation, which has three parts, accepting the report, adopting a resolution, requesting that the measure be placed on the ballot, and third, to support the measure for purpose of authorizing uh, arguments uh, and provide direction regarding authors, etc. And that is the staff recommendation. That is the motion. There is a second. Second. Second by Ms. Brown under discussion. <coughs> Questions or comments under discussion. Debate or discussion. Seeing and hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. Can I just confirm, sorry, um, when it says provide direction regarding authors, do we have that direction? Do we need it? Ms. Schmidt. No, we do not need it. We can just, direct, the council directs that we go about doing that. That's traditionally what we've done. And at our Friday morning meetings, we can have that conversation. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Uh, clerk will call the roll. Council members Newsom. Aye. Brown. Aye. Watkins. Aye. Bruner. Aye. Calentari Johnson. Aye. Vice Mayor Golder. Aye. Mayor Keeley. Aye. Motion passes and sorted. Ms. Schmidt, thank you. We gave you very short shrift thank on you. this. And your work was very, very good work. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Certainly. Item 24, San Lorenzo River Levy Letter of Map Revision Application Submittal Update. Those are all English words. I'm not sure what they mean when they're strung together. Good afternoon. Good evening. <laughs> good evening, uh, Mayor. Uh, council members, Nathan Wynn, Director of Public Works. Uh, I'll try to keep uh, our, my presentation brief today. It is really just an update on the process of where we're at with the FEMA accreditation for the San Lorenzo River Levy. Um, Bonnie, do you have the slide deck? Is there a slide deck that I sent you? No. Yeah. I don't exactly. Hmm. Are you sure you want to do that? <laughs> <laughs> Are you sure you want to do that? It, it's Seriously. only a few slides today. Are you sure you want to do this? Do you want to show us a slide presentation? <laughs> oh, yes. Yes, please. We want to be able to show you a few di few updates. Uh, I'll try to keep it brief like I was mentioning. Um, <laughs> Next time, follow our example. Thank you, sir. All right, perfect. So... And uh, give an update on the FEMA accreditation process and where we're at on the, on the San Jose levy. And this is really about a letter of map revision that goes to FEMA. And we'll get to that in just one second here. So next slide. So we wanted to provide some kind of historical background with regards to the levy. You know, it's constructed uh, in the 1950s and most recently was deemed complete as of uh, 2019. That's when the Army Corps basically handed over uh, maintenance responsibilities over to the city, and that's when we started embarking upon the work of getting a certifying engineer, MBK, to assist us with the FEMA accreditation process. And that's where you see that third bullet point there with the 20 to 23, and I'll go into a little bit more detail on that in a second. Now, some of the work that we've already completed this year, um, is, as you guys well know, is some of the vegetation management work as well as the rodent control work, and so we're happy to see that that portion of the FEMA accreditation process is complete. Uh, next slide. So really the effort um, comes down to, and we've already kind of went over that first bullet point right there, is complying with our you know, operations and maintenance manual. 
Now hiring MBK, they did a hydraulic modeling work, um, did some survey work, as well as determine our flood hazard zoning, which is really the critical piece to a lot of this work. And so we'll go to the next slide. We're halfway through. Okay, so really a lot of this work comes down to over the years that we've been uh, working with our consulting engineer is developing this letter of map revision. So it's called LOMAR. Um, you can see that image uh, to the right is essentially what's, what the certification does is it eliminates over 1,400 parcels within this floodplain area from being considered a part of the, of the flood zone. So we go from an A99 designation, which is somewhat of an ambiguous unknown flood zone, to now an AE designation where we actually have several locations where we establish a base flood elevation, and those are marked in the, in the light blue of this, uh, of this map. Those parcels that are within this uh, floodplain zone will be getting a letter uh, notifying them of this uh, revision, but first we're submitting this to FEMA as a part of uh, their recommendation to go with FEMA, which we'll go to the next slide. This is the process essentially that we're at right now, where we're submitting this letter of map revision to FEMA. They have an estimated time of about six months to review and respond to that letter. Once we get um, their approval, there will be an appeal process, and that is when we'll be issuing out um, letters to the impacted neighbors once they've actually concurred with the uh, submittal letter that we've provided. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. you thank you. Thank you. Let me see if there are questions. What does this letter mean? What, uh, the letter to the uh, to the residents who are in this area, what's that letter going to say to them? That's essentially going to let them know that several of the, there will be two different letters most likely, where some of them will know that they're actually out of the, uh, moving from an A99 zone to an AE zone, a designation, and then some of those, again, 1,400 parcels will actually be removed out of that, um, uh, out of the FEMA uh, insurance zone. What does that mean to the, the folks who receive that letter? What, is, wh what are we trying to tell them when we send them that letter? Yeah, we're letting them know that we've established a base flood elevation with, uh, based on the work that uh, we've done on the levy and that they will no longer be required to have insurance uh, in some there of those processes. Yeah. Thank, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Further questions or comments? Vice Mayor. My one question, because I know there's a lot of people watching this that are interested from Santa Cruz High. We think this will be good for the locker room at the pool. This is a very positive That's for them. That's what we were hoping yep. to hear. Thank you. Yay, the kids can have a locker room. No action to be taken. That's up. Very good. Thank you. <laughs> Further questions or comments? Uh, this is an item essentially uh, for, for our information. Thank you for uh, being kind enough to shorten it without us missing the point. Very well done. Thank you, sir. We are on item number 25, an ordinance requiring delivery companies to provide a service enabling customers to tip delivery drivers. Matter's been before us on previous occasions. Let me see if uh, we have no presentation on this. Is that correct? Uh, we actually have an hour long. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> your votes are now three, two. <laughs> I'm teasing. I just, I just had a few comments sure, sure. towards please, you, Attorney, please. if that's all right. Just kidding around. Yeah, yeah no, thank you. Um, yeah, I just, I will introduce the item and say thank you to. Oh, I'm very sorry. Oh, did you? Let me correct that. Thank you for bringing that to my attention. I'm trying to move too fast after our break. Uh, let me return to item number 24 and uh, make sure that I do give opportunity. Please come forward. And I apologize to you for for skipping over that important part. You of know, the that's okay. Thank Going you, sir. 22 hours without eating was a mistake. I needed some time to eat. So, yeah. I'm, this item, it actually looks great on paper. You know, what what possibly unforeseen could be happening with our weather systems around the world that are all part of natural cycles? I'll just leave it at that. It just it looks great on paper. Thank you. Uh, and uh, Ms. Wood, do we have anyone online on this on item 24? <laughs> wow, I 
Yes, we do not. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you, <laughs> Ms. Bush, and, and thank you, Ms. Wood. Uh, we are on item 25. Uh, Mr. City Attorney, do we need to do anything on 24? Have I cured that problem on public participation? Don't see a member of the public uh, remotely with their hand raised. Okay. What I mean is, since I took it out of order, do we need to go back to that item? Uh, did Mr. Whitman get uh, a chance no, to make his comment? I'm sorry, I'm not clear on my point. Let me try it again. Just give me a second here. It was a receive information item. We took no action. Thank right. you. We're good. We're on item 25, delivery service uh, tipping ordinance. <coughs> Council Member Watkins has brought this for our consideration. Sure. Um, so I want to thank um, our city attorney's office, my colleagues, Councilmember Bruner and Kalantari Johnson, who, if are interested, can also make a few remarks. I'll keep my remarks short. I think there's no question that delivery drivers have <laughs> taken on a more important role post-pandemic in terms of the culture of having items delivered to our doorsteps and the convenience that that um, provides the consumer. But it also is a, um, a hard job for a lot of people who are commuting often from out of our county to provide that service to us. We're also seeing an influx in opportunities to tip people. And there was one occasion in a storm where I think I ordered something very small, like not necessary. And at like eight o'clock at night, it's delivered to my door. And at which point, if I had the option to tip, I surely would have given <coughs> the circumstances and the storm in which this person delivered the small item that I didn't need really essentially. So all that to say is that this is just an option. This is to pursue an option. It's a new ordinance and I appreciate folks who've contributed to um, helping our understanding of what it could look like and what some of the pitfalls could be. With anything that's new, there comes uncertainty, but nonetheless, I feel very good about moving forward and um, trying something new and hopefully we can see success and some money in the pockets of those who are providing this essential service to us. And I'll ask my colleagues, Councilmember Bruner or Kalantari Johnson, if they have any additional remarks. Councilmember Bruner, comments? Thank you. Um, yes, and I just wanted to uh, add in addition to that, that uh, we really want to emphasize this would simply create an option to tip. It's not requiring that there be a tip and the, the technology already exists. And so um, having this be um, something that could really help with a lot of the, the economic situations that do exist with this industry, then um, we're happy to support and uh, in this way. So I'd like to hand it off to Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Ms. Kalantari Johnson. Thank you so much. Yeah, the only thing I will add is that um, um, this really upholds our community value of equity. Um, that's what that's really the, at the core of the intent of this um, proposal that's before us today. Um, and that we have met with members of the industry and they had some really great um, points and comments that we've um, since we've had time, this was on our agenda, if you remember uh, a couple months ago, um, we've integrated those and updated um, what we're proposing in the ordinance. So I think with that, I will pass it to our city attorney. Mr. Kandati. Thank you, Mayor and members of the city council. Just to add a couple of comments because we did re receive considerable uh, feedback from the industry and some, some very constructive feedback including a list of legal considerations that were pointed out by um, Pete Montgomery and Mike Yadon, who are in the audience tonight, I'm expecting will be wanting to address the city council. Um, I would just say in response to some of the legal considerations that were raised, um, this ordinance is not intended to affect the employment relationship between delivery companies and their drivers, and it's not intended to regulate delivery companies, except insofar as it will require an unobtrusive uh, technical implementation of a measure that enables customers to interact directly with their drivers to provide tips. And the companies are given a great deal of flexibility as to how to do that. Um, the ordinance states that they can be, that the, um, the option 
uh, must be accessible to the customer by one of several mechanisms that may include, but are not, in li uh, not limited to, during the checkout or order placement process through a hyperlink or an email notification uh, notifying the customer, uh, customer of the delivery status on printed material affixed to the delivery box, uh, on an order delivery tracking package page that a customer can have access to, on a generally available website that customers are directed to, uh, which a tip can be given for specific delivery by providing a tracking number. Those are options. They're not the universe of mechanisms that the delivery companies can use. We did uh, uh, incorporate a number of amendments into the ordinance that were uh, the result of some constructive feedback that we have. And I would also say, in response to some of that feedback, we understand that there are some technical issues that may need to be ironed out prior to implementation of this ordinance. We also understand that we will be engaging in a dialogue with the industry um, in the six-month grace period that we've built into the ordinance to make sure that we um, cover all the bases and, and do all the necessary research and potentially bring back amendments or changes to the ordinance in response to that additional work that we know given that this is really a unique creature, uh, the only ordinance of its, of its kind in the United States that we're aware of. Um, we expect there to be additional dialogue and additional work to be done. Uh, with that, I will uh, be happy to respond to any council member questions or comments. Questions or comments? The city attorney, the vice mayor is recognized. I, have, I just have a comment, um, and I appreciate the spirit of the intent behind the work that my colleagues have done. And because of the Brown Act, I don't have another opportunity to say this out loud. So I'm just going to say thank you for your work. And I appreciate the intent. I'm not going to support the item. I do anticipate uh, legal costs associated with us. And when we're talking about saving money, by not doing this, we can save money. The other um, thing that is influencing my decision is we cannot tip our USPS postal carriers. There's plenty of people we can't tip. I said last time that I think it's on um, the industry that that groups need to organize and get get um, fair wages to their employees, and that's kind of out of the control of how I see my role as a city council member here. The other reason is when you're shopping on Amazon or something like that, you're not shopping locally. It's not contributing to our local businesses, and it's creating traffic and waste um, through, you know, emissions and just the packaging that it comes in. And so, to me, um, I think that by not supporting it, I'm also supporting some of our core values. And so I just wanted to throw that out there because I do try to, uh, you know, work with you guys, but I cannot support this. Ms. Brown. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I, I want to, uh, I'm, I'm feeling uh, conflicted here. Um, on this one, and because I do uh, want to associate myself with the comments that our vice mayor made, um, you know there there are all kinds of challenges with this, um, and in terms of equity, there the, this is there, it is very limited, um, and and I do believe that. Uh, workers sh all should be paid a living wage, and that those companies should be ensuring that workers earn enough money to pay their bills. Um, and so I, 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 feel, I feel you. And at the same time, I think, um, you know, I also, given the constraints and that we don't have the ability to change those bigger systemic <laughs> problems in our society with wage inequality and, and poverty um, wages, I do want to support an opportunity, any opportunity for people to put money in low wage workers' pockets. Um, that they wouldn't otherwise have, and so I'm I'm feeling like like I, I'm going to support it, um, but I, I do feel conflicted because I think this is um, just is a is a, a small and potentially um, challenging piece of this puzzle. The vice mayor is right. One more sentence: You can always give a cash tip. Okay. Uh, let me see if there are further questions or comments. Let me go out to the public. Mr. Montgomery, good evening. As you're approaching, I want to thank you for all the good work you did with then Senator McPherson when he and I were serving in the legislature. You did a great job on his behalf. Well, thank you very much. Um, I know it's been a long day. It's been very informative for me. 
um, even just sitting here all day, uh, just so happens that my wife, her two brothers, and my father-in-law own the piece of property next to the SoCal Avenue development. So that was a good discussion to see through. And my father and my wife and her brothers own a bunch of property on River Street, so I'll be texting him telling him he's about to get a property tax refund. So all in all, this has been really helpful. Um, sorry. I have a presentation, Fred. You want me to put that up there? Sorry. Good evening, uh, Mr. Mayor and council members. As, uh, as the mayor said, my name is Pete Montgomery. I'm Santa Cruz native. Uh, been working with FedEx on engagement with the city. I do appreciate, I think we met with almost everybody, or at least had communications with just about everybody on this. Um, really good, uh, lots of, of uh, time spent uh, with the city uh, attorney. Um, but we're here today to ask you to not move this forward. Um, I think, as was mentioned, this would be the first of its kind in the U.S. Um, and w <clears throat> no matter how well-intentioned this measure might be, it's really difficult to implement on a very localized basis for a global carrier like FedEx, for example. Now, the ordinance exempts our two main competitors, which is UPS and the U.S. Postal Service. Um, so really, it's probably why you only see FedEx here. Um, delivery of residential packages by global and interstate carriers, it's a very complicated and complex process. The, sum the ordinance summary makes a lot of comparisons to like internet service companies like an Uber Eats or a DoorDash or whoever. But in those, in those circumstances, you as a consumer have a direct relationship with that provider. So you have made a, a decision to interact with Uber Eats or DoorDash or whoever. They have your personal financial information. And so then they make a delivery, and you can tip them as you wish. The company like FedEx, our relationship is not with the recipient. Our relationship is with the vendor. If you buy something from Annie Glass or Bookshop or Wayfair, they then have a relationship, excuse me, have a relationship with FedEx. So we would have to then go get your personal financial information in order to allow you to provide a tip. So I mean, there's a lot of discussion about <laughs> privacy before, it's another, you know, state of California has moved very aggressively on privacy issues. So we would have to then go out and try and somehow get that information. There's a lot of um, rhetoric been said or in the ordinance that it's so easy to implement. It's really difficult to implement. I mean, we can continue these discussions, but it's not as e easily implementable as slap a sticker on a box and then your driver gets his tip. So that tip has to go through FedEx payroll processing has to have uh, applicable taxes and wages taken out. So it's, it's a lot different. Um, I don't, I'm trying to be, I, we've made these points to, to most of you. I'm, not, I'm trying not to be duplicative. Um, I guess I took too much time with my personal no, anecdotes no, about Go ahead. No, my family stuff. Um, you do so, fine. You know, I guess the big thing is, you know, we, as we look at this, very difficult to do on a single city basis. Um, we have to put big systems in place. If this is something that is really good for the, the drivers who make, a, who make a very, very fair wage working for companies like FedEx and UPS and others, then it should be done on a larger basis, statewide, nationally, not for a small jurisdiction um, like California, or I mean like Santa Cruz. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone online, Ms. Bush? We do have two hands raised. Okay, let's take the first one. Good evening. Person online, good evening. Uh, good evening. Um, Gillian Greenside here. It's a very interesting discussion um, on this item, and I learned quite a bit. And so I'd just like to share a um, situation of a friend of mine, and I wouldn't have thought about this had he not shared. Uh, when uh, more in COVID times, when he would be making, you know, just above minimum wage and making 30 um, burritos by 7 a.m. And the drivers would come and pick it up. And right now, most people do tip drivers. Well, people I know anyway, and I do. But my friend shared with me, well, yeah, we do all the cooking. We get nothing. There's no sharing of that tip. So whether you think, you know, the, and I agree, the company should be paying a livable wage, but it sounds like at least some of the drivers are not, you know, they're doing a lot better than my friend, who has probably made 100 burritos by lunchtime. So I just want to share that. Um, to sort of, I'm, 
which complicates it more. But if there were going to, if this were passed and there was tipping, somehow, and this would just make, as the previous speaker said, it's complicated enough, just make it more complicated. But some way of sharing with the producers of whatever it is that the drivers um, are delivering to you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone with us in chambers wish to make comments on this? Good evening, sir. <laughs> Yeah, good evening. This whole situation really seems like a squeeze play. You know, as individuals, you know, I, I like to tip. You know, I don't really expect that in return. But the previous caller actually made a good point. The cooks and stuff, the people gathering the food, you know, maybe it's just their job if it's like a grocery store or let's say Home Depot or something. But the restaurant workers, they're losing out on tips. And so it really is up to the individual as to whether or not they're going to tip. My current housemate calls out for stuff a lot. Yeah, and my understanding is she includes the tip as part of the thing. I don't know how that's split with the driver or with the company. But this whole squeeze play that happened when the scamdemic started, and I'm absolutely calling it a scamdemic. When you look at all the small businesses that were are gone, they're gone. But the pot stores and the liquor stores and the big box stores, they stayed open. So, you know, I think it's great that certain companies pay their employees a living wage. Amazon doesn't. Amazon has an agreement with the U.S. Postal Service. Every package that gets delivered by Amazon through the U.S. Postal Service, the U.S. Postal Service loses money. What is right about that? So, once again, this is really just a personal choice. Um, so I'm not quite sure what to say. And, one of the many things that makes Santa Cruz special that we're even debating this. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else online, Ms. Bush? Did we have two? No, we still have two. We still have two. All right. Uh, next person online. Good evening. Good evening. Um, I'm going to be brief because uh, if I speak too long, uh, uh, my geeky, nerdy friends who have something to say on this issue will be jealous. Um, this is kind of turning the house uh, with the key uh, to, you know, require these corporations to change their corporate culture, which they have, uh, probably because it gives them greater control over their expectations of their employees. I'm, I'm for giving cash tips, uh, Renee. Uh, I'm for, um, I'm for giving uh, gift cards to, uh, uh, let's say, front, uh, 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 front line uh, workers during, uh, say, we had uh, another. Uh, pandemic or uh or uh, i don't know we, we did away with uh, the ridiculous expectation that children go to school uh anyway just kidding uh the uh uh the california driver benefit was uh that was something that they put they feel like this is maybe kind of a spearhead uh you know, in, a, in a move to do you know something like that where the and it, it was i mean all, all told i mean it, it's a, it's a bit of a it's a bit of a tax on people who use these services um, I would have, you know, I would have maybe 20, 40 more dollars in my pocket if they had not added that. Um, I mean, why is this different than PayPal? Why is this different than uh, Cash App or or uh, what's the what's the other one? Venmo or I don't know. Uh, uh, Zelle is the Chase Manhattan one. I don't. Anyway, um, the, yeah, I guess the I guess the the point is, yeah, it 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 kind of subverts the the expectation that uh, certain workers are not tip tipped workers, whereas you'll tax, um, politicians will tax um, tips, which I, I found, I, I find kind of absurd and outrageous. Um, as I said, I'm going to, I'm going to not talk too long. So I'm going to, that's all I have to say on that. But um, I, I feel like it's kind of overstepping. Um, I mean, you know, in, in some way, it, it's, I mean, you're, 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 you're really, really, uh, uh, Renee is right about it, you know, there'll be legal challenges and it, um, it's it sounds seems kind of like a, a, a really big hill to climb to to make a system that works. Okay, thanks. Well, thank you very much. And one more person online, correct, Ms. Bush. Good evening, person online. Yeah, hi. This is Garrett. Hey, I wasn't going to speak to this, but it'd be real quick. But I personally am a little uh, taken back when the POS terminal at the when I'm going for takeout, in other words, receiving really no service, 
one's a tip and you have to hit other just to put zero in. I don't know about that. And then I, have you seen the video where somebody went into a 100% self-service uh, like uh, 7-Eleven kind of thing and no people in the whole place and at the checkout, it asks for a tip. You seen that one? Anyway, that's all I have to say. Well, thank you. Ms. Bush, anyone else online? Matters back before the council. Ms. Watkins is recognized. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you to those who commented and came to share their comments. Um, I just want to say how I appreciate that this requires the courage of a council, that certainly um, some of these policies definitely have a place at the state and federal level, and often, and one of the things I love so much about local policy is that we can be innovative and we can be uh, forward thinking and often a leader in pursuing these types of innovations and types of policies at the local level. And so um, I hope that that could be the case for this. And hopefully that we can um, continue to work on some of the wrinkles that may uh, come about, but knowing that in the end, it's putting money in the pockets of mainly minority people who are often traveling from lower income communities to deliver our packages. And if you want, you would have the option. And so um, it's not required, it's an option. Um, anyways, so with that, I'm happy to move the recommendation. And I know, I think Councilmember Kalantari Johnson also has something to add. There is a motion, is there a second? Ms. Kalantari Johnson seconds, and you may open on your motion. I pretty much did. I, I apologize. Okay. I did that. In the, I did that pre-motion. <laughs> Quite all right. Thanks. Ms. Kalantar Johnson is recognized. Thank you. Yeah, um, I'll echo Councilmember Watkins' sentiments that um, we, as a city, have um, been leaders in in looking at new ways of doing things and looking at upholding our value of equity. And I think this really speaks to that. Um, we have a pretty long runway of six months for implementation. So I invite continued partnership um, and working with you, Mr. Montgomery and others, um, so that we can figure out those wrinkles. Um, and I, I think with that six month runway, we can we can sort out and, and not get into a situation where we'll accrue any kind of litigation fees. Um, we can't control other people's habits. I, I also um, am a strong supporter of small businesses in our local downtown and our um, midtown businesses, um, but we can't control other people's um, behaviors. But what we can do is provide options for folks to compensate um, even further those who are um, being of service to our community. So I'm um, happy to second this and support this. Thank you. For the debate or discussion, Ms. Brown. Let's make a, a quick comment here <clears throat> because I, I did hear uh, members of the public speak about uh, you know some of their concerns, which I also share. I mean, we are talking about uh, a system where um, it's very selective. So, the, the you know, it, in terms of, it's not equitably distributed. It's based on voluntary um, uh, decisions by individual consumers. Um, and, and I recognize that there are, you know, I started envisioning all of the scenarios in which I get deliveries. Um, people talked about food service. Um, this is, and, and I agree that th those workers who participate in the production of that food should be uh, also fairly compensated and should be included in tip pools. But we're talking here today about, or tonight, about uh, delivery of manufactured goods that are coming from, you know, all over the country and there are the, you know, supply chain issues. And, and so we can't really get we can't ca capture that in something like this. And so I just wanted to say that um, I remain conflicted, um, but <laughs> mildly supportive. So um, thank you for bringing this forward. I, I hope that we can find a way to make it work in, in, in a positive way without um, it affecting uh, the, you know, folks uh, negatively. Yeah. For the debate or discussion, Ms. Bruner. Thank you. Um, I appreciate the input we received here today as we continue, um, if this passes today, that is exactly why we built in a six month grace period. And um, we hope to continue working through and um, to see how, how this could be one option to support last leg drivers and delivery drivers. Thank you. Thank you. Further debate or discussion? Um, I'll say this. I, I'm going to do the uh, 
wrong thing for the right reasons, um, I'm going to support this. And, uh, and, and what I mean by the wrong thing is, is I don't disagree with you on what the need is, what you're trying to do, and so on. I, this just cries out for state legislation, just screams out for state legislation. Um, if this was going to go into effect in 30 days, then I'd be making a pretty strong case against it. But that isn't what you're suggesting. Uh, as to use Councilmember Collins R. Johnson, the runway here I think is sufficient to say this is coming, get ready for it. That's sufficient time that if this proves to be nearly impossible to do, we can revisit this. So I'm going to do the wrong thing for the right reasons. I'm going to go ahead and vote for this. Uh, and, I, and I do appreciate you bringing this. This, this is who you are. You got a heart as big as all outdoors. <laughs> if it isn't about kids, it's about low wage workers. It's always about something good. So thank you for bringing this to us. Uh, clerk will call the roll. Council members Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? No. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion passes is ordered. We are on item 26. This is municipal code amendments relating to flexible density units responding to modifications requested by the California Coastal Commission. Is there uh, any staff report on this? Nope. Ready to go? All right. Matter is before the council. Adopt a resolution and introduce for publication the ordinance. Questions? Any member of the public wish to give public comment on this item? Ms. Bush, anyone online? Matters back before the council. I'll recognize someone for a motion on this. I'll move the recommendation. Motion by council member Watkins and a second by I'll Mr. Second. Newsom. I'm sorry, by Mr. Newsom, if that's all right. By Mr. Newsom. Is there a debate or discussion? Seeing and hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. Council member Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion passes and so ordered. We're on item number 27. Uh, this is an ordinance uh, relating to the energy code and other related matters. We've had this before us on a previous occasion. This is the second reading of the ordinance. We created a bit of a, a, a window here for folks who had testified under first reading if they wanted to come in and provide input. Uh, speaking only for myself, I received input from two of the speakers who were here on a previous occasion. They have, tr at least in their communication with me, dropped their objection to this. Are there, uh, is there a question or comment here? Do we have... Uh, do we have any public comment on this item? Good evening, sir. Ms. Bush, do we have anyone online? We do have one. Thank you. Good evening, sir. Yeah. Um, thank you, Tony. My name is, he's not here. My name still is James Ewing Whitman. You know, I read through most of this. Um, I don't think it's a bad idea to require when the work is being done before the walls are sealed up to be set up to do other things. It does mean that the electrical needs need to really be looked at because um, electricity is just not near as efficient as uh, oil. Um, certainly the most plentiful fluid on the planet next to water is oil. Fossil fuels is a complete fabrication. I've spoken about this before. So this is going to move forward. I don't really have any objections, but... Um, you know, my understanding is 2% of the vehicles in the United, State are, the United States are electrical now. You know, in 2021, when there was that cold snap in Texas, for whatever reason, their wind farms that were designed by individuals that made their billions from running concentration camps in um, China, um, they didn't work. And some people said that the electricity bills increased by 9,000%. That's quite a bit. So we're trying to electrify our system when most of the electricity is created by natural fuel sources like oil and coal that can all be cleaned to be mostly very pure. It's just not the way it is. There's a study done and uh, stopped in 1987 in Santa Cruz where they purified 
the nasty exhaust from coal-fired power plants created an algae where 60% of that material was oil that could be diesel, jet fuel, or kerosene. So what is really unfortunate is, not that I like really any of the presidents the past 50 years, but um, we had a two-year strategic, strategic supply of oil in the United States yeah, at the beginning of 2020. Now we have less than 17 days. So, you know, I'm glad people have sweaters because the electrical needs are, it's a total control grid. One more thing. I went in to find out about some information from the building department. I was very thankful that they were open at 7.30 in the morning or 7.35 when I got there. They were locked out of the room because their electronics wouldn't let them in their own door. Fortunately, that's a pretty big building right over there, and they got in some other way, but um, all this infrastructure that's being done that is electronically controlled can malfunction on accident or can malfunction on purpose. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Ms. Bush, anyone online? We do have someone. Let me uh, ask the person who is online to please proceed. Good evening. Okay, hi, this is Garrett. Oh, hey, Mayor, I wrote you a letter. I was still objected. Anyway, the, the state of California has been throwing the towel in on individual rights for some years now, first with ineffective anti-capitalist socialist rent control, which I regard as similar now to this EV building codes and electric ready extra costs, making gas usage more expensive, even though gas is 40% cheaper per energy than electricity. This is similar but based instead on mistaken theories of a climate change crisis used to impose coercive over-the-line laws which cannot address inflation or control the climate of the earth when the only real cost problem is government corruption and profligate spending and debt creation which is abuses of individual liberty. Santa Cruz went over the top of the state's rent control with the large rent increase ordinance, ignoring reality inflation can top 7% annually for years. Here we go again. Similar defects exist here with your and the state's impositions of PD system mandates in new housing based on that PDV logic that relies on dozens of questionable assumptions of future cost effectiveness. You further assume consumers are just too stupid to select through a free market cost effective housing features by themselves. Those reach studies cited to justify even more costs are at best a snapshot look of not even the current new housing reality, but creations of very EV friendly model housing, assuming uh, all of it will be reality for the next 30 plus years. Their projections have already been proven false in just one year. Those 2022 studies with already sky-high energy prices due to Biden that were much higher than just in 2020, assume, for instance, gas prices this November, this month, would be 4.6% higher per year for years, and interest rates would be 4% for 30 years. We now know for a fact current natural gas rates for this month, even with the anti-gas bias Biden's energy policy still in place, all according to PG&E, are 20% lower than those projections, 86 per therm versus 71.2 cents. And mortgage interest rates are not 4%, but they're 100% off at 8.1%. Electric rate increases of 1.8% seem not to acknowledge rates got jacked by around 40% since 2018 peak prices basis change and could happen again easily. Add in all the other variables of real projects versus electric-friendly models, and all the justifications aren't really so in the bank justified factual reality at all. It's what I call baffling with BS. I'm not that easily baffled. The upfront extra finance costs are just one more incremental government increase in housing costs without any real proof they will materialize savings for the next 30 years. Only socialist central planning needs mandates to justify the unjustifiable. I hope you read my letter on this item, which has a lot more very interesting information. One item there shows states with excessive climate change mandates have the most expensive energy in the nation, and California tops the list of the lower 48 states in energy costs. Santa Cruz has a laughably mild climate. This needs to be tabled and more data taken on real projects, analyzing the corners using real historic variations of the important variables of which these bias studies never did. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? Anyone else online? We do have one more. Good evening, person online. Good evening. Good evening. Yeah, hi. Uh, I just, I guess, I, I just wanted to say that um, this is really similar to the um, um, the um, 
you know, and a real, it may seem obtuse to compare it, but it's real similar to the, um, the tipping issue. It, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's like, it's like the, uh, the, 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 the choices people make for their energy, uh, in their homes. And, you know, it, of course there are consequences politically, um, you know, who has access to heat, who has access to, you know, um, uh, fr- you know, uh, uh, clean water and, you know, I mean, who, ha- you know, it's, it, it becomes political, but, um, I just, feel, I feel like, I feel like it's often overreach. Uh, you know, when I, when I, I see the, I see the council, you know, trying to, trying to, you know, uh, mandate things, um, you know, p- people are often, uh, you know, sort of left without choices. And, um, you know, I, Laszlo Toth is, uh, is the, uh, fictional, uh, you know, Guido, Guido Sarducci character, you know, he wrote all these letters and, um, one of them was, you know, he was, he was, uh, sending a letter to, uh, you know, government officials saying, Oh, we should get our energy from rocks. We should get our energy from rocks. And it's, it's funny because it's funny. Cause you can get, you know, you can get energy from, uh, you know, wind, you can get energy from, um, solar panels. Um, and you can get, you know, you, you I don't know. I, I feel like those solar panels up at the, uh, um, uh, the Emmeline complex would be a great place to just, you know, build you know, within the confines of it, build a shelter for people. Uh, cause they're, I mean, they're essentially structural and the whole, the whole thing, I don't know, you know, the more, the more that gets invested by taxpayers, um, uh, you know, the more it's sort of a very, very gray area as to like, what's appropriate use for it. Um, you know, that's, that, I mean, that's maybe a society we're heading towards, you know, with Tesla's powering homes and, and, um, um, uh, you know, um, trying to get away from, you know, I don't know, people having bonfires at the beach because it pollutes too much or, or the state of California, um, banning, uh, you know, solvents that get rid of graffiti, uh, as if, you know, the graffiti wasn't equally obnoxious. Um, I don't know. I have all kinds of opinions about it. And I'm sure everyone else does. So, uh, again, uh, time for me to not talk more. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Anyone else online, Ms. Bush? Matters back before the council. I'll move the second reading. Ms. Brown moves. Is there a second? Ms. I'll second that. Ms. Bruner seconds. Second reading of the ordinance. Debate or discussion? Seeing hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. Council members Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Martin? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Sorry, aye. <laughs> um, Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion passes and so ordered. We're on item 28. This is the election of the vice mayor for calendar year 2024. I will recognize Council Member Watkins for a motion. Sure. I'd like to nominate um, current vice mayor Golder to see if she'd be willing to continue another year. Is there a second? A second. A motion and a second. Are there other nominations? Debate or discussion? Seeing, hearing none, clerk will call the roll. Council members Newsom. Aye. Brown. Aye. Martin. Aye. Bruner. Aye. Kalantari Johnson. Aye. I think she said aye. But oh, thank you. Vice Mayor Golder. Aye. And Mayor Kelly. Aye. Thank you for agreeing to do that you. again. No, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. You did a fine job on that. Uh, Ms. Bush, for the matters to come before us. Mr. Kandati, any further matters to come before us? No further business. Seeing here none, just very, very briefly. Ms. Kalantari Johnson, we hope you get better soon. We miss you, your presence here. <laughs> and uh, so get better in a hurry. Thank and, you for uh, letting me participate in this way. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Thank you. Without further business before us, the vice mayor, with deep reluctance, <laughs> moves to <laughs> adjourn. And Ms. Watkins, with equal reluctance, seconds the motion, not debatable. Those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, motion carries and so ordered. <coughs> we stand adjourned. Look at you catching up all that time like a pilot in the air. Good, huh? Bravo. <laughs>